Tantor Audio, a division of Recorded Books, presents Marry in Scandal by Anne Gracie Narrated by Alison Larkin Prologue I can never be important to anyone. What is to prevent you? Everything. My situation. My foolishness and awkwardness. Jane Austen Mansfield Park Ashenden Court, Oxfordshire, 1811 What do you mean the child is unteachable? Lily Rutherford's father, Lord Ashenden, narrowed his cold grey eyes at the governess standing stiffly before him. He spoke quietly, but that silky tone was the prelude to a temper his children had learned to fear. Lily stood by her father's desk, her back straight, her head held high, biting down hard on her quivering lower lip. Showing fear in front of Papa was fatal. Rutherford's feared nothing. Her sister, Rose, was the fearless kind of Rutherford. She waited just beyond the door, listening illicitly. Rose was supposed to be upstairs in the schoolroom doing her lessons, but she'd whispered, Don't worry, Lily, I'll protect you, when the summons came. Miss Glass, the governess, stood quite calmly before Papa. She'd given her notice after just two weeks, weeks that for Lily had been almost worse than those when Mamma was dying. A week of tests and tears and punishment, then more tests, and more punishments, and more tears. I will not waste my time on a child who cannot even read. I have standards, and I won't take responsibility for this child's failure to learn. Papa snorted. Of course she can read. She's, what, ten, isn't she? Eleven, nearly twelve, Lily thought, but she wasn't about to contradict him. Nobody contradicted Papa, especially when his temper was roused. Her hands were shaking. She hid them in the folds of her black dress. Black for mourning. Black for Mamma. My late wife taught both the girls. She never mentioned any problem with Lily. Miss Glass gave a slight shrug. I cannot help that. Lady Rose is well enough, skilled in all the ladylike arts, though she has a tendency to be careless with her embroidery and... Thump. Papa slammed a fist on his desk. I don't care about embroidery, and we're not discussing Rose. It's Lily we're talking about. Lady Lily is illiterate. Miss Glass enunciated every syllable almost with relish. Illiterate. She'd made Lily copy it out a hundred times, along with words like ignorant, uneducated, and unlettered. Lily's insides shriveled. All this time, Mamma and Lily and Rose had kept her shameful inability a secret hidden from Papa. But Mamma was dead and this tall, terrifying governess had come to take her place, this woman with her lists and tests and her pale, goatish eyes and the whippy little cane that she used on slow pupils, on Lily, the better to learn her lessons. And now this in front of Papa, a different kind of flaying, exposing Lily to her father, like a scientific experiment Lily had seen in a display once. Exposed, defenceless, mortified. Are you saying she is lazy? She is obedient enough and strives to please, but she is unteachable. She cannot read, she cannot do simple sums, and she consistently mixes up her left from her right. As I said, Lady Lily is illiterate, and nothing I have tried has made any difference. Illiterate? Nonsense. Come here, Lily. Papa pulled Lily to him. He seized a book from his desk and opened it at random. Read that. He waited. Lily stared hard at the page. 
A lump lodged thick in her throat, searching for even one word she recognised. But, as always, the letters seemed to slide under her gaze like worms trying to rebury themselves. Well? His impatience grated against her nerves. She tried to swallow the lump and stared harder, but all that came was a single slow tear. Papa, frowning, seized a pen and wrote something. Read that, then. Lily was shaking all over now. Tears blurred her vision and she could barely see the word he had written. It was short, but still. C-A-T, cat, her father yelled. Read it. Cat, Lily whispered. Her stomach was in knots. She thought she might throw up. And what's this? He wrote something else, the letters bold and black and fierce-looking. Read it. Come on. It's not difficult, for God's sake. It's three blasted letters. Three. Tears slid down Lily's cheeks. Stop it. Leave her alone. Rose burst into the room. Stay out of this, Rose. His voice was mild. No, you're upsetting her. I'm upsetting her? She's damned well upsetting me. My own daughter, a Rutherford, unable to read the simplest words. Lily tries the best she can. She can read a little, but standing over her and yelling only upsets her and makes it worse. There was a long silence. So it's true, then. Your sister cannot read at ten years of age. She's nearly twelve, Rose said quietly. She put her arm around Lily. You mustn't blame her. She tries so hard to learn. She's always tried. There was a long silence. Your mother knew about this and kept it from me. Rose nodded. Mamma said it wasn't Lily's fault that it was God's plan for Lily. To make her an imbecile? She's not an imbecile, Rose flashed. Lily's not stupid. She just can't read. Is it her eyes? He looked at Miss Glass. Perhaps she needs spectacles. I've tested her sight, the governess said crisply. She can see perfectly well. She just cannot read or do simple arithmetic or tell her left from her right. Slowly, deliberately, Papa pushed Lily away. He wasn't rough, but she felt a coldness coming from him. A Rutherford, unable to read. He looked at Lily as if he'd never seen her before, as if she were no part of him. Unteachable. There was a long silence. Then Papa said, Take her upstairs, Rose. Rose and Lily left. But Rose left the door slightly ajar. Shh, she whispered. I want to hear what they say. They pressed themselves as close to the door as they dared. There was some low-voiced conversation that Lily didn't catch, and then she heard Papa say, I assumed she was normal. She can ride like a demon. They heard the clink of glass as he poured himself a drink. What do I do with the girl now? No man will want a wife who can't read. Don't worry, you can live with me when I'm married, Rose whispered. Lily gave her a troubled look. She loved Rose, but... There are discreet institutions, Miss Glass murmured. Lily shivered. She didn't know what a discreet institution was, but it sounded horrid. She loved her home. She didn't want to be sent anywhere. They waited breathlessly for Papa's response. No, Papa said heavily, I couldn't do that to her. She might be an embarrassment to the family, but she's a good enough little soul. An embarrassment to the family? Lily's throat closed. Papa spoke again. 
Now that their mother's gone, someone must take them on. I don't have time for children, let alone girls. No self-respecting governess would bother with a child like that, Miss Glass said. A good school might take her. Illiterate or not, an earl's daughter would add luster to their reputation. What would be the point of that? She might not be teachable, but they can train her to be a lady at least. There was another long silence as Papa considered that. An excellent solution. I'll put them both in a school. I believe there are several in Bath where my younger sister lives. She's a spinster and can keep an eye on them. Lily's stomach cramped. They were both going to be sent away? Rose, too, because Lily couldn't read? They heard the rustle of stiff bombazine as Miss Glass stood up. If that is all, I'll take my leave of you now, my lord. I have my own arrangements to make. The two girls hurried upstairs. I'm so sorry, Rose, Lily began as soon as they were out of earshot. Don't be, Rose said fiercely. I'd rather be with you at some horrid school than stay here without you. Papa is a selfish pig. No time for girls, indeed. It's not you. It's me. Lily swallowed and forced the words out. I don't think Papa loves me any more. Rose put her arms around her. I'm sure deep down he does, darling. It was just a surprise to him, that's all. Papa likes to imagine that all Rutherfords are perfect. But Lily knew better. The way Papa had looked at her as if she was a... A thing. As they entered the bedchamber she and Rose shared, her gaze flew to her bride doll, Arabella, sitting on her bed. Arabella had funny eyes. She'd been dropped once and a piece of her carved wooden eye had broken. Mamma had painted the eye in again, but it hadn't quite worked. Arabella always looked a bit cross, but... Lily loved her anyway. An embarrassment to the family. No man will want a wife who can't read. Half blinded by tears, Lily pulled off the elaborate, lacy dress Mamma had made for Arabella, the little veil ringed with tiny beads to look like pearls. The veil ripped as she tugged it off. She threw the clothes on the floor and dumped Arabella naked on the shelf near the window. She was just a doll, a collection of cloth and painted wood, a stupid, make-believe thing. Lily and Rose went to bed early that night. Rose had tried to comfort Lily, but Lily was not to be comforted. Everything was horrid. They were going to be sent away from home and it was all her fault. She didn't sleep. Papa's words kept churning in her head over and over. A gleam of moonlight sliced through a gap in the curtains. The clock in the hall chimed two. Lily slipped out of bed. She picked Arabella up and carefully dressed her again. She smoothed the doll's carved and painted hair. Don't worry, Arabella, she whispered. We will get married. Papa is wrong. Someone will love us, even if we're not perfect. I promise. Chapter One Ah, there is nothing like staying at home for real comfort. Jane Austen, Emma London, 1818 have secured a duke for the opera tonight, Agatha, Lady Salter, announced with an air of triumph. Bone thin and immensely elegant, her steely silvery hair intricately coiled, piled high and bound into a kind of turban, she fingered her lorgnette with long fingers and eyed her three nieces with a critical gaze. Lily Rutherford, Lady Salter's youngest niece swallowed. 
she sat with her sister Rose on the chaise long facing the old lady. George, technically a great niece rather than a niece, lounged casually on the armrest of a nearby chair. Do dukes sing? Rose idly twirled her fan. I had no idea. Don't be facetious, Rose, Aunt Agatha snapped. You know very well why I have arranged this opportunity. It's for you in particular. She added, as well, he is bringing two friends, one of whom... She broke off, her eyes narrowed. Lily tensed as the old lady raised her lorgnette. It was a warm day and Lily's thighs were sticking together, but she didn't dare move. Aunt Agatha despised fidgeting. But her gaze came to rest meaningfully on George, who gave the elderly dowager a bland smile in return and stayed where she was, one leg swinging in an unladylike manner. Georgiana, are you wearing breeches under that habit? George shrugged, entirely unrepentant. We're just back from our morning ride. The old lady closed her eyes in a heaven-help-me expression, muttered something under her breath, took a deep breath and continued. As I said, the Duke is bringing two of his friends and one of them might be interested in you, Georgiana, though not if you sit like that. Or wear breeches, no gentleman of taste. And one of them might be interested in Lily, Rose smiled warmly at her sister. Aunt Agatha glanced at Lily. Perhaps, she said dismissively. She raised her lorgnette and raked it critically over the person of her youngest niece. Lily, knowing what was coming, sucked in her stomach and held her breath. But it did no good. I see you have failed to follow my advice about the diet that was so effective for Lord Byron, Lily. You're as fat as ever. Lily isn't fat, Rose flashed angrily. She's lovely and rounded and cuddly, but not fat. And besides, she did try that dreadful diet, George said, for two whole weeks and it made her quite sick for no result. Potatoes drenched in vinegar, ghastly. A small sacrifice for the sake of beauty, Aunt Agatha said, with all the complacence of a woman who had never had to diet in her life. Lily is beautiful as she is. Rose squeezed her sister's hand comfortingly. We all think so. Aunt Agatha snorted. Better to be sweet-natured and cuddly than a nasty, well-dressed skeleton. George gave a meaningful glance at Aunt Agatha. Lily tried not to squirm. She hated this. Hated people quarrelling over her hated it when Aunt Agatha examined her through her horrid lorgnette, as she did every time she visited. Under that cold, merciless gaze, Lily always felt like a worm, a fat, unattractive, stupid worm, and she couldn't bear another evening of it. I'm sorry, but I can't come to the opera tonight, she found herself saying. I have a, a previous engagement. There was a short, shocked silence. Rose and George blinked and tried to conceal their surprise. Aunt Agatha's gaze, her eyes horribly enlarged through the lens of her weapon of choice, bored into Lily. What did you say, girl? Lily swallowed but held her ground. I said I have a prior engagement. She pressed her lips together. She was hopeless at arguing. She always gave in eventually, so it was better to say nothing. Aunt Agatha gripped her carved ebony stick in a bony grasp and stamped it on the floor. The floor being covered by a thick Turkish rug, the effect was rather lost. Did you not understand me, you stupid girl? A duke and two of his friends have agreed to join our party at the opera. A duke! And two other eligible gentlemen, and you say you can't come? What nonsense! Of course you will come. Lily eased her fingers out of her sister's grasp. Now her hands were sweaty as well as her thighs. 
She wiped them surreptitiously on her skirt and said with as much dignity as she could muster, I was under the impression you had issued an invitation, Aunt Agatha, not an order. Beside her, Rose gasped. It was usually Rose or George who answered Aunt Agatha back. Lily was supposed to be the meek, biddable one. But she wasn't going to be bullied, not this time. Aunt Agatha didn't really want her company tonight. She just hated being crossed. In any case, Lily wasn't very fond of opera. She had no ear for music. She didn't understand it, and she had a tendency to fall asleep. And the kind of men that Aunt Agatha always found to accompany them were, frankly, terrifying, cynical, world-weary, and too sophisticated for words. Aunt Agatha's mouth tightened. Do you have any idea what it took to get this duke to agree to join myself and you three girls at the opera tonight, and to bring two of his very eligible friends for you and Georgiana? George, who loved music but hated being called Georgiana, said, Blackmailed his mother, I suppose. If Lily hadn't been so tense, she might have smiled. It was probably true. Half the ton was terrified of Aunt Agatha, the other half was merely nervous, but dear George was frightened of nothing and nobody, certainly not Aunt Agatha. Aunt Agatha stiffened and directed the lorgnette of doom at her great niece. I beg your pardon. Apology accepted, George said provocatively and with mock innocence. Isn't that what you usually do? Blackmail or bully them into doing what you want? Apparently oblivious of Aunt Agatha's swelling outrage, George strolled over to the mantelpiece, lifted a posy of violets, and inhaled the fragrance. Gorgeous! Don't you adore violets? So small, but so sweet. They used to grow wild at Willowbank Farm. Her old home. Lily envied George's cool assurance. Despite her refusal to buckle under Aunt Agatha's insistence, Lily was shaking in her shoes and trying desperately not to show it. How clever of you to secure a duke, Aunt Agatha, Rose said quickly. Which duke would that be? Oil over troubled waters, not Rose's usual approach. Aunt Agatha shot a last vitriolic glance at George and another at Lily before turning to Rose. At least one of you appreciates the trouble I go to to ensure you girls make suitable marriages. The nobleman who will join us in my box tonight is the Duke of Everingham. She waited as if expecting applause. Lily said nothing. She'd never heard of the Duke of Everingham, but she knew what he would be like. Since the start of the season, Aunt Agatha had been throwing eligible gentlemen at all three girls, and not one of them had looked twice at Lily. Not that Lily wanted them to. Aunt Agatha had a taste for sophisticated, jaded, rakish gentlemen who invariably looked bored and uttered the kind of witticisms that always had some hidden meaning, a meaning that everyone except Lily seemed to get. She always felt hopelessly out of her depth with Aunt Agatha's eligible gentlemen, and she was sure this duke and his friends would be just the same. He was, of course, intended for Rose— the eldest of the three of them, and the most beautiful. Aunt Agatha was determined that Rose at least would become a duchess, whether Rose wanted it or not. Rose herself was indifferent to marriage and planned to put it off as long as she could, not that Aunt Agatha knew that. Lily didn't reply. George twirled the violets under her nose, inhaling the perfume with a blissful expression, so it was left to Rose, who had no ambition to become a duchess, to make a vaguely appreciative sound. Aunt Agatha, irritated by their lack of understanding, explained, Everybody is desperate for Everingham to attend their balls and roots. 
A hostess is in alt if he so much as condescends to accept an invitation, and even then there is no guarantee he will turn up. But his mother, to whom I am godmother Georgiana, a woman who values my advice, has promised faithfully that he will come to the opera tonight and join us in my box and bring a couple of friends. How very delightful, Rose said brightly. I do so admire a man who does what his mother tells him. There was a muffled snort from George, and Rose hastily added, What a shame Lily has a prior engagement, but you set such store on correct behaviour, Aunt Agatha, you would surely not wish her to renege on an invitation she has already accepted. The old lady's lips thinned. Her expression showed that she thought nothing of the sort. In her view, the opportunity of a duke trumped everything, and good manners depended wholly on the situation. She directed a basilisk gaze at Lily. What is this engagement you set so much store on keeping? I'm going to a party with M and Cow. Aunt Agatha's thinly plucked brows rose. She gave a contemptuous snort. An insipid gathering of mediocre nobodies. M and Cal are going too, Lily pointed out. The Earl and Countess of Ashenden, her brother and his wife, were hardly nobodies, and as for being mediocre, well, Cal was magnificent. A war hero, and M was a darling. A darling who could parry Aunt Agatha's horrid stabs without turning a hair. Unfortunately, M and Cal had gone out for a walk before Aunt Agatha had descended on them. Your brother and sister-in-law felt obligated to accept the invitation, Aunt Agatha corrected her. Sir George was your brother's commanding officer at one time. But given Emmeline's interesting condition, they would have been able to make a token appearance and leave early. However, if you attend, Emmeline will be obliged to stay longer. Her tone suggested that by staying late the succession of the Earls of Ashenden would be endangered, and if M lost the heir, Aunt Agatha would know whom to blame. I don't mind if we leave early. Aunt Agatha sniffed. Your sister and Georgiana, frivolous as they are, understand a golden opportunity when it is offered to them. They had no difficulty in writing to Lady Mainwaring to make their apologies for this evening. Why can you not do the same? Her lip curled, apart from the obvious. That's not fair, Rose began hotly. Before another argument about her deficiencies could begin, Lily said, because I promised someone I'd meet her there, a girl I knew at school. Rose gave her a curious look, which Lily avoided. She's new to London, and I said I'd introduce her to some of our friends. I don't want to let her down. It wasn't exactly true. She hadn't made a promise, but when Sylvia had asked whether she was going to the main wearing route, she'd said she was. As an excuse to avoid an evening suffering the slings and arrows of Aunt Agatha's company, it would do. Aunt Agatha's brow arched higher. You would dismiss a duke and his friends for the sake of some gel you knew at school? Pfft! Who is this gel? And who are her people? Nobody of any significance. You won't have heard of her. Lily shot Rose a warning glance, a silent plea for her to say nothing. Rose frowned but remained silent. Aunt Agatha sniffed. Why does that not surprise me? You have no ambition, do you, girl? Not much, Lily admitted. I just want to be happy. Pshaw! I suppose by that you mean you want to fall in love. Tawdry, sentimental, middle-class nonsense. When? Will you girls learn? Marriage is for position, advantage, and land. The old lady got to her feet. Since you're determined to waste the opportunities I make for you, Lily, I wash my hands of you. Rose, Georgiana, my carriage will collect you at seven. 
Well done, Lily. You were very brave standing up to Aunt Agatha like that, Rose said as the girls trooped upstairs. Positively heroic, George agreed. I thought the old Tartar would burst when you said that about being an invitation, not an order. Lily gave a shaky laugh. I was terrified. You didn't look it. You did well, young'un. George opened the door to her bedchamber. Hello, my darling boy. Were you waiting for me? She ruffled the ears of Finn, the great shaggy wolfhound who'd bounded out to meet them. Young'un, Lily said in mock indignation, you're only eleven days older than me. George grinned. And therefore I'm older and wiser, aren't I, Finn? Yes, so much older and wiser. Finn squirmed with delight, his tail madly scything the air. Ah, but I'm your aunt, and you, therefore, owe me respect. Lily gave George a playful smack as she passed. She'd stood up to Aunt Agatha, and not only had she survived, she'd won. She bounced onto the bed. Rose tugged on the bell pull. She'd arranged for tea and buns to be brought up after Aunt Agatha had left, and that was the signal. She sat on the bed, curled her legs around, and said, So who is this school friend for whose sake you braved death by lorgnette? Lily grimaced. It wasn't really about her, she admitted. She was just an excuse. The truth is, I couldn't bear to spend another evening out with Aunt Agatha, the way she looks at me. I know, it's horrid. Just ignore the old witch. You're not fat, you're curvy. Aunt Agatha is one of the thin Rutherfords. George and I take after her. Physically, George, not in any other way, I'm glad to say, whereas you're like darling Aunt Dotty. Who never married, Lily reminded her, whereas Aunt Agatha married three times. I know, it's a mystery. George snorted, yes, but all three of Aunt Agatha's husbands died on her, which I think is perfectly understandable. What else could you do once you found yourself married to a vitriolic dragon? They all laughed. But why would they marry her in the first place? Lily wondered, probably too terrified to refuse. There was a knock at the door, and George went to answer it. A maid brought in a tray with a pot of tea, three cups, and a plate containing six iced fruit buns and two thin, dry wafers. George poured the tea, handed the cups around, and placed the plate of buns on the bed between the two sisters. She took a bun and bit into it with a blissful expression. Lily tried not to notice. She pushed the plate away and sipped her tea. No milk, no sugar. There were wafers if she wanted anything. She was ravenous, but the memory of Aunt Agatha's lorgnette stiffened her resolve. Rose made an exasperated sound. Oh, will you stop worrying about your shape, Lily? You're gorgeous the way you are. It won't make any difference to finding a husband, and starving yourself will only make you miserable. She shoved the plate back. Besides, as heiresses, none of us will have any difficulty finding a husband. We could be cross-eyed, snaggle-toothed, and hunchbacked, and we'd still find men who'd marry us. Yes, for our money, Lily responded. I don't want that sort of husband. I know, but we're not exactly hags, Rose continued. Each one of us is perfectly adorable. George snorted and Rose poked her tongue out at her, so there's no hurry, we can take our time and choose from a delightful array of men. Not me, George said. I never had a penny to spare before this year and now I'm rich. Why would I want to hand over my money to some man who can do what he likes with it? And me, go back to being dependent on a man's sense of honour? No, thank you. Not all men are like your father. Lily said softly. George shook her head. Dogs and horses are much nicer and more trustworthy. I'd rather have a nice place in the country and live happily ever after with my money and my dogs. Like the Duchess of York, only with horses as well. 
Poor thing. Such a shame she never had any children. I'm sure that's why she has all those dogs. Don't you want children, George? Lily asked. Lily herself wanted very much to marry. She wasn't ambitious, she didn't care about titles, and she wasn't interested in the kind of sophisticated and intimidating gentlemen Aunt Agatha kept pushing at them. Lily just wanted to fall in love with a nice, comfortable gentleman and be loved in return, and to have children. George considered it. I don't know. I've never had anything much to do with children. I'm probably better with puppies and foals. She picked up another bun and bit into it. Lily's stomach rumbled. She sipped her black, sugarless tea. So who is this school friend you're meeting at the main wearing party? Rose asked. Lily's stomach suddenly felt even more hollow. Sylvia Gorry. Rose frowned. Who's Sylvia Gorry? I don't remember any Sylvia Gorry from school. Gorry is her married name. She used to be Sylvia Banty. Lily waited for the explosion. She wasn't disappointed. Sylvia Banty? Rose stared. That bitch! She turned to George. She was caught stealing, and from girls she had the gall to call her friends. She even stole Mama's locket from Lily. All Lily had of her. She snorted. I never liked Sylvia. Butter wouldn't melt in her mouth, the sneaky little cow. That's a bit unfair, isn't it? George said. Rose blinked in surprise. Do you know Sylvia, too? George shook her head. Never met her in my life, but I like cows. Lovely gentle creatures, beautiful eyes. Calling this Sylvia person a cow, or even a bitch for that matter, isn't fair on cows. Or bitches. Dogs are some of my favourite people. Very well, call her a miserable little cockroach, then. Rose turned back to her sister. Why on earth would you want to associate with Sylvia ba- What's her name now? Gorry? Lily nodded. I ran into her at the park the other day and she apologised for the way she'd behaved. She told me she'd been very unhappy at school. So were we at first, remember, Rose? Yes, but we didn't steal from our friends. Lily shrugged. We've all done things when we were young that we later regret, and it was four years ago. A lot of water has passed under the bridge since then. We're older and wiser now, or we should be. She told me that after she left school, she didn't leave, she was expelled. Yes, she left in disgrace, and because of it she never had a season. Her parents forced a hasty marriage on her to a much older man when she was only sixteen. From what she's let slip, he's rather a cold and unkind person, and she's very unhappy. She seemed very sincere, Rose, and very apologetic about the past. She's lonely, and she doesn't know very many people in London, so I said I'd introduce her around a bit. Where's the harm in that? Rose shook her head. You're too soft for your own good. She's a nasty little thief. Lily didn't agree. People can change. Everybody should have a chance to live down the mistakes of their past. Besides, the things she took were small and unimportant. She didn't know how precious Mama's locket was to me. She shouldn't be punished for it for the rest of her life. Rose regarded her sister a moment, then sighed and turned to George. Very well. Give my apologies to Aunt Agatha, George, and tell her. What? What are you doing? Lily asked. Going with you, of course. You don't think I'd leave you to face a deadly dull party and the dreary Sylvia Gorry alone, do you? She might pinch your pearls while you're not looking. You're being ridiculous, Lily said firmly. I don't need you or anyone to hold my hand. If anything, you need me to keep you from getting into mischief. Rose laughed. True enough, it's going to be a tedious night with Aunt Agatha and her duke. I might have to do something desperate. Shoot a duke, perhaps. But seriously, Lily, 
Are you sure you'll be all right on your own? Lily hugged her, perfectly sure. And I won't be on my own. I'll be with M and Cal and a hundred other people. I know. It's just... It's just that you're my big sister and you've looked after me all my life, but I'm all grown up now. You're only eighteen. George is only eighteen, too. Yes, but George has looked after herself all her life. Then perhaps it's time someone looked after George for a change, Lily said softly. Now stop worrying. I'll be perfectly all right. If anything, I should be worrying about you. Me? Lily laughed. I know that look. You're up to mischief. You don't like opera any more than I do. So what is it? Are you meeting a man? Yes, a duke. Have you forgotten Aunt Agatha's triumph already? You know what I mean. In all the illicit adventures they'd had in Bath, Rose was the instigator, Lily the moderator. Rose was easily bored, and the restrictions of society made her restless. Rose's eyes danced. What if I am? She handed the last bun to Lily. Lily looked down at the bun in her hand, soft, squidgy, and delicious. She should put it back on the plate. Lemon icing. Just be careful, Rose. We're not in Bath now, you know. And I thank God for it every day, although I do miss dear Aunt Dotty. Me too. Lily tried not to inhale the rich, sweet, yeasty fragrance she had to resist. Finn was eyeing the bun with the mournful air of a dog who hadn't been fed in weeks. But you never know, you might even like this duke or one of his friends. Oh, I'm sure. Rose rolled her eyes. How many dreary old dukes has Aunt Agatha thrown at me so far? I can't imagine where she takes them up from. I didn't know there were so many unmarried dukes in the country. I suspect she had the last one exhumed, George said. Rose laughed. Exactly, and if he isn't stodgy and ancient, he'll be the kind of bachelor that has a string of beautiful mistresses. He'll want a respectable young bride to bear him an heir, but he won't change his habits at all. He'll continue to keep a mistress or two, but expect his wife to be like Caesar's, beyond reproach. Men are horrid, George agreed. Cal doesn't have a mistress, Lily pointed out. Not all men were horrid, surely. She picked a little bit of icing off her bun. It's different for Cal, Rose said. He and Emma are in love. Oh, for heaven's sake, Lily, stop drooling and eat that bun. Consider it breakfast. She picked up the wafers and tossed them to Finn, who gulped them down in two bites. Where was Sylvia? Lily scanned the crowded ballroom for the dozenth time. After braving Aunt Agatha's displeasure, well, it was as much for her own sake as for Sylvia's, it looked as though Sylvia wasn't coming after all. Would you care for this dance, Lady Lily? Mr. Frome, a pleasant, middle-aged gentleman, bowed before her. Lily glanced at M, who nodded her permission. As Mr. Frome led her onto the dance floor, she reflected that, Sylvia or no, she was having a much nicer time than she would have had at the opera. She'd danced every dance, and though her partners were mostly older gentlemen, they were attentive and charmingly flirtatious, paying her extravagant compliments and telling her how pretty she looked, not that any of them were the slightest bit serious, but it was fun all the same. Much better than sitting under the eye of a dragon and having to try to make conversation with dukes and their friends. How was Rose getting on, she wondered. George would have no interest in dukes. The opera was all about the music for her. But Rose, maybe Lily should have gone to the opera instead of being selfish. Her sister was like a cork in a bottle, ready to pop unless she was able to escape the prim and proper social round from time to time. This assignation of roses. Lily hoped it wasn't anything foolish. Lily? Lily turned. 
Oh, Sylvia, there you are. I'd almost given you up. Sylvia grimaced. I'm so sorry, Lily, dear. It's my husband. He doesn't approve of frivolous social pursuits. I had to wait until he fell asleep. Oh, but... Lily's gaze drifted to the smartly dressed young gentleman who stood at Sylvia's side. Sylvia laughed. Oh, good heavens, this isn't my husband. This is my cousin, Victor Nixon, who's visiting London from his home in Paris. Victor, this is my dear friend from school, Lily. Oh, no, I must call you by your correct title now, must I not? We are schoolgirls no longer. Sylvia tittered girlishly. Lady Lily Rutherford. Mr. Nixon bowed low over Lily's hand. Delighted to make your acquaintance, Lady Lily. Victor was kind enough to escort me here, Sylvia said. My husband rarely ventures out. He's a complete stick in the mud. Now, her gaze ran around the room. Who do we have here? I see the former Miss Westwood is here, playing the duenna, no doubt. She was a teacher at Miss Mallard's school, she explained to her cousin. She married Lady Lily's half-brother and has done very well for herself, from poor plain spinster to Countess of Ashenden. Emma isn't plain, Lily began indignantly, but Sylvia swept on. Oh, and there's the former Sally Destry dancing with her husband, Lord Malden. Who would have believed that such a spotty little creature would grow up to marry a handsome young lord? And is that... Yes, it is. Jenny Ferris as was. Heavens, hasn't she grown frightfully fat? She's just had a baby, Lily murmured. Sylvia snorted. She's as big as a barn. You should recommend your dressmaker to her, Lily. I mean, Lady Lily, that dress you're wearing is quite slimming. Mr. Nixon glanced down at Lily. I rather like a few extra curves in a woman, he murmured, his gaze delving down her neckline. Lily felt herself flushing. Sylvia laughed. Behave yourself, cousin. She smiled at Lily. I'm afraid Victor is a terrible flirt. I thought you said you knew nobody in London, Lily said. You seem to know quite a few people after all. Sylvia sobered. Did I sound awful? I expect I did. Sorry, I'm just frustrated. The former Mallard's girls in London have refused to recognise me. Just because I left school under something of a cloud, none of them can forget it. She linked her arm through Lily's. You're the only one generous enough to overlook my youthful folly. She glanced around the room. I suppose it's too much to expect Rose to be friendly. She slapped me once, over absolutely nothing. Rose does have a temper, but... I don't see Rose here. I hope she's not indisposed. No, she's at the opera with our aunt. Damnation! Mr. Nixon exclaimed suddenly. I've left something important in my carriage. If you ladies will excuse me, I'll go and fetch it. Bring us a drink when you come back, will you, Victor? Sylvia said. It's horridly stuffy in here with all these candles burning, not to mention the hot and sweaty bodies. Will do. He hurried away. He was back in ten minutes, bearing a couple of glasses of fruit punch. Lily drank hers thirstily. Mr. Nixon whispered something in Sylvia's ear. She frowned and glanced at Lily. Are you sure? she asked in a low voice. He nodded. Tell her then. They both turned to Lily. When I went outside, Mr. Nixon said, there was a shabby young boy trying to gain admittance to the house. Of course, the butler refused him, but I happened to hear the boy say he had an urgent message for Lady Lily Rutherford. Urgent? For me? Mr. Nixon nodded. I hope you don't mind, but I took the liberty. Slipped him a shilling and promised him I'd deliver the message. He produced a folded scrap of paper. He said it was an urgent message from your sister. Rose, is it? Yes, Rose, 
Lily said distractedly. A note, urgent from Rose. Oh, she'd known Rose was going to do something dreadful tonight. What on earth had happened? With shaking fingers, she opened the note and stared blankly at the contents. As usual, the letters seemed to shift before her very eyes. She took a deep breath. It was always worse when anyone was watching. She felt so self-conscious and stupid. But this was Rose and important, so she had to make it out. She just had to. She stared harder, willing the words to become legible. Sylvia and her cousin pressed closer. Well, said the cousin. Lily swallowed, anxiety for Rose battling with shame. She had no idea what the note said. She glanced around looking for M or Cal. Oh, for heaven's sake, how stupid! Sylvia exclaimed. Lily flinched, but before Sylvia could loudly reveal Lily's dreadful flaw to all around them, she said, I forgot for a moment. Lady Lily can't read a word without her spectacles. Here, give it to me. With a wink at Lily, she plucked the note from Lily's nerveless grasp and quickly scanned the contents of the note. Lily held her breath. It's from Rose. She says she's in trouble and needs your assistance. She's waiting in a carriage outside the house and says you're to go to her immediately. Of course, Lily said. She was feeling a little dizzy. I'll just let Em and Cal know. She scanned the room, but she couldn't see Cal or Em anywhere. Sylvia placed a hesitant hand on Lily's arm and said in a discreet tone, Far be it from me to interfere, but she sent the note to you, Lily, not your brother or his wife. It sounds to me as if Rose doesn't want them to know. Oh, of course, Lily said, flustered. It would be just like Rose to do something reckless and try to hide it from Cal, especially. Whatever had she done? Rose could be so hot-headed at times. I saw a golden-haired young lady sitting alone in a carriage outside, Mr. Nixon said. Quite a beauty. Would that be your sister? Yes, yes, it would. Lily bit her lip. Rose, leaving the opera on her own, didn't surprise her in the least. Her sister had always been a rule unto herself. She scanned the room anxiously, but I must tell... In the absence of your brother, I would be happy to escort you outside. Mr. Nixon offered his arm. Sylvia nodded. Go and see what Rose wants, and if you need your brother or his wife, you can come back in and fetch them. It'll only take a minute. Lily hesitated. She shouldn't go outside with him, she knew. But he was Sylvia's cousin, not really a stranger, and her sister needed her. Mr. Nixon proffered his arm again. Lily gave one last agonised look around the ballroom and nodded. All right. She took his arm. Do you have a cloak? Mr. Nixon said as they neared the exit. What? Lily gave him a distracted glance. It's cold outside and your sister was shivering. I'll fetch it for you. He hurried toward the cloakroom. Lily rushed out of the house and down the front steps. She stopped dead. In the street stood a long line of waiting carriages. Which one was Rose in? She hesitated and found herself swaying a little. The dizziness was getting worse. She should have eaten something at supper. Here. Yeah. Mr. Nixon dropped her cloak over her bare shoulders. She shivered. He was right. It was cold outside. Your sister's carriage is along here. Come. He led her around the corner to where a lone carriage waited. He opened the door. The interior was dark and gloomy. Rose? Lily peered inside. A shadowy figure was huddled in the far corner of the coach. Is that you, Rose? Whatever is the matter? Without warning, she was pushed hard from behind. 
She fell half into the coach, and before she knew it, her legs were seized, and she was shoved bodily onto the floor of the coach. Lily tried to scream, but someone grabbed her chin in a rough grasp and stuffed a rag into her mouth. It almost choked her. A heavy cloth was bundled over her head. Someone caught her flailing arms and bound her tight. She couldn't see or move. A pair of heavy feet pressed her to the floor. Go, Mr. Nixon shouted. With a jerk, the carriage moved off, its wheels rattling over the cobblestones. Chapter Two there is nothing lost that may be found if sought. Edmund Spencer, the Fairy Queen You look as sick as a dog, Cal told his wife. Such a charming way with words you have, Em said, smiling despite the nausea that had suddenly swamped her. Her current condition made her extra sensitive to smells, and the close atmosphere of the room, combined with the clashing scents of burning candle wax, strong perfumes and overheated bodies, made her distinctly queasy. Cal slid an arm around her. Even pale green and drooping, you're beautiful, but you need to be in bed, so we're leaving. He glanced around the room. Where's Lily? He frowned. Wait here and I'll go and find her. He settled M in a chair with a glass of water at hand and asked the Countess of Malden, one of M's former students, to keep her company. He looked in every room in the house, even sending a female acquaintance into the ladies' withdrawing room to look for Lily, but there was no sign of her. Maybe Sylvia will know, M suggested when he returned with no news. I think she was talking with Lily before we stepped outside. Sylvia? That woman over there, help me up. Cal helped her to rise, and together they approached Sylvia. Oh, yes, she and I were talking, Sylvia said vaguely, after initial pleasantries were concluded, but that was some time ago. She received a note, a message from her sister, I think. From Rose? M frowned. What kind of message? Sylvia gave her a troubled look. I couldn't say, but she did look a bit worried. She looked around uncertainly. She might have stepped outside for a moment. It's quite stuffy in here, I'm sure you'll agree. Could she have gone into the garden? Emma exchanged glances with Cal. I'll check, he said, and strode from the room. I must congratulate you on your marriage, Lady Ashenden. Sylvia said, it seems such an age since we were all at Miss Mallard's. I see several of your former pupils are here, little Sally Destry, a countess now, and you, now a member of the peerage as well. Marriage changes things, doesn't it? It certainly changed my life. But M wasn't listening. She was watching the exit to the garden. In a few minutes, Cal appeared in the doorway and shook his head. Sylvia, are you sure she went into the garden? Sylvia looked surprised at the question. No, I didn't see where she went. She was talking to my cousin, and frankly, I felt a little de trop, if you know what I mean. Your cousin? Cal asked. Yes, Mr. Victor Nixon. He's visiting from France. He and Lily were flirting, so I thought I'd be tactful and was edging away, planning to take myself off, you understand. But then she got the message, and she and Victor were talking about it, but I confess I wasn't taking much notice. I'd seen someone I wanted to talk to, and, well, this room is so stuffy and crowded, it's almost impossible to keep track of anyone, isn't it? Where's your cousin now? Cal snapped. Sylvia shrugged. In one of the card rooms, I expect. That's where he usually ends up. He's hopeless, but since my husband won't escort me anywhere, I have to make do with Victor. You don't think she's gone home without us? M said to Cal. If she got a message from Rose and couldn't find us, she might have left on her own. Cal's lips tightened. It wouldn't be the first time she and Rose have gone gadding about on their own at night. Damn it, I thought all that nonsense was behind us. I thought it was too. M said, 
Did you ask the butler, or whoever's at the door? He shook his head. Let's go. He gave a brusque nod to Sylvia, took M's arm, and hurried toward the exit. Inquiries from the butler revealed that Lady Lily had indeed left the main wearing house some twenty minutes earlier, along with a tall young gentleman who'd collected her cloak. Cal sent a footman out to summon his carriage. I'm going to strangle Rose, Cal muttered as they waited for the carriage to arrive. I thought she'd given up on her old tricks. I thought so too. Rose and her antics were the reason Cal had married M in the first place. Even so, if there was some problem with Rose, I don't understand why Lily didn't come to tell us. Don't you? Cal darted her a grim look. Lily's very loyal. If Rose is up to some mischief, wild horses wouldn't drag it out of Lily. M gave a rueful grimace. It was true. So where do you think she's gone? Cal shrugged. I'll take you home first, then. Oh no, I'm feeling much better now. Cal snorted, says the woman who's as pale as paper and looking ready to cast up her accounts at any moment. He slipped his arm around her waist and said in a softened voice, Home first for you, my love, to put your feet up and rest. And don't worry about my wretched sisters. I'll track them down soon enough. He glanced at her face and added, and when I do find them, I'm going to throttle them for adding to your worries. Lily lay on the floor of the carriage, gagged, bound up in a shroud of heavy cloth, and unable to see a thing. She struggled to breathe. Waves of dizziness and a strange lethargy added to her fear and confusion. She tried to move her legs, but it was as if there were weights attached to them. The cloth covering her was musty and stank of horses and mildew. A horse blanket? She pushed at it. Keep still, you! A man snarled. Not Mr. Nixon. His voice was rough and uneducated. Something pressed down on her neck. A foot? She froze her heart hammering in her chest. She could barely breathe as it was, if he pressed any harder. After a moment, Mr. Nixon said, Ease up. She's no use to me if you break her neck. I wasn't planning to. No, but a bump or pothole might jar your foot, and then where would I be? With a useless body to dispose of. I didn't pay you for that. A body? The flat indifference in the voices was terrifying. Lily's heart hammered harder. The pressure on her neck eased. She lay still, struggling to breathe. Questions swirled uselessly in her brain. What did these terrible men want? It sounded like Sylvia's cousin, Mr. Nixon, was in charge. Was Sylvia part of this? Did she know what was happening to Lily or not? And who was the other man, some rough hireling from the sound of things, most pressing of all, why had they taken her, for what purpose, and why was it so difficult to marshal her thoughts? Had she been hit on the head, that she was so dizzy and lethargic? She thought about her head, it wasn't sore, at least not in the way it would be if something had hit it. Her mouth tasted sour and cobwebby. So much fabric had been jammed into her mouth that her jaw ached from being forced open for so long. Her tongue was wedged to the side, pressing painfully against a sharp tooth. Every jolt and bump and swerve of the carriage was painful. What did they want with her? Were they planning to murder? No, he said a body was no use to him. What then? Ransom? She recalled something her brother Cal had said to her and Rose a lifetime ago in Bath, when they'd sneaked out alone at night. Something about girls being kidnapped and sold into some kind of slavery. Yes, that was it. White slavery. Do you know what that means? Sold into a Turkish harem or a brothel in the seamiest foreign cities and never seen again. A chill ran down her spine. Was that it? 
Would she disappear into some Turkish seraglio and never see her family again? Tears squeezed between her tightly closed eyes. She couldn't give in to despair. She wouldn't. She had to fight this. Somehow. She swallowed convulsively and immediately had to battle the instinct to gag. Lily didn't know how long she lay there on the cold floor of the carriage in a kind of stupor of helplessness and nausea, but eventually she realised the carriage was slowing. It stopped. Now what? She blinked hard, trying to breathe, to force herself to think. It was like wading through a heavy fog. How much of that stuff did you give her? Stuff? What stuff? A bit. Just enough to keep her quiet. Any more, and she'd have tasted it. Better give her another dose before I leave you, then. She snatched a realisation from the swirling bewilderment. The fruit punch at the party. It must have been drugged. No wonder she was so confused. She could hear them moving in the carriage, shifting things, and then, abruptly, she was grabbed by the shoulders and jerked into a sitting position. The blanket was pulled off her face, and the wad of cloth dragged from her mouth. She swallowed, gasping deep gulps of air in relief, but before she could gather her wits, someone grabbed her hair and forced her head back painfully. A hand gripped her chin, hard, and the neck of a small bottle was thrust between her lips. She choked and spluttered as some nasty-tasting liquid was forced down her throat. She struggled with all the feeble strength left to her, but it did no good. The holder of the bottle, she couldn't see his face in the dark, simply jammed it painfully against her teeth, while the other one pulled harder on her hair, forcing her head back until she feared her neck might break. Careful, not too much now. A dead bride will do you no good at all. A dead bride? A bride? The vile bottle was removed and Lily, coughing and weak, found her wrists seized and bound. She tried to resist, but it was like trying to swim in mud. The dizziness and lethargy were worse now. Good. Now keep her doped up until you get to Scotland. Scotland? Hard hands replaced the gag still damp from her own spittle, but this time tied around her mouth instead of being stuffed into it. Small mercies. She lay on the carriage floor while Nixon paid the other man. Then she was scooped up and dumped roughly into something like a box? A coffin? Panic threatened. She breathed deeply, as deeply as she could through the gag. Stay calm, Lily. Not a coffin. She would have seen a coffin. They were still in the carriage. Think, Lily, think. It was some kind of container. No, a space under the seat. Yes, a space for storing cushions and rugs and extra luggage and abducted women. As the realisation came, a lid closed over her, turning the night from a terrifying thing of darkness and shadows into absolute pitch blackness. Slowly, grimly, through the swirling fog of the drug, she pieced it together. They were taking her to Scotland. As a bride. There's no use insisting, Cal. I will not go upstairs and sleep. Not while Lily and Rose are missing. I couldn't sleep a wink even if I wanted to. But until you walk through the front door with all three girls safe and sound, because if Rose and Lily are up to mischief, you can be sure that George will be involved too, I will wait downstairs. I'll be perfectly comfortable here in the front sitting room on the chaise long with my feet up. Now stop fussing about me, my darling. Go and find Lily. Very well. But you will ring if you need. Go. I'm feeling perfectly well now, just worried about Lily. Cal briefly scrutinised her face, gave a brusque nod and turned to leave. He'd taken just two steps when the front door opened and Rose and George entered, laughing. Aunt Agatha is in a high dudgeon, Rose told them, her blue eyes dancing. 
I dodge and she's spitting fire and brimstone, added George with a grin. I always knew she was part dragon. Her precious duke never even turned up. She had to cancel supper. What is it? The laughter died from Rose's eyes. She glanced from M to Cal and back. What's the matter? Where's Lily? Cal demanded. What do you mean? Rose asked. She went to the party with you, didn't she? She left the party early, Cal said grimly, when she received a note from you. Rose looked blank. I never sent her a note. Rose, Cal growled, this is no time for... She cut him off with an impatient gesture. Don't be stupid, Cal. I would never send Lily a note. Why would I, when we all know Lily can't read? There was a sudden silence. Oh, good God. We never thought. Cal gave M an agonized look. M shook her head. In the worry and confusion, it hadn't occurred to her. Someone must have sent Lily a note purporting to come from her sister. Rose sat down on a chair with a thump. Are you saying Lily is missing? Cal nodded. It seems so. How? What happened? It's my fault. M felt wretched. She was meant to be guarding Lily, chaperoning her. Instead, she'd failed her. I was feeling ill, so we stepped outside. Nonsense. It wasn't your fault. Cal said curtly. We were only gone for a few minutes, ten at the most. We left her inside in the home of our friends, surrounded by members of the ton and talking to a friend perfectly safe and happy. Cal decided to take me home, but when we went looking for Lily to bring her with us, we couldn't find her. Cal stood abruptly. I'm going back to the main warings. Somebody must have seen something. For all we know, she's still there. She might have just stepped out for a few minutes for fresh air like we did. M shook her head. Into the garden, perhaps, but not into the street. That butler said she'd gone into the street with a man. What man? Rose demanded. Cal gave her a searching look. You don't know who he might be? No, of course not. There's no man she fancies, no man who's been paying her attention lately? Rose stared at him. Are you imagining she's eloped? That's ridiculous. Lily would never do such a thing. Besides, I'd know if she was planning anything like that. In any case, George said, why would she run off to get married? If she wanted to marry someone, you'd give her your blessing and start arranging for a wedding with all the trimmings, wouldn't you? Cal nodded slowly. If the fellow was worthy of my little sister. But if he wasn't. Has anyone asked for Lily's hand and been refused? George asked. No. Well then. Cal said nothing. The look on his face was grim. M looked up at her husband. You're thinking she's been abducted, aren't you? He gave her a hard look. She's an heiress and I don't like the sound of that damned note. He bent and kissed M briefly. I'm going back to the main wearing place, talk to the other servants and the gory woman again. Someone must have seen something. I'll come with you, George said, but Cal shook his head. No, you and Rose stay and look after M. Besides, Lily might come home any minute. He strode off, and in a few seconds they heard the front door slam. Pray she does, M murmured. An anxious silence descended. How could Lily be abducted in the full view of half the ton? According to the butler, Lily had left the house willingly. Why? Because of the note? And surely, if she'd looked frightened or in distress, someone would have noticed and stopped her. Surely! Horrid possibilities churned in M's mind. Rose frowned. Cal said, the gory woman. Did he mean Sylvia? M nodded. She was talking to Lily when we went into the garden. It was Sylvia who told us about the message, but she was very vague about it. Apparently Lily was talking with Sylvia's cousin, but she didn't notice where they'd gone. 
Sylvia was always completely self-centred. Oh, I wish now I'd gone with Lily to the route I nearly did, but... That wretched Duke of Aunt Agatha's. Oh, do stop pacing, George. It's very unsettling and it doesn't help. It helps me, George said. I hate doing nothing. I'd rather be out searching for Lily. Me too. But where would we search? We can't just rush out into the streets and run around looking. We need a starting point, Rose pointed out. She sat on the edge of the chaise long and slipped her hand into M's. You don't really think? that she's been abducted, do you, Em? Not our darling, soft-hearted Lily. Em gave her hand a comforting squeeze. No, I'm sure it will be all right. It will just be some silly mix-up. Cal will no doubt arrive at the main wearing house and find Lily there, wondering where we've gone. But from the look in their eyes, Rose and George believed that as little as Em did. The main wearing route was still in full swing, but Lily was nowhere to be found. Cal questioned the main wearing's servants again, and this time he found a footman who thought, though he wasn't sure, that the man Lily had left with had arrived earlier with a young woman dressed in blue. Lily had worn a dress that M had told him was in shades of peach. He decided that meant some kind of pink. Cal then spoke to Lord and Lady Mainwaring, asking them, though without much hope, for discretion. For all he knew, Lily had just stepped out on some foolish escapade with a young man she fancied. It wasn't like her. But in his experience, young women were unpredictable. He hoped it was something as simple. Can you recall any of your guests who wore a blue gown, Lady Mainwaring? It was the slenderest of leads, but it was all Cal had. Good heavens, Lord Ashenden, I'm sure I couldn't possibly remember such finicky little details, especially after everything I've had to organise today. My husband says I'm the veriest scatterbrain, and I'm afraid it's quite true, Lady Mainwaring said with a little laugh. She gave her husband a fond look, then proceeded to list every woman who wore any shade of blue. As she spoke... Cal noted the names, thinking that his friend Gil Radcliffe could use such a scatterbrain in his network of spies and informers. And dear Libby Barker wore a pretty gown in sky-blue silk and blonde lace. Such a nice girl, and I think that's all. Oh, no, she said as an afterthought. I seem to recall that Mrs. Gorry wore a rather commonplace blue dress with white trimming, and Mrs. Gorry? Cal interrupted. I don't suppose she's still here? He should have pressed her harder earlier, but at that point they weren't as worried about Lily. No, she left quite early, I think. Would you have her direction? Lady Mainwaring made a vague gesture. Heavens no, but I'm sure my butler will know it. Cal went in search of the butler again and got the addresses of every one of the women who'd worn blue that night. He started with Sylvia Gorry. The Gorry's butler stood firm. I regret, my lord, that Mr. and Mrs. Gorry are not receiving. Please return at a more convenient hour tomorrow. Nonsense. This is an urgent matter. My sincere regrets, my lord, but I cannot. What's all the noise about, Barton? An irritable female voice said from inside the house, If my husband is woken, there'll be hell to pay. The butler turned and said in a hushed voice, A Lord Ashenden is here wishing to speak to you, madam. Ashenden? Good grief, whatever could he want? Oh, well, I'm still up, so you might as well show him in. But quietly, I beg of you. Cal was shown into a sitting room. Sylvia Gorry was standing in front of the fire, still wearing the dress he'd seen her in earlier, blue with white trim, though he'd taken no notice at the time. She was holding a note in her hand, and as Cal entered, she looked up with a petulant expression. Good evening, Lord Ashenden. Lord knows what you can want with me at this hour. Nothing pleasant, I see, from your expression, but it has become a night of nasty surprises. She indicated the note in her hand, so go ahead. Cal didn't beat about the bush. My sister Lily is missing. 
she frowned. Still, didn't you find her earlier? Obviously not. You said earlier she received a message. Yes, a note from her sister Rose. Of course, poor Lily can't read, so I read it out for her. I must say. A footman said she left with a man. Well, then. A man who had arrived a short time earlier with you on his arm. She frowned. With me? Are you sure? He wasn't, of course, but he wasn't going to reveal how little he actually knew. It was you, definitely. So who was the man? Sylvia glanced down at the note in her hand and said in a puzzled voice, I came with my cousin, Victor Nixon, but he disappeared on me. I thought at first he was in one of the gaming rooms. He has an addiction to PK, you know, but he wasn't. And then I realised he must have gone home with some tart. Well, it wouldn't be the first time, leaving me to get home by myself. But when I got home, I found this note. Where does this Nixon fellow live? Paris. Paris? She nodded. He's lived there for the past five years. He has a house in the, oh, I forget where, near some gardens. But when in London, he stays with us, of course. Then where is he? It's as I was trying to tell you, Sylvia exclaimed crossly. She brandished the note. He says he's gone back to Paris, in the middle of the night and without so much as a thank you or a buy your leave. What sort of a house guest is that, I ask you? My husband will be furious. Victor owes him money. They played cards the other night. Oh, it isn't much, but my husband is the sort of man who counts every penny and... May I see that note? Without waiting for her permission... Cal plucked it from her grasp and read it. Dear Cuz, sorry to have pushed off home without notice. As you know, my circumstances have been rather dire of late, but thanks to your little introduction tonight, I have a plan to bring the dibs back in tune. When I see you next, I'll be a married man. Make my apologies to your husband. Au revoir. Victor. Cal crushed the note in his hand, ignoring Sylvia's squeak of dismay. What little introduction! Sylvia made a petulant gesture. How would I know? He's been in London a week or more, and I've introduced him to dozens of people. He has no consideration at all, rushing off like that. My husband will blame me, of course, and... He said tonight. Did you introduce him to Lily tonight? Of course. I introduced him to lots of people. Did you tell him Lily was an heiress? Sylvia gave him an irritated look. I don't recall. I might have. Everyone at school knew that both Rose and Lily would inherit a fortune on marriage. Some people have all the luck. She glanced up at his face and stepped back hurriedly. What? Why are you looking at me like that? It's not a secret, is it? No, it's not a damned secret, but it looks as though your damned cousin has gone off with my sister Lily. Sylvia gasped, then clapped her hands. You don't say, how romantic. Of course, Victor was always a charmer, but... It's not in the least romantic, Cal snarled. Lily wouldn't elope on the strength on one night's acquaintance. She has no need to elope at all. He must have abducted her. Sylvia stared, then shook her head. I don't believe it. I don't give a damn what you believe, Cal said as he strode from the room. But I'm going to find your precious cousin, and if he's abducted my little sister, he's a dead man. Don't slam the... She shrieked. Cal slammed the front door behind him. If it woke her husband, it would serve the fellow right for marrying such a silly and irritating woman with a soon-to-be-dead cousin. How this Nixon fellow has convinced Lily to go with him is beyond me. I assume it has something to do with the supposed note from Rose, Cal said to M. He'd told her and the girls what he'd learned from Sylvia earlier and was now upstairs changing out of his evening clothes into breeches, boots and greatcoat while his horse was being saddled. If the note said Rose was off to Paris, Lily might decide to follow her. 
M suggested. She's always been the moderating influence, even though Rose is her elder. And if this Nixon fellow offered to escort her... If that's the case, we can put that down to her experience of Rosie's earlier hair-brained exploits, but it doesn't explain those blasted hints in the note Nixon left his cousin. Lily might think she's off to rescue Rose, but that bastard is planning to marry her. Mark my words. It's not Rosie's fault, M reminded him. She didn't send that note, and she's been very well behaved since we came to London. M put her hand on her husband's arm. Rose is already blaming herself for whatever has happened to Lily, even though she's innocent of any wrongdoing. She's extremely protective of Lily, you know that. I know. Cal picked up his pistols, checked them, and slipped them into the pockets of his greatcoat. And I'm not blaming Rose. I'm just worried for Lily. But with any luck, I'll overtake them before they reach Dover. M eyed the pistols with misgiving. And if you don't? He shrugged. I'll follow them to Paris. And if they're not in Paris? Before you spoke to Sylvia, you thought Lily was being taken to Gretna, didn't you? He nodded. I know, but this cousin of the gory woman has her, I'm sure. He was seen leaving with Lily, and the note he left for his cousin is utterly incriminating. It said he was going home, which is in Paris. In any case, I've made arrangements for a couple of men, Radcliffe's men, to head up the Great North Road, just in case. They have orders to search for a young woman and a young man travelling in that direction. They'll go all the way to Gretna, and if Lily turns up there, they'll find her. He took her hands in his. Don't worry, my love. I know France well, and my French is excellent. I'll find her and make sure nothing bad happens to her. Even if she has eloped for some reason, she won't be forced into a marriage she doesn't want. I know how you feel about that. You just take care of yourself and this little one. He placed his hand briefly on her stomach and kissed her. I'll be back with Lily before you know it. As she followed him downstairs, the clock in the hall chimed one. Just over three hours since they'd first missed Lily. It seemed so much longer. How long does it take to get to Dover? asked George from behind them. She'd changed out of her evening dress and was clad in breeches and boots. Her intention was obvious. You're not going, Cal told her. I am. I have to do something. You can stay here and behave yourself, Cal snapped. That goes for you too, Rose, he added, seeing Rose behind George on the stairs. I'm not having any more of you going missing. Stay here and look after M. His horse was waiting in the street. He took the reins from the groom, swung lithely into the saddle, and headed down the street. The sound of hooves echoed in the night. M and the two girls watched until he'd disappeared. I don't care. I'm going after them, George began. No, you need to stay here, M told her. You heard Cal. How do you think he'd feel if any more of his beloved girls went missing? It flays him badly enough to have lost Lily. George put up a stubborn chin. Yes, but I'm not one of his beloved girls. I'm just a duty to him. I'm not even a sister. M slid an arm around the girl's slender waist and said gently, You're not his sister, but you're not just a duty either. Cal cares deeply about you, and not just because he feels ashamed at the family's neglect of you in the past. If you didn't enjoy clashing with him so much, you'd see what he really thinks of you. George sighed. But I'm a pest, a wild girl, and trouble. M laughed. You can be at times, but even though he growls and snaps sometimes, never, ever doubt that Cal loves you. It's because he loves you that he growls. George looked sceptical, and M said, He also admires you, George. He's quite proud of his wild young niece, you know. He cares for you, and he loves you. She slid her other arm around Rose and added, Both of you, all of you. Yes, but Lily is his favourite, Rose said. I don't care about that, George said. I just need to do something. I know. 
M squeezed her affectionately. But there's no point in us running around like chickens with their heads cut off, searching for Lily when we have no idea where she's been taken. There is something we can do to help, though. It may not be dramatic or exciting, but we will have to be clever. Rose narrowed her eyes. How do you mean, clever? Chapter 3 Long is the way and hard that out of hell leads up to light. John Milton, Paradise Lost Stop the coach! In the darkness of her cramped prison, Lily stirred, willing the drugged haze to pass. She focused her dazed attention on the voices outside. What the... who the devil are you and what business do you have stopping my coach? No need for alarm, sir. We're on official business. Indeed? What's the problem? A young lady has been abducted. They're believed to be making for the border. Rescue. They were looking for her. Lily tried to call out, but all she could manage was a muffled moan. Nixon covered it with a coughing fit. He said in a loud voice, A lady abducted, you say? How shocking! Whatever is the world coming to? Lily tried to bang on the walls of her prison, but the thick blanket they'd rolled her in impeded her movements and muffled any sound. The space under the seat was a tight fit. She couldn't even raise her arms enough to reach the gag. She tried to call for help again, but with her throat so dry, her mouth so tightly gagged, and her drugged, thick tongue barely able to move, all that came out was a whimper. And from the sound of the conversation outside, the men didn't hear a thing. So you haven't come across a young lady in distress in your travels, sir? No, and as you can see, gentlemen, there's only myself in this carriage, Nixon said. No young women at all, sadly. I could do with one to while away this dreary journey to Carlisle. One of the men laughed. Lily tried again, calling out and banging her head against the roof of her prison, but again there was no reaction from the men outside. So you're not destined for Scotland, sir? Heavens no. Carlyle is quite far flung enough for me. Best of luck in finding your young lady, gentlemen. The villain who abducted her deserves to be horsewhipped. Hearing the men take her leave, Lily tried to call out one last desperate time. But a moment later the carriage lurched on its way, and she was once again left alone with her abductor. Sick with fear and feeling desperately alone, she sank back. She was never going to get away from him. He was too clever, too plausible. He'd planned it all so carefully. Who would have thought of making a hollow space under the seat and keeping her captive there, and invisible? Those men, if only she could have made them hear! A few moments later the lid of the seat was raised, and the smothering, dusty rug pulled off her face. She blinked as her eyes adjusted to a soft grey light. Morning? Already? She'd been here all night. Awake, are we? Nixon's sneering face loomed over her. I heard your feeble little squeaks. Lucky for me, there's a filthy wind blowing down from the north and it drowned everything. Hard fingers pulled at the knot of her gag, ripping at her hair uncaringly. He dragged the damp strip of fabric aside. Lily moved her aching jaw experimentally. I should have dosed you earlier, he said, and grabbed her hair, forcing her head back. She glimpsed a blue bottle in his hand, and as he jammed it into her mouth, she retained just enough presence of mind to push her tongue into the bottle's opening. She pretended to swallow and struggle and cough, and only a trickle of the vile drug passed her lips. That'll do it. He released the painful grip on her hair corked the bottle, retied the gag and pushed her down, back into the dark, airless space under the seat. 
I'll wake you when we get to Gretna, darling. Sleep well. He was laughing at her. Laughing at her helplessness. Her foolishness in falling for his trap in the first place. How she hated him. That note from Rose. She'd believed every word of it, but now she'd had time to think. Rose would never have written to her. Lily hadn't thought at all, just reacted. This mess she was in was all her own fault. Stupid, stupid, stupid. She lay in the lightless gloom, berating herself and fighting the effects of the drug. She'd ingested a smaller amount this time, but still it was strong enough to keep her woozy and lethargic. She would not give in to it. Somehow she must fight this thing. Sylvia's cousin would not get her, not get his horrid, cruel, greedy hands on her inheritance. She would rather die than marry him, and she didn't want to die. Sylvia. Was she part of this? Would she do something so cruel? No. Why would she do such a thing to Lily? What had Lily ever done to her except try to be her friend? The journey seemed endless. They stopped at inns and posting houses to change horses, but Nixon never left her alone, never let anyone come near enough to hear her. He sat on the seat above her, whistling and kicking his heels, Mr. Carefree. The pressure on her bladder was becoming unbearable. Without much hope of being heard, she did her best to call out again, but almost immediately the lid of her imprisonment was lifted. What? Nixon demanded. She couldn't speak, so she tried to signal her desperation. Need to piss. She nodded. He put the lid back down, and if she could have, she would have screamed. Surely he couldn't ignore her urgent need. But a few moments later, the coach pulled up and the lid was jerked open again. He grabbed her arm and pulled her upright. Come on, man, out you get. Acting dizzier and more lethargic than she felt, Lily struggled to free herself of the heavy blanket and climb out of her imprisonment. It wasn't entirely an act. She was stiff and sore, aching from being squashed into the cramped space for who knew how many hours. As she jumped down from the carriage, her legs crumpled beneath her and she found herself sprawled in the mud. Get up, Nixon said. She struggled to stand, but her legs were so cramped from being in a confined space for so long, there was no feeling in them. He jerked her roughly to her feet and she stifled a moan of pain as pins and needles, painful pins and needles, brought the return of sensation. The wind blew sharp and strong over the moors. After the smothering airlessness of her confinement, the bitter cold of it sliced through her, but Lily didn't care. Anything was better than being in that black hole. She inhaled deeply, breathing in energy and clarity as she took stock of her surroundings. Moorland, as far as the eye could see, muddy and wet from recent rain, no buildings, no sign of life. She glanced up at the coachman, who sat holding the reins, staring straight ahead, pointedly indifferent to her fate. No help there. Nixon gave her a little shove. Go on, then. What are you waiting for? She indicated her bound hands. She couldn't relieve herself without free hands to deal with her skirts. He hesitated, then untied her. Don't think you can get away. There's nothing for miles. She pulled the gag off, and, rubbing the circulation back into her hands, she staggered toward a small clump of grass, slipping and stumbling in the mud as she went. The clump of grass didn't provide any privacy, and she was aware of him standing only a few yards away, openly watching her, enjoying her shame and embarrassment as she squatted to relieve herself. Despite her fear, despite the drug and the freezing cold and her deep humiliation as she squatted in the open under the gaze of two horrid men, a warming surge of anger sparked deep within Lily. This man, 
This vile excuse for a man was nothing to her. Less than nothing. He was vulgar, greedy, and cruel, but even though he had her trapped and in his power at the moment, she vowed he would not win. She would not be a cowering, frightened creature, a victim of his evil scheme. Die before she let him marry her? Never. She would kill him before she let him take her as his wife. Finished. She straightened, feeling so much better than she had just a few moments before. The fear of lying trapped in a puddle of her own making had passed, and the bracing, moisture-laden wind had given her fresh hope and determination. And anger, she discovered, gave her strength. She looked around. Even if she'd been steady on her feet, there was nowhere to run. The road was empty, and there was no sign of people or any kind of habitation. She had no choice but to return to her captivity. She made her way carefully back to the carriage to where Nixon was waiting. He grinned at her discomfort, at her disorientation and unsteady gait. How she loathed him! She wasn't even a person to him. She was a thing, a way to get money. He would happily ruin her life just to enrich himself. He retied her wrists and replaced the gag, then helped her into the carriage. He lifted the lid and gestured for her to get in. It was fastened, she saw, with a small hook catch. If she could block that. Carriage coming, sir, the coachman called out. Nixon swore, get in, blast you, woman. He shoved her roughly back into the space beneath the seat and jammed the little blue bottle into her mouth. She managed to stop it again with her tongue, but not before a trickle of the vile liquid made it down her throat. He pushed her head down and closed the lid. An instant before it closed, Lily tried to slip a fold of cloth over the catch. But in her haste, she missed, and the lid closed tight above her. As the lid closed over her once more, shutting her into that dark, cramped, airless space, Lily fought the sensation of despair that threatened to swamp her. For the second time she'd managed to block the neck of the bottle with the tip of her tongue and keep from ingesting the amount of drug he intended. That was some kind of victory, she told herself, a kind of fighting back. And next time he let her out to relieve herself, she'd try again to block the catch of the lid. She was better off than before, she told herself. Now she had a plan. Still, she'd absorbed enough of the drug to have to fight with every bit of willpower she had to keep from sliding into unconsciousness again. If she didn't stay awake, she couldn't escape. Time passed. She fought the drug with everything she could think of, mentally reciting poems and rhymes she'd learned over the years, reciting her time's tables, counting backward, keeping her eyes wide open, staring into the dark, and scrunching up her toes and tightening and relaxing her muscles to keep her legs from falling asleep again as they had before. She needed to keep her legs in full working order in case she got the chance to escape. Any news? Rose said before she was hardly in the room. She and George had just returned from their morning ride. M had practically had to force them to go out as usual. M shook her head. Rose flung herself onto the settee. I hate this! Hate going about pretending Lily is just sick in bed upstairs. I don't know why we have to go riding and pretending everything is all right. I need to do something! I know, my dear, M said patiently, but though it doesn't feel like it, you are doing exactly what needs to be done. It's the best, the only Way we can protect Lily at the moment, act as if nothing is the matter. They'd had this out before. The girls were desperate to take action of some sort, but there was nothing they could do except wait and hope and pray that Cal would find Lily soon and bring her home safe and sound. In the meantime, they must all act as usual so that nobody would suspect anything was wrong. 
But it's unbearable having to make meaningless, polite conversation when anything could have happened to poor darling Lily. I know. Mrs. Pinkley Dutton commented today that Lily must be afraid of a little rain, missing two morning rides in a row, and I wanted to hit her, George said. We can't protect Lily, but we can protect her reputation, Em reminded them. The trouble was that neither Rose nor George cared much for their own reputations, and women must wait. Whoever wrote that didn't know how very difficult waiting was. Action was so much easier. Lily lay half dozing in the dark, waiting for her next opportunity. Twice more they had stopped to let her relieve herself, and each time Lily pretended to be more affected by the drug than she was. The third time, as Lily was stuffed back into her prison, she managed to wedge a fold of her cloak between the catch and the hook. She held her breath, waiting for him to jerk open the lid and pull away the cloth impeding the catch. But nothing happened. He hadn't noticed. The coach set off again, swaying and jolting along the road. Eventually, Lily worked up the courage to push ever so slightly against the roof of her prison. It lifted, and again Nixon noticed nothing. He was taking her helplessness for granted. Despite the cruel bite of the gag, Lily smiled. She was still trapped in the dark, still bound and gagged, still battling the effects of the drug— but she was no longer locked in. She could push the lid up, and the knowledge gave her a fierce surge of hope. She just had to wait for the next posting in or some other chance to escape. The journey to Scotland took several days. An opportunity was bound to arise. I have heard a whisper, Aunt Agatha announced. There was a short silence. She raised her lorgnette and examined each of them one by one with unnerving thoroughness. Well? M sent a warning glance to Rose and George. What have you heard, Aunt Agatha? The tun is full of whispers. Where's the other girl? Lily, she's indisposed, M said. With what? A cold, said Rose. A sprained ankle, George said at the same time. She glanced at Rose and said, A cold and a sprained ankle. Aunt Agatha gave them both a withering look and rolled her eyes. I thought as much. What is going on, Emmeline? And don't prevaricate, for as I said, I heard a whisper. Em sighed, accepting the inevitable. Lily has gone missing. We think she's been abducted. Why did you not immediately inform me? The old lady said crossly. We thought the fewer people who knew the better. Aunt Agatha snorted. I am not people. I am family, and if one of my family gets herself into trouble... Lily did not get herself into trouble, Rose snapped. She was abducted through no fault of her own. Aunt Agatha gave her a thoughtful look and said in a surprisingly mild voice, When did she disappear? The same night that Duke of yours didn't turn up at the opera, George said. The old lady narrowed her eyes at George but didn't rise to the bait. And who outside the family knows she is missing? Nobody. Cal has gone to France because that's where we think she's been taken. But he also sent some men to search for her on the Great North Road, in case his information was wrong. But there are men he's worked with before in whose discretion he trusts. Sylvia knows Lily went missing, said Rose, and the main wearings. But we've told them all Lily was just feeling ill and went home early without telling us. M said, Lady Mainwaring was glad to hear it, sorry for Lily's indisposition, that is, but reassured that it was nothing more serious. Aunt Agatha swivelled in her seat and directed the lorgnette at Rose. And this Sylvia person you mentioned? 
Sylvia Gorey, a former school friend of the girls, Em explained. No friend of mine, Rose muttered. Cal thinks Sylvia's cousin abducted Lily. M continued. He questioned Sylvia on the night Lily disappeared, but she knew nothing about it, and seemed more upset that her cousin had left without notice and owed money to her husband. She did call here the next day to inquire after Lily, and I told her that Lily wasn't missing at all, but had left the main wearings because she'd been feeling ill. With a sprained cold, Aunt Agatha said acidly. So, nobody else knows? No. What about the servants? Em shook her head. I don't believe they would talk. Not about this. She'd spoken to them and had been assured of their discretion. Of course, what people said and what they did wasn't always the same. Well, someone must know something. Because, as I said, I heard a whisper. What exactly did you hear? The old lady made an impatient gesture. Nothing solid, just the hint of a rumour about one of the Rutherford girls and the suggestion that she'd run off with a man. Lily would never, Rose began. Pish tush, girl, we know that, but the whisper is out there and we need to do something about it. Leaning heavily on her silver-topped ebony cane, she rose to her feet. Off you go, girls, and fetch your hats and coats. We're going for a drive. I don't want to go out, Rose said. I want to stay in case there's news. The best you can do for your sister is to appear in public as usual with nothing to worry about, except that your sister has, she thought for a minute, the influenza, something serious, not a sprain or a cold. In fact, it would look better if you came to stay with me, Emmeline, to protect your child, and you girls will come as well for fear of the infection. It will strengthen the story. It won't. I'd never leave my sister if she was ill, Rose declared. I'd stay too, George said. I never catch colds or the flu. I'm as healthy as a horse. Aunt Agatha closed her eyes briefly. Such a vulgar metaphor, Georgiana. Health is a desirable state for a young lady, but when you invite people to compare you with an animal... She gave a pained shudder. M laid a calming hand on George's arm and said firmly, Nobody is moving anywhere. I told Cal I'd wait here, and so I will. We all will. But fresh air and a public family outing in the park is an excellent idea, though perhaps the girls could accompany you on horseback, with their groom in attendance, of course. She gave both girls a speaking look. Better for them not to be stuck in a barouche with their aunt. They were so tense and worried about Lily that Aunt Agatha's pronouncements, which rubbed them up the wrong way at the best of times, would today be like a flame to a tinderbox. She glanced at Rose. Or gunpowder. No, Aunt Agatha, while the girls are changing into their habits, how about a nice cup of tea? Lily came awake with a jerk. Against all her resolution, she'd dozed off. Something had changed. What? And then she realised the carriage had stopped. Someone shouted. Couldn't make out what, but a moment later Nixon shouted back. In this weather, damned if I will! She cautiously cracked the lid of her prison open a sliver. Another shout. The coachman. She couldn't hear it all, but it sounded like he wanted Nixon to get out and push. The coach was stuck in mud. Nixon refused again, this time in even worse language. The coachman's voice sounded suddenly loud and close. Want to wait until help comes, do you? With that special cargo of yours tucked away? Risk em finding her, will ya? He must have climbed down. There was a short silence. Lily held her breath. Nixon swore again, then ordered the driver to do the pushing while he led the horses. She heard the door close. Then the voices came again, muffled as if from a distance. Nixon and the driver were out of the coach. 
Now was her chance. Heart thudding, braced for the lid to be slammed back down on her, she raised it inch by inch and breathed again. The carriage was empty. She scrambled out, then peered carefully out the window. She could hardly see a thing. It was raining, but from the shouts exchanged, it seemed Nixon was up ahead with the horses, and the coachman was on the other side of the coach, stuffing bracken and gorse under one of the wheels. Lily threw her cloak over her. Thank goodness it was a dark colour, stealthily unfastened the door then leapt from the coach and ran into the low, scraggly vegetation that stretched for miles on either side of the empty road. Her only hope was to lie down in it, go to ground like a hunted hare, and hope they wouldn't see her. Half a dozen steps later she found herself falling helplessly, landing face down with a hard splat. She lay, winded for a few moments, her lungs straining for air, her brain racing, trying to make sense of what happened. She was in some kind of hole. No, it was a ditch, running parallel to the road. Her breath returned in a rush. Keeping her head well down, she lay in shallow, freezing, stagnant ditch water, gulping lungfuls of cold, bracing air, trying to marshal her drug-hazed wits. Had she made any noise when she'd fallen? She couldn't remember, but a small scream or exclamation seemed likely. Had they noticed? Or had the gag muffled any noise she'd made? She peered cautiously over the lip of the ditch, through the meagre cover of the vegetation that lined it. In the driving rain, she could barely make out the shape of the coach. She squinted through the gloom, hardly daring to breathe. Nixon and the coachman continued shouting instructions and abuse back and forth. Lily breathed again. They hadn't noticed her escape. Yet. With some difficulty, for her wrists were still bound, she pulled her cloak over her head. Thank goodness she'd worn it to the main wearing's route instead of the cream silk and taffeta one. The dark blue velvet would at least hide her, if not keep her warm and dry. Between the rain and the ditch water she was drenched to the bone. And somehow, wet or not, the heavy weight of the velvet was comforting. The main wearing's root. It seemed an age ago. Was it only last night? Or the night before? She didn't know. The drug had stolen time. Released from the tight constriction of her prison, she could raise her bound hands enough to scrape her gag off. Thankfully, she gulped in fresh, damp air. Her wrists were still bound tightly, but she could breathe and she could run. Bending low, Lily half crept, half crawled along the ditch, praying she wouldn't be noticed. A loud shout almost stopped her heart. She froze, expecting any moment to be roughly seized and dragged back to the coach, but nothing happened. Eventually, unable to bear not knowing, she peeped over the side of the ditch. Through the veil of rain, she saw Nixon climb back into the carriage and the driver take his seat and gather up the reins. The carriage moved slowly away. She watched breathlessly until it breasted a slight hill and disappeared. She forced herself to wait. What if Nixon decided to lift the lid and check on her? But, after a few agonising moments, Lily decided she could delay no longer. She clambered out of the muddy ditch and began to run. Chapter Four her mind was all disorder. The past, present, future, everything was terrible. Jane Austen, Mansfield Park Woman on the road, up ahead, sir, Ned Galbraith's coachman said through the communication hatch. Looks like she's in some distress. Ned glanced out the window. There was nothing for miles, no sign of habitation. Alone? 
It was not unheard of for women to feign distress as a trap for unwary travellers. They'd stop to help and the female's colleagues would emerge from hiding and rob them. No place to hide that I can see. Walton agreed. A poor spot for an ambush, I reckon. Ned sighed. Very well. Let's see what... Another coach just came over the rise. Walton's voice rose with excitement. Looks like they're trying to run her down. And bloody hell, sir, I think her hands are tied. Ned poked his head out the window. Sure enough, a bedraggled-looking female was running unsteadily toward his coach, waving her arms frantically, and, yes, they were bound at the wrist. Another carriage was bearing down on her, the driver whipping at his tired-looking horses. She looked terrified. Ned didn't wait. He swung down from his slowing carriage and ran toward the woman. At the same time, a dark-haired man jumped from the other carriage and seized her in a rough grasp. Help! she shrieked, struggling to pull herself free, but she was no match against his brutal strength. The man growled something Ned didn't catch and dragged her back toward his carriage. What the devil is going on? Ned picked up his pace. None of your damned business, the man shouted over his shoulder. Go on your way! He's abducted! Her captor jerked her hard and she nearly fell. My wife is not herself, the man began. She's a drunken bedlamite. Not his wife! She fought him clumsily, using her tied hands like a club. Drugged! He drugged me! Shut up! The man hit her hard across the face, and she reeled, almost collapsing, just as Ned reached them. He grabbed the man by the collar and jerked him back hard, twisting it so that the fellow almost choked. Releasing the woman who fell to the ground, he turned on Ned with a savage snarl. I told you! Ned punched him hard in the face. He didn't know whether these two were married or not, but whatever the circumstances, no woman deserved that kind of violence. He said so. The fellow staggered back, blood spurting from his nose. Listen, you bastard, I can treat her how I want. She's my wife. I'm not his wife, sir. I prom... Mr. Galbraith? Oh, it is you. Oh, thank God. Ned started. She knew his name. Distracted, he glanced down at her, but before he could make out her features under the smears of mud, a heavy blow knocked him sideways. He staggered and turned. The fellow's coachman raised a cudgel to hit him again. Ned kicked out and caught him in the leg. He fell to one knee just as his master attacked. Ned punched him again, a blow to the gut, then another to the jaw that knocked him cold. The driver staggered to his feet and came at him. A pistol shot stopped the driver in his tracks. Ned's coachman stepped forward. Got two of these beauties. He gestured with the pistols. Make another move and you die. Thank you, Walton. Ned probably should have used a pistol in the first place, but truth to tell, he didn't mind a brawl on occasion. It reminded him who he was. He helped the girl to her feet. She was a mess, drenched and filthy, her face dirt-streaked. Or was that a rising bruise, and her clothes bedraggled and caked with mud? He gave her face a searching glance. Nope, no idea who she was. She gave him a shaky smile and clung to his arm, determined but wavering, as if unsteady on her feet or ready to swoon. She was soaked, shivering. The thought had crossed his mind initially that she was some country wench, taken up for a nasty kind of sport, but her sodden cloak was velvet and the few words he'd heard her speak were unaccented, educated. And she knew his name. Who are you and how do you know my... He broke off, thrusting her behind him as the man he'd felled lurched to his feet and came up, swinging. Ned hit him again and he crumpled. Ned shoved him with his boot. Take your master and go. The girl, 
stays with me. The driver hesitated. The girl clutched Ned's coat. Pass me the pistol, Walton, Ned said calmly. These two were undoubtedly born to be hanged, but... No need for that, sir. The driver backed away, his hands raised in placation. I don't want no trouble. Just a hired driver, sir. Nothing to do with me what he was planning. He hooked his master under the armpits and dragged him back to the carriage like a sheep about to be shorn. He bundled him inside, climbed up on top, turned the carriage around and drove away. As the coach disappeared over the horizon, the girl sagged against Ned. Thank God you came along when you did, Mr. Galbraith. If he'd caught me again... She was shivering uncontrollably. Cold or reaction, no doubt a bit of both. He pulled a knife from his boot and cut through her bindings. Who are you? Sorry. She gasped and bent and retched a thin stream of bile that just missed his boots. When she finished, he handed her his handkerchief. She wiped her mouth and handed it back. He received it gingerly, gave it a distasteful glance, then dropped it in the mud. Let's get you into the carriage. She took a few wobbly steps, then stumbled. I'm sorry. The drug... She reeled. Ned scooped her into his arms and lifted her into the carriage. She was drenched right through. Her soaked clothing dampened his clothes, and she stank of dank mud and ditch water, of vomit and animal manure, and God knew what else. She slumped onto the seat and almost fell as the coach jerked into movement. She looked up wildly. Where are we going? He'd been heading to Fountain's Abbey, near Ripon, to a house party there. It wasn't far, but he certainly wasn't going to arrive at Fountain's in the company of a damp and bedraggled damsel in distress. A sure route to scandal that would be. No, he'd have to return her quickly and quietly to wherever she came from. London, he suggested, and she sighed in relief. Oh, thank goodness. Yes, please. They'll be so worried about me. He knocked on the roof, gave Walton their new destination, then turned back to the girl, intending to question her. But her shivering had worsened, and her stench was slowly filling the carriage. First things first. He had all the time in the world to ask her questions, but he was damned if he'd travel another mile with a half-frozen woman who stank like a midden. You can't travel in those wet clothes, he informed her. You'll catch your death. She looked down at the ruins of her dress, some light-coloured thing partly revealed beneath the filthy cloak, and sighed. I suppose so. Her teeth were chattering. He lifted a small valise from an overhead rack and pulled one of his shirts from it. Take off everything that is wet and then put this on. Here? In the coach. Beneath the mud and bruising, a blush crept over her skin. She gave him a look in which innocence fought with awareness and strove for indignation. For a girl who'd just fought off an abductor and who looked and smelled like she'd been dragged through a haystack and then rolled in a pig pen, it was almost seductive, which was ridiculous. He said irritably, well, unless you expect me to stand outside in the rain while you change. He gestured to the window to point out that rain was pelting down again. Yes, here in the coach. And before she could suggest that she would prefer him to get soaked while she stripped off her odiferous attire, he grabbed a fur-lined travelling rug. Here, I'll hold this up to protect your modesty. You can wear one of my shirts. I'm afraid I don't have any gowns with me, and then wrap yourself in this. We'll stop at the next town and get something more suitable for you. Very well. She unfastened her cloak and shrugged it off and handed it to him. He dropped it on the floor, and his mouth dried. She was wearing a badly soiled evening gown, filthy now, 
but it was apparent to Ned that it had been both expensive and in the first stare of fashion. Wet, filmy layers of pinkish gauze clung to her like a second skin, almost transparent, outlining luscious curves. Her face and hands were muddy, but her breasts, enticingly displayed by the low-cut neckline, were creamy and lush. With an effort he dragged his gaze to her face. She gazed back at him, wide-eyed, her eyes as grey and liquid as a winter sea. Dark hair streamed down over her shoulders in dripping clumps, a mermaid come to call, wet, luscious, and enticing. A pair of tight, berry-hard nipples thrust invitingly toward him. He swallowed. It was just the cold. Nipples did that in the cold. But it took all his self-control to keep his gaze focused on her face. You'll have to help me. It's fastened down the back. He put the rug aside and moved to the seat beside her. She turned and lifted the wet mass of her hair so he could undo her gown. He stared for a long moment at her pale, vulnerable nape, then set himself to the task at hand. The dress was cunningly constructed of a series of overlapping layers that, sodden, clung to his fingers. He was well experienced at helping women out of their clothes, but he was damned if he could see how to unfasten this blasted dress. The hooks are very small, I'm afraid. Can you find them? He fished around and found a row of tiny hooks. Of course they would be tiny. He swore silently as he fumbled with each minute and impossible fastening, then became aware of the soft, creamy flesh he was revealing beneath. Cold, damp flesh, he reminded himself. She was still shivering. He all but ripped the last dozen hooks from the dress, then removed himself to the opposite seat and raised the rug in front of him to block out the sight of her. Behind the fur barrier she wriggled and rustled and sighed. It was damnably erotic. What should I do with my dress? It's making the seat all wet and dirty. Throw it on the floor. He heard a sigh. It was a beautiful dress once, a sad little voice said from the other side of the fur blanket. A dirty pink bundle plopped wetly onto the floor between them. He scraped it into the corner with the toe of his boot. He waited. The wriggling and rustling did not resume. His arms were getting tired. Are you finished? No. There was a pause. Then, did you say I should take off everything that was wet? Yes, unless you want to catch an inflammation of the lungs. But I'm soaked to the skin. To the skin. He closed his eyes. He did not need this, the thought that this unknown, filthy, and yet somehow appealing female was going to be naked, with nothing but a fur rug between them. He said in a hard voice, Take it all off, then. Your virtue is safe with me. Oh, I know that, Mr. Galbraith. There was not a shred of doubt in her voice. He was almost insulted. He had a reputation as a rake, damn it. Who the devil was this girl? Who, on the other hand, seemed like a virtuous maiden unless he misread her completely, and yet she would climb into a carriage with a perfect stranger and happily strip to the buff at his command, trusting him not to ravish her. Though it seemed that to her he was not a stranger, how did she know his name? He pondered that conundrum as she wriggled and panted and tossed soggy white garments onto the pile on the floor, garments he preferred not to think about. First a petticoat, then a chemise, followed by stays, and, oh, Lord, there went the stockings. He waited for a pair of drawers to join the pile, but there were none. Only three kinds of females didn't wear drawers. The sheltered, old-fashioned kind, women who couldn't afford them, and tarts. He waited. The suspense was unbearable. 
Are you finished? Yes, but I am still quite damp. Do you have anything I can dry myself with before I put your shirt on? Damn, he should have thought of that. Hold the rug for a minute. She took hold of it and lowered it to her chin. Her eyes were light grey, rimmed with long dark lashes and gleamed in her dirty face like polished pewter. The pupils were huge and dark and looked slightly unfocused, the effects of the drug, he assumed. It's strange, but I don't feel as cold without my wet clothes, even though... She blushed and looked away. Ned didn't need to complete the sentence. He was only too aware of her naked state. He fished in the valise, found a small towel, tossed it over to her side of the rug, then took the rug back, raising it again to block out the sight of her. How do you know my name? You're a friend of my brother's. We met at his wedding. Ned frowned. He usually avoided weddings. They invariably sparked his grandfather to fresh attempts to match him up with some female he, grandfather, considered suitable. You were his best man. His best man? Ned almost dropped the rug. He'd only ever been one man's best man. Your Cal Rutherford's sister? She grabbed the drooping rug from his nerveless grasp and tucked it around her naked body. She had not yet donned his shirt, not showing the slightest awareness of her appalling situation as she gave him a warm and trusting smile. Yes, don't you remember me? I was one of the bridesmaids. He stared at her. She'd wiped her face clean and tried not to let his gaze drop to where the fur rug was nestling like an animal against lush, bountiful breasts. This was Cal Rutherford's sweet-faced little sister? Naked in his carriage? Naked? Covered only by a rug? You're... Lucy? Her smile dimmed slightly. It's Lily. I'm Lily. Put the shirt on, Ned said gruffly. He wasn't up to taking the rug from her grasp, so he stood and turned his back. Cal Rutherford's little sister. Good... God. Make sure you tuck the rug around you as well. The shirt isn't very warm. You don't want to catch a chill. He needed her to be wrapped in thick, opaque, and shapeless layers, preferably dozens of them, and not just because of the possibility of a chill. She was a luscious little armful, too luscious for his peace of mind. His friend's little sister... Not so little any more. Marriage bait. You can turn around now, she said after a moment. He turned. She sat huddled on the seat like an orphan from the storm, her feet tucked under her, swathed to the chin in silky dark fur, the white edges of his shirt collar just showing beneath it. Her pale complexion, clean now and flawless, except for the deepening bruise on her cheekbone, glowed like a pearl in the shadowed interior of the carriage. Her mouth was full and lush, but her eyes were ringed beneath with heavy purple shadows. She looked exhausted. How the hell had a sister of Cal Rutherford ended up in such a sordid mess? He leaned forward and gently cupped her chin, tilting her face toward the light to examine the bruise. She sat quietly under his examination, blushing slightly. Her innocence, her open, trustful expression frustrated him. She had no business trusting strange men, even if she knew or thought she knew who he was. No one was who they seemed to be, no one, not even him. especially. Not him. Does it hurt? he asked, then silently berated himself for a fool. Of course it hurt. Not very much. He didn't believe her. That bastard hadn't held back with that backhander. A nasty blow from a ruthless villain. God help her if she'd ever married him. 
her gaze dropped to his knuckles, skinned and raw. Your poor hands, are they? No. He shoved them in his pockets and sat back. The movement drew his attention to the soggy pile of clothing on the floor. Froff, that stench! He opened the carriage door and kicked the pile of sodden, muddy clothing out onto the road. My clothes! she exclaimed. She peered out the window, then turned to him accusingly. What did you do that for? They were filthy. But that was my favourite dress. You can buy another one. She continued exuding silent indignation, so he added bluntly, Look, whatever muck you fell in stank like a midden. I'm not travelling all the way back to London with a stink like that in the carriage. We'll stop in the next town and get you a hot bath and something clean to wear. Oh! She glanced down at herself, sniffed cautiously, and blushed. He cursed himself silently for embarrassing her. She stank but it wasn't her fault. Do you have anything to drink? she asked. I'm very thirsty. He passed her a bottle. Cold tea, a habit I picked up in the army. Never know when you might need it. She drank it all down, draining it dry. Thirsty indeed. Thank you. I needed that. She handed it back with a tremulous smile. So, I gather you weren't eloping with that bastard. That put the starch back in her spine. No, of course I wasn't. He abducted me. How? She flushed slightly. He tricked me. She fidgeted a little, tucking her toes more securely under the fur rug. I was at the Mainwaring route with Cal and M. She explained how she'd been enticed outside. He frowned. You didn't realise the note was a forgery? You didn't recognise your own sister's writing? She turned a dusky rose pink and didn't meet his eyes. No, she mumbled, but didn't explain. She'd probably had too much to drink, he decided. She continued her story, explaining how she was shoved into a carriage and drugged, kept in a damned airless box like a coffin, and his anger grew. She glossed over the part where she'd been let out to relieve herself, mentioning only that the pins and needles had made it hard to walk, and that the fresh air had made her more alert, but he could read between the lines at her complete mortification. He wished now he'd beaten that bastard to a pulp and then dragged him and his damned coachman off to jail, if he'd realised at the time what he'd been dealing with. So his destination was Gretna Green and a forced marriage, he said when she'd finished. An heiress, are you? She nodded. Cal always warned us that men might want us for our money, but I never imagined. I didn't think. Her face crumpled, and the big grey eyes filled with tears. I've made such a mess of things. Everyone will be so worried. Not your fault he said heartily, hoping to head off the incipient waterworks. In fact, dashed clever of you to have the presence of mind to stick your tongue in the neck of that bottle. She looked up in surprise. Clever? Absolutely. You escaped from that villain all by yourself, didn't you? Yes, but if you hadn't come along... Don't even think about it. I did, and that's all that matters. We'll get you back home safe, don't worry, and nobody will know of your little adventure, and you won't be tricked by any plausible blackguard in future, will you? She bit her lip. I hope not. It came out as a shamed whisper. There was a long silence. He didn't know what to say. He knew nothing about this girl apart from who her brother was. He wasn't used to the company of virtuous young women. He'd done his best to avoid respectable women since he'd sold out of the army. He had no desire to marry, no desire to take on the responsibility for anyone's future except his own. It would be necessary one day he accepted that. He owed it to grandfather and to the family name, the blasted title, but not yet. 
She gave a sudden, convulsive shudder, then glanced at him self-consciously. Just thinking about what a lucky escape I've had. He nodded. I can't imagine what it would be like to be forced to marry a man you don't know. Her words were a little slurred still, and the pupils of her eyes were dark, the remnants of the drug. Hmm. She added shyly, I've always wanted to marry for love. Ah. He nodded as if he had some idea of what she was talking about. Love? Marriage was about duty, and heirs, and responsibility. Last year he'd almost married a woman he barely knew, the daughter of a friend of his grandfather, only to please the old man who he'd thought was on his last legs, the cunning old devil. Ned hadn't particularly fancied the girl, but he was philosophical about marriage. No matter what way you looked at it, it was a lottery, and he would have gone through with it. He'd let Grandfather down enough in his life. Might as well do this one thing to please the old man before he breathed his last. Luckily, once the girl got to know him better, she'd called it off. What had she called him? A rake and a libertine, cold-hearted, irreligious, unprincipled and irredeemable. Which was accurate enough. There was worse, too, in his past, though she didn't know about that. Nobody knew, only himself and the dead. But Grandfather was still alive and kicking, which was the best outcome of all. If he loved anyone, it was his grandfather. After a moment, Lily glanced outside. Where are we, Mr. Galbraith? I have no idea how long I was shut in the darkness. Call me Ned or Edward. Mr. Galbraith, from a girl only a handful of years younger than him, made him feel like his father, even if his father was dead. For most of his adult life, he'd been Lieutenant or Captain or Major Galbraith, or simply Galbraith to his peers. He glanced out the window. We were a few miles before Boroughbridge when we met up. She shook her head, clearly having no idea where Boroughbridge was. A dozen or so miles from Harrogate. She gasped. Harrogate? Harrogate in Yorkshire? He nodded. Then I've been missing for... how long? What day is it? I've lost all track of time. He told her. Thursday afternoon, she whispered incredulously. It can't be. The main wearing route was on Tuesday night. He watched as the truth sank into her. Two nights away. They travelled along in silence after that. Ned was relieved when she finally closed her eyes. Pools of misty grey fringed by thick, sooty lashes. Cal Rutherford should have set a guard on her. She was a walking temptation to any man, and not just because she was an heiress. She was positively delectable, and too damned trusting for her own good. Look how she was preparing to go to sleep right there in front of him, a man she barely knew. For all she knew, he could have the morals of a tomcat, as bad as or even worse than the fellow who'd abducted her. She'd just admitted she was an heiress. Just because he was her brother's friend didn't necessarily mean he could be trusted with women. Or heiresses. Of course, he'd cut off his right arm before he harmed her. He did have some shreds of honour left, but she wasn't to know that. The coach swayed as it took a bend, and she tilted dangerously, her eyes still closed. Lord, if she wasn't careful, she'd fall right off the seat. He swapped seats to sit beside her and pulled her gently upright again. Those long, dark eyelashes fluttered. She murmured something he didn't catch and snuggled up against him. He looked down at her. Her head rested against his arm, her wet hair dampening his sleeve. He didn't usually encourage or even allow women to cuddle up to him. He wasn't the cuddling sort. Blasted drug. She muttered something unintelligible and moved restlessly. The rug slipped to her waist. He swallowed, 
That shirt was too damned thin for words. Lily. She didn't stir. He tried again louder and tried to push her into a more upright position, but she was deep asleep. He reached across her to tug the rug back up to decency again, and she sighed and snuggled into his inadvertent embrace, her warm, soft curves pressed against him, her unbruised cheek cuddled against his shirt front. He regarded her helplessly. She lay against him more or less in his embrace, relaxed and wholly trustful. His arm hovered a moment over her, then he sighed and wrapped it carefully around her, only to support her, he told himself. The road was bad. There were bumps and potholes. She could fall. She slept on in his arms. The bruise on her cheekbone was deepening. Lavender shadows darkened the delicate skin beneath her eyes. Tiny curls sprang from the mass of her damp hair as it dried. She must have worn it up in an elaborate twist the night she was abducted, for though it was wet and bedraggled, it was still partly pinned up. He could see a few pins glinting in the light. Carefully, he eased them out, one at a time, trying not to disturb her. Finally, he had them all. He gently sifted his fingers through her soft, damp hair, loosening the tangles and spreading it out to help it dry. Dark curls twined about his fingers. A damp lock of hair fell across her mouth. He carefully lifted it away and smoothed it back behind her ear. A small, dainty ear with a tiny hole in the lobe. Had she lost an earring? Cal Rutherford's little sister. Courage obviously ran in the family. She'd been drugged, abducted, imprisoned for hours at a time in a cramped, airless compartment under a seat, subjected to Lord only knew what indignities and humiliations. She was bruised, cold, wet and filthy. He'd forced her to strip in his presence and had thrown away her ruined clothes. Most females, he knew, would be hysterical by this stage. Instead, she'd curled up against him, practically naked but trustful as a kitten, and gone to sleep in his arms. The remnant effect of the drugs. At least he hoped it was. Her brother had made a practical marriage in order to protect his sisters. He'd be beside himself now, poor fellow, not knowing what had happened to Lily. Brothers needed to take care of their sisters. Ned was grateful he had no younger sisters to take care of, or brothers for that matter. He'd proved long ago that he couldn't be relied on to take care of anyone. He stared bleakly out the window at the shifting scenery, the weight of warm, soft woman heavy against his chest. It was raining again, a soft grey mist. She twisted restlessly. The rug slipped, pulling the shirt awry and revealing the curve of a creamy breast and a bare, vulnerable shoulder. There were bruises on her body as well as her cheek. He dragged his gaze off her, tugged the shirt up, tucked the rug in more securely and resigned himself to the inevitable. The trip to London was going to be torture. The carriage rattled onward. They stopped for a change of horses, but Lily didn't stir. Her sleep might be heavy, but it wasn't restful. Her body twitched and wriggled, and the expressions that passed across her face, whatever dreams she might be having, they weren't pleasant. He should have killed the villain who'd done this to her. He couldn't return her to her brother in this sorry state. It wouldn't be fair either to her or to Cow. A handful of lines from his school days came to him. Sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care, the death of each day's life, saw labour's bath, balm of hurt minds, great nature's second course, chief nourisher in life's feast. His initial plan had been to drive on through the night and most of the next day, getting her back to London in the shortest possible time. She needed sleep, but 
not in a rattling, jolting carriage. Proper sleep, in a bed that didn't bounce with every pothole. And any journey to London would be interrupted every twenty miles or so when they stopped to change horses. He wanted to relieve her of her ordeal, not add to it. She needed calm and uninterrupted sleep and time to let the drug pass from her system. Food and a bath. He would restore her to her family with her dignity intact, not half-naked, bruised, dirty and dazed. He reached up with his free hand and rapped on the roof. Find a suitable small town, he said when Walton opened the hatch. We need an inn, but nothing fashionable. The lady needs a bed, a bar, food and clothing, and all with the utmost discretion, Walton. Nobody is to know who she is. He hoped to hell that her family had kept her missing status a secret. No one must learn she was not still in London, safe in her own home, in the care of her brother. Because if they did, God help her. Chapter 5 Seldom, very seldom, does complete truth belong to any human disclosure. Seldom can it happen that something is not a little disguised or a little mistaken. Jane Austen, Emma Aunt Agatha was in her element in Hyde Park, taking various cronies and acquaintances up in her barouche for a turn around the park, and complaining to them of the foolish stubbornness of her niece by marriage and her charges, Rose and Georgiana, indicated by an irritable wave of a hand as the two young girls rode behind and sometimes beside the carriage. M heard the first part after Aunt Agatha had set her down to walk, exercise being good for a breeding mother, as the carriage moved slowly off. The youngest girl, Lily, is stricken with what the doctor believes is the vilest case of the influenza, but will Emmeline or the girls consent to reside with me until all danger of infection passes? Pshaw! They will not! M hid a smile. Aunt Agatha's cronies would be used to complaints about ungrateful and intractable relatives, much more convincing than her showing concern for a niece she'd never had much time for. From time to time, the girls broke away to tell M what their aunt was saying. You should hear her, M, Rose said, half entertained. Half indignant, she's telling everyone how furious she is with you for refusing to move in with her because of Lily's supposed illness. Apparently you're risking the health of the Rutherford heir with your stubborn foolishness, as if she has a direct connection to God and knows what sex the baby will be. Oh, I hope she's a boy, M said, and Agatha wouldn't forgive her if she wasn't, poor little thing. She's mad at us too, George added. We're disrespectful of our elders and recalcitrant and... What were the other words she used, Rose? Intractable, undisciplined and unmanageable, Rose said with relish. And we are, as far as she's concerned. I don't think that part was an act. In my day, girls had more respect for the wisdom of their elders, George said in a surprisingly good imitation of the old lady. Inspired by the old lady's vehemence, they were determined to spread the news of Lily's illness far and wide, and it took all M's powers of persuasion to convince them not to mention Lily at all, unless anyone asked. They rode off a little disappointed to have learned that discretion really was the better part of valour, at least this time around. They looked stunning on horseback, one so fair and the other so dark, and both such elegant horsewomen. How she wished they were a threesome, though. Oh, Lily! It was impossible not to worry, even though M knew it did no good. The barouche passed at a sedate trot. A drift of conversation reached M. Ashenden, 
Oh, he's in no danger of infection. He's off seeing to some estate business in the country. Men are never there when you need them. The old lady was very convincing. Each time the barouche passed, Aunt Agatha's passengers would turn their heads and direct reproachful looks at M. She sat on a bench trying to look guilty but defiant, crushed and, at the same time, foolhardy, stubborn and recalcitrant. And keep a straight face. She shouldn't have found anything to laugh about with Lily still missing and the situation looking grimmer every hour she was gone. But the truth was, it was a relief to have anything to smile about, even if her amusement had to be hidden. Lady Ashenden! Lady Ashenden! M turned to see who was speaking, just as Sylvia rushed up to her. I just heard that Lily has been stricken with the influenza. So she's back, then? You found her? Oh, what a relief! I was so certain she'd eloped with my horrid cousin. What? What have I said? Keep your voice down, Sylvia, M snapped. Sylvia looked bewildered. But why? Lily didn't elope after all, did she? Everyone is saying she's been taken ill, and that's why nobody's seen her in the last few days. Yes, she's ill with the influenza, M said in a firm, clear voice, hoping any ears pricked in their direction could hear. I don't know where you heard anything to the contrary, but... People were saying that one of the Rutherford girls had eloped, Sylvia explained. Well, I knew it must be Lily, because Lord Ashenden came to my home in the middle of the night searching for her. Oops, is that meant to be a secret? No, but we don't want to spread untruths, do we? M, well aware of several members of the ton standing nearby, forced herself to sound calm and unworried. Lily left the main-wearing party without telling us because she was feeling ill. Of course, Cal, being very protective of his sisters, became worried. He has a tendency to overreact. But, as it turned out, the poor girl was coming down with the influenza and was a little feverish and confused. Oh, is that what happened? I'm so sorry I got the wrong end of the stick. But don't worry, I'll let everyone know the truth. Give poor Lily my love and tell her I'll visit her as soon as the infection has passed. Sylvia hurried away, leaving M staring after her. She casually glanced around to see if anyone had been close enough to hear. Several elegant ladies glanced quickly away and moved closer together, murmuring quietly. One word drifted to M's ears. Eloped? M borrowed a word from Cal's vocabulary. Damn! Dusk was falling when the carriage entered a sleepy little village a few miles off the main road. Ned looked out the window. Walton had chosen well. It was neither so small a village that they would stand out and be memorable, nor a large enough town to attract members of the ton who might recognise them. They stopped outside an ancient inn, crooked with age, but otherwise as neat as a pin, with mullioned windows polished to gleaming, a well-swept courtyard, and several half-casks filled with flowers on either side of the entrance. There were no fashionable travelling coaches in the street outside, no phaetons or curricles, only a rustic wagon or two and an ancient-looking dog cart. Perfect. Wake up, Lady Lily, he said, raising her gently. He had no intention of letting her realise she'd slept sprawled across him, her head snuggled against his chest, her breasts pressed against him, testing his self-control to the maximum. She stirred and abruptly came awake with a jerk, flailing out with her fists. One of them caught him in the eye. Ouch! He caught the other fist in his hand. Gently now, you're safe. Her eyes flew open, and for a moment she stared blankly at him. Then the tension drained abruptly from her. 
Oh, it's you. Sorry, I thought you were. I know, but you're safe now. He released her hand and picked up the rug from the floor. He tucked it back around her, trying not to notice, unsuccessfully, even with a watering eye, exactly how thin and inadequate his shirt was on her. Her gaze flew to his eye. Oh dear, did I do that? It's nothing. No, it's not. It's all red. Let me... He pushed away her hands. It's all right. I've had worse. He hated being fussed over. We're here. I'll go ahead and make the arrangements. I want you to wait in the carriage until... She glanced outside, frowning. Where are we? He shrugged. Some village. There's an inn here where we can pass the night in relative comfort. More comfortable than trying to sleep with a luscious, far too trusting siren draped across his lap. An inn? She gave him a wary look and pulled the rug closer around her. I don't want to stay at an inn. I thought you were taking me straight home. Ned wanted to roll his eyes. Now she got suspicious. He was simultaneously pleased at the evidence that she did, in fact, have a cautionary bone in her body, albeit a slow one, and irritated that after all this she should be suspicious of him. He'd been practically a saint for the last few hours, letting her sleep while snugged up against him, keeping her decently covered for the most part, she was a restless sleeper, and resolutely ignoring the raging appetites she stirred in his body. I am taking you home, but it'll be dark soon, so we'll stop for the night here. She bit her lip. It's just that they will be frantic with worry. Your brother will be on your trail as we speak. He's not the sort to sit back, waiting to hear. And if I know Cal, he'll have a team of men out looking for you as well. She gave him a troubled look. I think some men came looking for me when we were on the road. I tried to call out, but I was gagged and under the seat and the drug made it difficult to think, and... She sighed. They didn't hear me. His jaw tightened. That swine should be rotting in jail, or better still, dangling at the end of a rope. I'll send your family a note by messenger. Don't worry, it'll get to London faster than a coach and four. There's no need to travel through the night. Your abductor might have done so, but it's dangerous, especially when there's no moon, and I have more consideration for my coachman and the horses. And for his passenger. She was worn to the bone. She needed food and sleep and care before undertaking another long, uncomfortable journey. Besides, even if they drove hell for leather, stopping only to change horses, it would still take all night and part of the next day to get to London. He hoped to hell Cal had managed to keep the whole affair under wraps, come up with some story to explain her absence. As long as he had, and Cal was no fool, and as long as he could get her back to London with no one else the wiser, the consequences to her would be limited to a nasty experience and a few bruises. Besides, we need to get you some proper clothes. He quirked a brow, unless, of course, you want to arrive in London naked but for a man's shirt and a fur travelling rug. She gave a half-hearted little laugh. No, of course not. Good, then wait here while I make the arrangements. Lily waited in the carriage, the rug wrapped tightly around her. Guilt wrapped her even tighter. The sleep had helped, but the drug still lingered like glue in her veins, making her limbs heavy and uncertain. Her thoughts, however, were becoming clearer by the minute. Everyone at home would be so worried about her. Rose and M and George would be frantic, and Cal, Cal would be out somewhere on the road from London, out in the cold and rain, worried sick, looking for her. Mr. Galbraith, Edward, had had to turn back from wherever he was going and make the long journey back to London, and deal with a muddy, miserable, droopy creature who couldn't even stay awake. She was entirely dependent on him. She wasn't even a friend of his. 
He might know Cal, but he hadn't recognised Lily at all. All this trouble and anxiety and inconvenience was her fault. Oh, Mr Nixon might be the villain responsible, but deep down Lily knew she was to blame. If she'd had her wits about her, if she hadn't been fretting about Rose doing something reckless. But the fact was, Rose would never have sent her a note. You didn't realise the note was a forgery? You didn't recognise your own sister's writing? She hadn't been able to bring herself to explain to him about her dreadful inability. As it was, he only thought her careless, or maybe stupid, which she was, but in a much worse way than he'd imagined. She'd hoped that once she left school she'd be able to hide her weakness from everyone. Now... She burrowed deeper into the rug. The trouble was she wanted him to like her. Though why on earth would he like a girl who'd dragged him into such a mess, who'd spoiled his plans and forced him to make the long, uncomfortable journey back to London, a girl who, she sniffed at herself cautiously, still smelled faintly of mud and vomit and animal dung. The carriage door opened, jerking her from her gloomy reverie, and he stood there, looking handsome and serious, his brow a little wrinkled, but the rest of him elegant and immaculate. The contrast between them couldn't have been more depressing. I've told the landlady you're my sister, and that you had an accident on the road. Your luggage, because for reasons known only to yourself you travelled only with band boxes, was ruined when you and your carriage went off the road and into a river. Lily blinked. I was following behind in my own carriage, he continued. I am a bad-tempered fellow, and female chatter annoys me, so we travel in separate carriages. Gave her a wry look. It was the best I could come up with on the spur of the moment. He held out his hand. Luckily, this inn, small as it is, has a bedchamber with a sitting-room attached. It's very small, but clean and adequate. How are you feeling? Can you stand? Yes, of course. She stood on legs that felt as if they'd been stuffed with sawdust and started cautiously down the carriage steps, then squeaked in surprise as he swept her off her feet and held her against his broad, firm chest. Oh, but you don't need... Has to be this way he said gruffly. Don't want the hoi polloi gawking at your bare legs and feet, do we? Besides, the cobbles are wet and cold and dirty. He carried her toward the inn, where a plump, motherly-looking woman waited with a concerned expression, holding the door open for them. The landlady, Mrs. Baines, he said in her ear, Oh, and your maid broke her leg in the accident. We had to leave her behind in the care of a local physician. Lily barely heard him. She'd never been carried by a man in her life, not since she was a small child and Cal carried her about on his shoulders. She held her breath, desperately wishing she was slimmer, lighter, daintier. He strode into the inn and mounted the stairs rapidly, seemingly indifferent to her weight. He wasn't even breathing heavily. The inn was small, the floors and ceilings crooked with age, and Mr. Galp, Edward, had to bend his head to get through the doors. At the top of the stairs a door stood ajar. He pushed it open with his boot, carried her in, and deposited her gently on a rag rug. The sitting-room was small, furnished with a worn settee, an overstuffed armchair, and a small table with two wooden chairs. Through an open door, Lily could see an even smaller room containing a large bed with a spotless white counterpane and a plain oaken wardrobe. Everything was worn and a little shabby, but it all looked and smelled very clean. A sturdy young woman was crouched before the sitting-room fireplace, blowing hot coals into life with fresh kindling and a pair of bellows. At their entrance she jumped to her feet and bobbed an awkward curtsy. Mrs. Baines, who'd followed them up the stairs, said, 
My daughter Betty, sir, she'll take fine care of your sister. Turning to the girl, she said, Didst thou fetch them clothes for the young lady? Not yet, ma, I was getting the fire. Well, run along and fetch them then. The girl hurried away. Her mother turned back to her guests. Dinner will be ready in half an hour, sir. Enough time for the young lady to take a bath and, oh, here are the lads now. Two hefty young men, her sons by their resemblance to her and Betty, had appeared in the doorway carrying large cans of gently steaming water. A younger boy followed, half hidden beneath a tin hip bath carried on his back like a snail. Under one arm he carried a smart leather valise which Mr. Galbraith took delivery of. Under their mother's direction, the lads placed the bath in front of the merrily blazing fire and filled it with water, while she fussed around fetching towels and a pot of soft, strong-smelling homemade soap. Lily stood huddled in the rug, feeling useless and very self-conscious as the young men glanced surreptitiously at her, noting her bare feet and calves. "'Stop gawking at the poor young lady!' their mother snapped. "'Hadn't she endured enough already without a pair of great useless lummoxes staring at her as if they'd never seen a foot before? Now get along downstairs, will you? There's work aplenty for idle hands yet!' Her sons left sheepishly. Betty arrived a moment later with an armful of clothing, which she took through to the bedchamber and dumped on the bed. "'The girl will assist you at your bath, and in all other ways,' Mr. Galbraith told Lily. "'Consider her your personal maid for the time being. I've arranged it with her mother.' He glanced at Mrs. Baines, who was in consultation with her daughter, and handed Lily a small hinged tin that he'd taken from his valise. You might find this more to your taste. Now take your time and be sure to send for more hot water if you need it. And when you're ready for dinner to be brought up, let the girl know. We shall dine up here in private. He gave her a searching look. Is there anything else you need? Lily shook her head. Thank you. No, you're very, you're all very kind she amended for the sake of her audience, recollecting that he was supposed to be her brother and brothers were expected to be kind. Truth to tell, she was feeling a little overwhelmed. The door closed briskly behind him and Mrs. Baines, and the room was suddenly quiet. Recalling the small hinged tin he'd given her, Lily opened it. It contained a cake of soap. She sniffed it cautiously and smiled. It smelled delicious, of clean, slightly exotic masculinity and, somehow, of safety and warmth, much nicer than Mrs. Baines's homemade soap. That, I mean, do you need a hand getting undressed, miss? Betty said tentatively. Lily, recalled to her senses, gave an embarrassed half-laugh. Not exactly, she said and dropped the rug. It pooled around her feet. Betty gasped. Oh, my lordy lord, a man's shirt! Is that all? Ma said you'd lost all your clothes in the accident, but not even a shift. Lily grimaced uncomfortably, not knowing how to explain her scandalous lack of even basic underclothing. Before, in the carriage, when she was wet and half-frozen, still dazed by the drug, and dizzy with relief to have escaped, it had seemed perfectly natural to strip down to her skin, dry off, and then put on the only dry garment available. At the time, the feel of the finely woven fabric against her skin and the scent of clean linen with a hint of starch had been oddly comforting. Now, under Betty's horrified gaze, she inwardly cringed. Betty glanced at the smears of dried mud still clinging to Lily's skin and the bruise on her cheek, and her voice softened. It must have been a terrible accident, miss. Hop into the bath now before the water gets cold. You'll feel better after a hot bath and some clean clothes, and one of Ma's good dinners. She tugged the shirt off over Lily's head and stepped back. Lily stepped into the bath and sank gratefully into the steaming water. It was bliss. 
Lily wet a washcloth and picked up the soap Mr. Galbraith had given her. A hint of sandalwood, the tang of lemon, the warm fragrance of cinnamon. Clean, spicy, exotic. Essence of Edward Galbraith. She scrubbed herself first from top to toe with the rough-textured washcloth, determined to remove all trace of her noxious adventure, then knelt in the bath and lathered herself dreamily with Edward's delicious soap. The scent surrounded her like balm to her bruised spirits. Betty bustled about draping towels over a stand in front of the fire and chattering happily. "'Ma's the best cook in the village, so we'll soon have you feeling fine and dandy. Better than your poor maid, I'll be bound.' Lily blinked. "'My maid? Broke her leg in the accident, Ma said.' Lily recalled the story Edward had told the landlady. Oh, yes, it was terrible. Poor girl. Betty gave her a critical look. Washing your hair, eh? Then you'll want some of Ma's special rinse. Puts a nice shine on your hair, it does, and smells lovely. She leaned forward and sniffed, though not as nice as that soap. Thank you, but there's no need. She broke off as Betty poked her head around the door and shouted, Jimmy, fetch us up some of Ma's hair rinse. She'll know which one the young lady needs. A few moments later, a small hand poked a corked bottle through to Betty. Here you are, Miss, Ma's special rinse. Famous in the village, she is for her rinses. Full of misgivings about the greenish-yellow contents of the bottle, Lily resolved to find some tactful way of refusing the offer. She soaped her hair, then stood to let Betty rinse off the suds from her hair and body with a pail of clean, hot water. She bent over, wrung out her hair, and put her hand out. "'Pass me a towel, if you please, Betty.' "'Not yet, miss. There's Ma's rinse to go, remember?' "'Oh, but I don't think—' Betty emptied the bottle over Lily's bent head, patting it thoroughly through the wet hair with enthusiasm. The liquid was cold and bracing and made Lily's scalp tingle. While Betty fetched a towel from in front of the fire, Lily sniffed her dripping hair cautiously. Is that berries I can smell? That's right, miss. Ma used blackberry leaves for this one. Nice, isn't it? Funny colour, I know, but it smells like a breath of summer. Once your hair's dry, you won't hardly be able to smell it, though, but your hair will be nice and shiny. Wrapping herself in towels that were threadbare but clean and beautifully warm from the fire, Lily stepped out of the bath and dried herself in front of the fire, then turned to try on the clothes that Betty had fetched. What if they didn't fit? Betty was a strong and vigorous country girl, and the only thing plump about her was her bosom. Lily would be mortified if the clothes were too small. The chemise and petticoat were loose and shapeless garments. Lily sucked in her stomach as Betty fastened a corset around her and laced it firmly. Then she tossed the dress over Lily's head and tugged it down. It's me favourite go-to-church dress, but Ma insisted you have the best, you being gentry and all. Made of... Vivid red linsey woolsey, it was embellished with cream satin bows, pulled in with a drawstring under the bosom and flared out at the hips. There you are, miss. It's perfect on you. Pretty as a picture you are. There was no long looking glass in the inn, so Lily had to take her word for it. The dress was a little snug in the bosom, the design was far from fashionable, and she'd never worn such a bright colour. Again she mourned the beautiful dress Miss Chance had made for her, with the elegant layers of gauze that skimmed her curves lightly and made her feel beautiful. But there was no going back. Her poor dress lay abandoned in muddy ignominy, miles back, somewhere beside the road. She would have to face Edward Galbraith feeling, and no doubt looking, like a colourful cushion tied in the middle. Betty was watching her with an expectant expression. Lily gave her a warm smile. Thank you, Betty. It's a very pretty dress, and it's very generous of you to lend it to me. She slipped her feet into the slippers Betty had brought. 
They were a bit too big, but that was better than too small. She folded the thick woolen stockings so they doubled over her foot and put the slippers back on. That was better. Betty gave a brisk nod of satisfaction, then stuck her head out the door and let out a piercing whistle. That's to let the lads know to come and fetch away that water. Then I reckon you'll be ready for your dinner, won't you, miss? Lily was about to respond when her stomach did it for her, rumbling noisily. Betty laughed. I reckon you are and all. You keep drying your hair by the fire, miss, and I'll let everyone know you're ready for your dinner. Ned sat on a bench in the stone-flagged taproom, sipping the landlord's very decent dark ale. He'd written a note to Cal Rutherford, but, not knowing the messenger, had taken the precaution of writing, if not in code, then in a manner Cal would understand. After their wartime experiences, such discretion was second nature to both of them. It might not be wartime, but the potential for scandal was real. If it reached Cal, he'd be reassured, but if the note fell into the wrong hands, it would appear innocuous and no harm done. He'd share the unsavoury details with Rutherford later, no need to distress him or his family any more than necessary. The girl was safe and would be home late tomorrow night, God and the state of the roads willing. That was all they needed to know. He spoke to Baines, the landlord, who produced what he claimed was a reliable man to deliver the message to London. Hoping the fellow was indeed reliable, he handed over the letter and enough money to cover the cost of hiring horses to enable him to ride through the night. He promised him a handsome sum on delivery and told him the receiver would pay him a bonus if he delivered it by the morning. He'd added a postscript to Cal to that effect. It was all he could do. Even if the messenger proved feckless or irresponsible, knowing he'd sent a message would at least relieve some of the worry in Lily's mind. In any case, barring any unforeseen circumstances, she'd be back in the bosom of her family by tomorrow night. He was sipping his ale when a light, affected voice came from behind. Excuse the interruption, my good fellow, but I would ask a small fave. Good gad, it's Galbraith, isn't it? The man exclaimed as Ned turned. Last fellow I expected to see in this pokey little place. Swearing silently, Ned inclined his head. Elphingston. What the hell was Cyril Elphingston of all people doing in this little out-of-the-way town? The veriest pink of the ton, Elphingston was dressed in dove-grey skin-tight breeches, gleaming gold-tasseled boots that Ned would swear had never met a horse, a high collar with a neckcloth arranged in such a complicated knot he could barely turn his head, and a lavishly embroidered pink satin waistcoat. His red-brown hair, surely not its natural colour, was elaborately curled and pomaded. He stood out in the smoke-stained little country taproom like a flamingo in a foundry. Without being invited, he seated himself at Ned's table. He snapped his fingers in the air, which caused a liveried minion to scurry forward with a glass of port. Carriage problems too, eh, Galbraith? My damned chaise cracked a wheel and the blasted wheelwright says he can't fix it until tomorrow. He leaned forward confidingly. Understand you've secured the only bedchamber in the house. Don't suppose you'd let an old pal share? No, Ned said with uncompromising bluntness. Elphingston was not and never had been an old pal, nor even a friend of any sort. He was, however, one of the biggest gossips in the ton, and right now Ned wished him at the farthest end of the country. Dash it all, you can't expect me to sleep, Elphingston gestured disdainfully around the taproom, down here among the rabble and riffraff. Frankly, Elphingston, I don't care where you sleep. I meant, of course, on a trundle bed, surely. No. 
What about the sitting room? I gather you've reserved that, too. No, you'll have to look elsewhere. Ned turned to leave, just as the young maidservant bounced in, saying, Your sister is ready for her dinner now, sir. I've let Ma know, and the boys will be bringing it up to your room in a minute. Ned swore under his breath. Elphingston knew perfectly well he had no sister, no other siblings at all. Elphingston chuckled and said with a leer, Now I know why you're so reluctant to share, and I don't blame you. Cozy armful, is it? Ned's fingers curled into a fist. He shoved it in his pocket. Nothing of the sort, he said in a bored voice. I'm escorting a young relative. Well, more of a ward. To London, that's all. And sharing her bed, eh? There was a sudden cold silence. His gaze bored into Elphingston until the man dropped his eyes, flushing. I don't care for your insinuations, Elphingston. His voice was soft, icy. The leer slid from the dandy's face. Meant nothing by it, dear fellow, nothing at all. Ned paused a long moment as if considering the man's apology. Elphingston swallowed convulsively. Take care what that idle tongue of yours suggests. The young lady's maid will sleep on a trundle in her bedchamber. I shall sleep elsewhere, not that it is any business of yours. Ned mounted the stairs, swearing under his breath. He'd been planning to sleep on the settee in the adjoining room, purely for her protection and with the door firmly closed between them. But now, with Elphingston sniffing around, he'd have to make other arrangements. He was doing his best to ensure that there were no further repercussions from Lily's abduction, but if the dandy got the slightest whiff of her identity, she... No, they were done for. Chapter 6 The pleasantness of an employment does not always evince its propriety. Jane Austen Sense and Sensibility Edward, every inch of her skin smelled of his soap and she couldn't think of him as Mr. Galbraith any more, entered just as Mrs. Baines and Betty were setting out the dinner on the table in the private sitting room. He gave her one swift, all-encompassing glance, gave a brusque nod, and moved to the window. He stood there, gazing out across the night-dark moors in silence. By his position, he was waiting for the women to finish bustling around, but she could tell by his grim expression that something had disturbed him earlier. It took her back to the first time she'd ever seen him, at her brother's wedding, She'd found him rather intimidating back then, so tall and handsome and elegant and sophisticated, the kind of man she just knew she'd never be able to talk to without making a complete fool of herself. But she'd watched him, nevertheless, unable to take her eyes off him. The wedding reception had been held at her former school, Miss Mallard's, where M had been a teacher, and all the girls, all the females there, in fact, old or young, married or not, had made such a fuss of him. He'd been perfectly charming. The rumours were that he was a dangerous rake who'd recently been jilted, or had jilted some poor girl. The stories were contradictory, but the girls at Miss Mallard's didn't care which it was, they just loved flirting with a handsome man. The hint of danger that lurked about him only added to their enjoyment. He'd handled their attentions with lazy indifference, those wintergreen eyes of his glinting with subtle amusement. She couldn't hear what he said, but it seemed to her that every time he opened his mouth all the girls giggled and sighed and fluttered their eyelashes. Of course, the schoolgirls at Miss Mallard's rarely met any men, except at church, and they were mostly ancient, bald, or toothless, so any halfway decent-looking man was guaranteed to have girls twittering around him. A man like Edward Galbraith, lean, 
dark and crisply elegant, with a hard, clean-shaven jaw, a bold nose that was not quite straight, and a firm, masculine mouth. Well, any female would be dazzled. Even if she didn't have the courage to talk to him herself. He'd flirted easily with any female drawn to his orbit, which was most of them, Miss Mallard included. But somehow, Lily thought, it wasn't in any way personal. It was as if he'd been presented with a kitten, petted it absently so it purred happily, and then set it down, all without noticing or caring which kitten he had, or what happened to it afterward. As if women were all the same to him, old, young, pretty, plain. But once, just for a few moments, when he thought himself alone and unobserved, she'd seen him gazing out over the company with the bleakest expression. She remembered thinking then that he had the saddest eyes she'd ever seen. Then someone said something that drew him back into the present, and it was like a blind coming down. The bleakness vanished as if it had never been, and he was the sophisticated rake again. Had he been jilted? Was he heartbroken? Something had to account for that desolate expression. She studied him now as he stared out into the darkness. The last dying light had faded, and the moon was hidden behind clouds. She couldn't quite read his expression. She could only see his stern, unsmiling profile, but his body looked tense, his jaw clenched tight. There now. Mrs. Baines stood back and surveyed the preparations with satisfaction. There's faggots to start with. Faggots? As far as Lily knew, a faggot was a bundle of wood, not round, meaty balls in some kind of gravy. Savoury docks, then, some people call them, Mrs. Baines said. Lily looked closer. They don't look like ducks to me. Of course not, young miss. They're made of pig's liver, pork and breadcrumbs, she said, as if Lily were showing appalling ignorance. What's that spider-webby stuff they're wrapped in? Mrs. Baines laughed heartily. Pigs call, of course, are you Londoners? She shook her head. Famous for her faggots, Ma is, Betty said proudly. Mrs. Baines smoothed her apron modestly. Best in all Yorkshire, I've been told, though I don't know about that. Edward turned away from the window, and Lily was glad to see the bleak expression was gone from his eyes. There might even be a faint glimmer of amusement, though in the lamplight she couldn't be certain. I'm sure they'll be delicious, Mrs. Baines, he said. Beaming up at him, Mrs. Baines waved him to the table. Now, sir, sit yourself down and make a start on em while they're hot. You got to eat. Keep up your strength, fine big lad, like yourself. I'll away back to the kitchen, and Betty and one of the boys will bring the rest up in a few minutes. Lily hid a smile as he held a chair for her to be seated. With his lean, rangy build, Edward was apparently the kind of man that women enjoyed feeding. Her brother, Cal, was the same. Nobody was suggesting Lily needed to keep up her strength, even though, heavens, it must be days since she'd eaten. She hadn't felt at all like eating before. The drug had made her feel so queasy. But now, her stomach rumbled again. She was ravenous. Betty was back in a twinkling with the rest of the meal, assisted by her little brother, Jimmy. She placed all the dishes on the table and directed Jimmy to bring a couple of jugs over. There's Pa's best ale for you, sir. He said to tell you sorry, but we don't carry table wines. No call for em around here, see. And Ma thought the young lady might like a bit of barley water. She gave Lily a worried look. Lily nodded. Perfect. Thank you, Betty. When she was a little girl, Nurse used to give her barley water when she'd been sick, and now it was just what she felt like. Betty gave a relieved grin and wiped her hands down her apron. Right, then, if there's aught else you want, just call down the stairs. The door closed behind her, and a sudden silence fell as Lily and Edward were left alone. After a moment, he said, 
I sent a message to your brother. He'll receive it tomorrow in the morning if the messenger makes good time. Thank you. He, well, all of them must be so worried. We've done the best we can. His gaze skimmed her. That bath has done you good. You look quite fetching in that dress, and the colour suits you. You'll feel even better once you've eaten, I'm sure. Lily agreed. She surveyed the table. It was a veritable feast. As well as the faggots, there was mutton pie, the crust light and golden and smelling heavenly. It was served with mashed potatoes, carrots glazed with butter, and a little grated nutmeg and a dish of stewed greens. Also on the table was thick, crusty, fresh-baked bread, butter and honey. He filled her glass with the barley water, picked up the jug of ale and waved at her to start. No need to wait. A good ale takes a while to pour, so you go ahead. She said a quick grace under her breath, then buttered a slice of bread. It was fresh and smelled delicious. She bit into it and chewed slowly. Bliss. Will you try one of the faggots? They're an old Yorkshire country dish. Very good. I'll try a bit, she said cautiously. You seem to know a little about this part of the world. Are you from Yorkshire? He cut a slice off one of the faggots and placed it on her plate. Gravy. Just a little, please. She took a cautious bite. Oh, it's very tasty. He placed the rest of the meatball on her plate, then cut her a generous slice of the pie. Tender chunks of meat and rich gravy spilled from the flaky golden crust. He passed her the dish of greens, the carrots and the potatoes, ensuring she'd been served before filling his own plate. That was wonderful, she said when she'd cleaned her plate. She leaned back with a happy sigh. I hadn't realised I was so hungry. Long time since you ate, I expect. He polished off the rest of the pie and buttered a fourth slice of bread. He'd eaten nearly three times as much as she had, and yet somehow he still looked as lean and hungry as a wolf. She took a deep breath. Mr. Galbraith, would you lend me some money, please? She'd made her decision while she was taking her bath, and before that, while she was lying trussed like a goose in the cavity under Mr. Nixon's seat, she'd vowed to become more independent. He looked up, frowning. Money? What for? To pay for a coach ticket back to London. He returned his attention to his dinner. You're not returning to London on the mail coach. He said it as if she had no choice, no say in the matter. Yes, she said firmly, I am. She'd already experienced the worst coach trip she could imagine. The Royal Mail could not be so difficult. People travelled on it all the time. I'll take Betty with me if that makes you feel better. I'm sure her mother would allow it if we paid her well enough, and Betty and I would chaperone each other. It would be quite respectable— as long as you will lend me the money for the ticket. Naturally, my brother will repay you. Well, he won't, because I'm not lending you a penny. He snorted as if the very idea of her travelling on the mail were ridiculous. I'm returning you to your brother's care, and that's the end of it. He sounded quite cross, as if she'd offended him in some way. But she was not a package to be delivered. Mr. Galbraith, Edward, I'm extremely grateful to you for rescuing me and taking such good care of me while I was indisposed. But I'm in a much better case now, and there is truly no need to put yourself out for me. I'm not. She gave a frustrated sigh. If I were a total stranger, would you change your plans and turn back to London in order to return me to my family? He barely even considered her question. But you're not a stranger. You're Cal Rutherford's sister, and I owe it to our friendship to protect you, just as I would expect him to protect my sister in a similar situation. Do you have a sister? she asked, momentarily distracted by the idea of him with sisters. On the few occasions she'd seen him, she'd gained the impression he was very alone. No, no siblings at all, he added, 
anticipating her next question. Sad for your parents. They're both dead, he said indifferently. Mine are too, but I have Cal and M and Rose and George and the aunts, she said on a soft surge of emotion. She'd always taken family for granted. There was a short silence. The fire crackled. Outside in the distance an owl hooted. She straightened her spine and returned to the matter under dispute. Whatever you think my brother might expect, I can see no reason why your plans should be ruined, simply because I landed myself and my mess in your lap. But you were travelling north for some reason, I presume. He shrugged. A house party, nothing important. But your friends will be disappointed when you don't show up, won't they? He gave her a flat look. They're not my friends. They're not? Then why would you... She broke off. I'm sorry, it's none of my business. A knock sounded on the door, and the innkeeper's daughter entered with a covered dish, followed by her brother carefully carrying a jug. Gooseberry pudding with custard, she announced. Put it there, Jimmy. Careful, it's hot. Ned was not displeased to have their conversation interrupted. The house party he'd planned to attend was nothing special, just something to do, a way of passing the time. And how lame was that? Was this what his life had come to, finding the least disagreeable way to pass the time? He brooded over that insight as the girl bustled about, swiftly clearing the table and passing the dirty dishes to her brother to stack onto a tray. The people he'd expected to see at the house party? He wouldn't miss any of them. He doubted they'd miss him, either. Several of the women invited had given him subtle but unmistakable indications that he'd be welcome in their bed, but he was under no illusions as to the significance of that. If he didn't turn up, they'd find another willing man. There would be no shortage of substitutes. The thought left a sour taste in his mouth. Was his life really so meaningless? He lifted his tankard and drank the last of the landlord's good dark ale. Shall I bring you up some more ale, sir? the girl asked. Ned shook his head and she and her brother swept from the room. The gooseberry pudding sat on the table in front of him, golden and luscious, steaming softly. Lily was staring at it as if half mesmerised. A little pudding? he asked her. I shouldn't, but it looks and smells so delicious, perhaps just a taste. He cut two generous portions of the pudding, poured custard over each, and passed the smaller bowl to her. I take it we are agreed that you will return to London with me and no further argument. It wasn't a question. She sighed. I suppose so though I don't like to cause you so much tr nonsense He cut her off brusquely. It will be my pleasure to escort you. And to his surprise, he realised it was true. He would much rather spend sixteen uncomfortable hours in a coach with Lily Rutherford, half-drugged or not, than spend a week in the bed of one of the jaded ladies of the house party. Only because he owed her a duty of care for the sake of her brother, he told himself. His honour, what was left of it, required it. She finished her pudding with every evidence of enjoyment and sighed as she set down her spoon. Now I really am full. I think perhaps I'd like to go for a walk. Just a short walk to stretch my legs. Not tonight, you won't. She glanced at the window. But it stopped raining. I don't care about the weather. His voice was grim. You're not leaving this room until I say so. Her eyes widened, and Ned cursed himself for a fool. Of course, given her recent experience, she'd put the worst interpretation on his words. He hastened to explain. Nothing to worry about, just that you can't go wandering around the inn or the village. If you are to emerge from this mess without damage to your reputation, nobody must learn you were ever missing from your brother's care. 
Nobody must see you. I mean, nobody from our world. Nobody who might recognize you. Her face fell. I know. But surely, in this little out-of-the-way place... He shook his head. There's a fellow downstairs who's a notorious society gossip. He's an irritating little tick, but he's seen everywhere. You might even know him. Cyril Elphingston. Elphingston. A soft crease formed between her brows. Is he a slender, natalie dressed man with a pointy nose and extraordinary chestnut-coloured hair? That's him in a nutshell. That's if chestnut is a sort of reddish-brown. It is. He's a friend. Well, an acquaintance of my Aunt Agatha. I don't like him very much. He always has some story to tell that's often rather nasty underneath. My sister Rose calls him the Gnat. Very apt. The thing is, when we were downstairs earlier, he overheard the girl refer to you as my sister. He knows perfectly well I haven't got a sister. Oh, he nodded. That long nose of his was twitching with curiosity. He did his best to discover who you were, but I put him off. What did you tell him? Just that I was escorting a young relative to London, and of course he doesn't believe that either. Why not? Does he know all your relatives, then? Ned opened his mouth to explain, then shook his head. There was nothing to be gained by telling her that no one in their right mind would entrust a beautiful young woman to a man of his reputation, not that he'd ever been accused of trifling with innocence. In fact, he avoided them like the plague. He preferred women of experience, women who knew what they wanted, his body, not his name. It's Elphingston's nature to be suspicious, he said. Anything for a good story, I suspect, so don't step outside this door unless I tell you it's safe. Her mouth drooped. I suppose you're right. It's just that I know discretion is important, but... She shook her head. No, I'm being silly wanting to go for a walk. I can walk with my sisters when we get home again. Her lower lip wobbled. She bit on it and turned her head away so he wouldn't see. And suddenly Ned realised. She'd spent most of the last two days locked in a tiny, dark, airless compartment, bound and gagged, unable to move. She'd told him how she couldn't lift her arms, not even to adjust the gag, how it had felt like she was locked in a coffin and how she'd done her best to keep sensation alive in her feet, and how painful the pins and needles had been when she was finally able to walk again. Of course she wanted to go outside and stretch the muscles that had been cramped for so long, and to breathe in the fresh air and to loosen the tension he could see still gripped her body, despite the rest and the bath and the food. Instead, Ned had confined her to a pokey little room and all because of an irritating little busybody. She didn't deserve that. Wait here, he told her, and left the room. Lily was surprised at his abrupt exit, but then she was finding Edward Galbraith surprising in a number of ways. She'd believed him the sort of desperately sophisticated gentleman that Aunt Agatha favoured, spouting witty and urbane persiflage of the sort that often went right over Lily's head, the kind of man who would flirt charmingly with Rose and George, who were beautiful, and would look right through Lily, who wasn't. Edward hadn't looked right through her, but neither had he flirted. He'd been brusque and bossy, remote and sometimes curt, and yet underneath it all he'd been kind, protective, considerate. He was, she decided, a puzzle. A yawn surprised her. She ought to prepare for bed. She laid out the thick flannel nightgown Betty had lent her, but before she could undo a button or a lace, there was a brisk knock at the door, 
and he was back, a heavy brown cloak draped over his arm and a pair of sturdy lace-up leather shoes dangling from his fingers. You'll need proper shoes, not slippers, if we're going to take a walk, he said, giving them to her. Two steps outside and those slippers will be soaked through. But I thought, there's a way out the back. Elphingstone's in the tap room at the front. The girl, Betty, is it, will keep watch for him, if you still want to go for a walk, that is. She did. She swiftly donned the shoes, Betty's again, dabbling the woollen stockings under her feet and tying the laces firmly so that the slightly too big shoes were snug and comfortable. She fastened the cloak and tugged the deep hood up to ensure her face was well hidden. Despite its heavily practical fabric and colour, a jaunty little gold silk tassel was fastened to the tip of the hood. The small touch of frivolity made Lily smile. Ten minutes later she and Edward were walking along a narrow path that led between the houses behind the inn and up toward the hills that overlooked the village. The night was dark, with fitful glimpses of moonlight showing between the scudding clouds. They passed the last few houses in the village, warm and cosy-looking, their lamp-lit windows gleaming golden squares defying the night. They trudged along the path, skirting a dense thicket of trees, making for the top of the hill silhouetted against the night sky. He'd adjusted his long-legged gait to hers. There was something so special in walking along in the night, side by side, alone and yet together. This is lovely, she murmured. Lovely? It's damp, dashed cold. Are you warm enough? Perfectly warm, thank you. This cloak is very thick. Her face was actually quite cold and her hands were chilled, but she didn't mind. Betty hadn't provided gloves and Lily hadn't thought of them until they were well away from the inn. She'd been wearing long white evening gloves when she'd been abducted. What had happened to them? She had no idea. Not that satin evening gloves would be at all warm. Besides, cold hands didn't matter a jot compared with the exhilaration of tramping along in the darkness, breathing in the moist, crisp air, putting the horrid events of the last two days behind her. The bath the meal, and now the cold, brisk air acted like a purge, making her feel clean and whole and herself again, scouring away the memory of the sourness, the fear, the shameful helplessness. She'd survived. She was free. Nobody could force her to marry. She belonged to herself again and to her family. Whoops! she exclaimed lightly as she skidded in a patch of mud. Here, take my arm. Without waiting for her agreement, he tucked her arm into the crook of his. Warmth flowed into her chilled fingers. When do you think we'll get back to London? she asked. Depends on the state of the roads and the availability of horses, and assuming we encounter no obstacles or problems on the way, it'll take most of the day and part of the night, sixteen or seventeen hours at least, I'd prefer to drive through in one day. He gave her a sidelong glance. If you can bear it, that is. Of course I can. I'd rather be home than spend another day on the road. After the nightmare trip with Mr. Nixon, she could bear anything. But it's a long day. Can your coachman manage that kind of journey? He can. He's driven a lot longer and in much worse conditions, and I pay him well. So what time in the morning shall we leave? Eek! She broke off with a shriek as something huge and winged swooped out of the darkness straight at her. She felt the whoosh of air against her face, caught a glimpse of talons poised to attack, and ducked just as something caught on the hood of her cloak. The tug almost overbalanced her and she would have fallen had not Edward grabbed her and pulled her hard against him. What? An owl. He made no move to release her, his arms wrapped firmly around her. Did it hurt you? N no, it just gave me a fright. 
she gathered her wits. When I saw those talons coming at me, she shivered. But it didn't touch you, he soothed, his voice deep and reassuring. For a moment, she simply gave herself over to the comfort of his embrace, leaning against him, her cheek pressed against his chest, his arms firm and solid around her. She took a few deep breaths, breathing in the familiar scent of him, of soap and sandalwood and starch and safety. Then, remembering her resolution to be more independent, she straightened and stepped back. But why? I mean, owls don't normally attack people, do they? His embrace loosened, but he didn't quite release her. He ran his hand up her spine and cupped the back of her head, exploring briefly. I think you'll find that little gold tassel was the target. His hand was warm. The tassel? She felt the tip of the hood. Sure enough, the tassel was gone. I was attacked for a tassel. His mouth quirked. It was a gold tassel, after all. Your owl clearly has expensive tastes. She stared up at him a moment. Then laughter bubbled up from somewhere. An owl with expensive tastes. How perfectly ridiculous. Ned held her while she laughed, her body soft against him, her laughter a little high, a little out of control. More than was warranted by a mild joke and a small fright with an owl. She hadn't cried at all over her abduction ordeal, but now this laughter was a release. He held her close in the darkness, just for comfort and support, he told himself, even as he breathed in the scent of her, the spicy tang of his own soap wrapped around the sweet, warm fragrance of woman, a combination he found quite irresistible. A hunger stirred in him, deep long denied. He fought it. This wasn't for him. She wasn't for him. Innocent, vulnerable, sweet. No. Her laughter ended on a hiccup, and she rested her cheek briefly against his chest before pushing herself gently out of his embrace. Sorry, I got a bit carried away there. I must be more tired than I realised. Wiping under her eyes with her bare fingers, she glanced apologetically up at him, and her hood fell back, just as a beam of fugitive moonlight bathed her satin-pale face. Her hair was pulled back in a knot, but tiny dark curls clustered like feathers around her forehead and ears. The bruise shadowed her cheekbone like a stain on a pearl. Her eyes were wide and fathomless, her mouth lush and damp and sweetly curved. Ned couldn't take his eyes off her, couldn't breathe. A single tear glittered unnoticed on her cheek. He reached out a finger to collect it and caught himself up in mid-gesture. Gloves. He pulled them off and stuffed them in his pocket. She watched him, frowning slightly. I'm perfectly all right, she began. He cupped her cheek. Her skin was like cold silk. And with his thumb smoothed the tear away. Edward, she said hesitantly, but she didn't move, didn't push him away, just stood there with her cheek cradled in his hand and her eyes dark pools of mystery in the moonlight. The clouds buried the moon again, and they were standing in darkness with the scent of spring-damp earth all around them. His awareness filled with her, still and somehow breathless and expectant. Her skin warmed under his touch. He couldn't stop himself. He bent and kissed her softly, a bare whisper of skin against skin a tremor of heat, a wisp of sensation. She shivered but didn't move away. He tried to read her expression in the moonless dark but could see nothing. She sighed and her breath warmed him. 
He kissed her again, and with a soft murmur her lips quivered, then parted. She leaned into him, and he tasted innocence and luscious heat and sweet, intoxicating acceptance. She returned his kisses eagerly, a little clumsily, pressing her softness against him, loosing a ravening hunger deep within him. He pulled her hard against him, deepening the kiss, inflamed by the taste of her, the feeling of her in his arms. She slid her hands up his chest, along his jaw, and her fingers were cold, so cold, and her mouth so sweet and warm and giving. He was all heat and hunger, filled with an aching, ravenous longing that, that frightened him. It brought him to his senses. This was wrong. She was Cal Rutherford's sister, and he, he was not fit for an innocent girl's embrace. He released her, pushed her away, not gracefully, staggering back as if in recoil. E Edward, what's the mat? No! His voice was harsh, repelling. This is wrong, a mistake. But no, forget it ever happened. He wiped his mouth roughly with his sleeve as if to remove all trace of her, as if anything could. She was in his blood now. But the moonlight, the damned interfering moonlight, caught his gesture, lit it clearly, and he saw the ripple of pain pass across her face as if he'd slapped her. He reached out to her in an involuntary gesture, but she'd turned away and missed it, and that was a good thing, he told himself. He had to remain strong. He clenched his fists, fighting for some semblance of the sang-froid he was known for, breathing deeply and calming slowly as the cold air scoured him. Never had a few simple kisses thrown him so far off balance. Never had any woman, let alone a young ver. No, pursue that thought to its natural conclusion and court madness. Away in the woods, a fox screamed, lustful and forlorn. Ned knew how the wretched beast felt. After a long moment, Lily turned. Shall we continue on our way, or is it time to return to the inn? I know we need to make an early start. Her smooth, low-voiced question, so very composed-sounding and mundane, surprised Ned. Was she as calm as she seemed, or was she doing her best to hide the same sort of turmoil that raged inside him? Her breathing was audible and slightly ragged, but otherwise there was no sign of agitation in her voice or face or body, not that he could see, not in this damned, elusive moonlight. Had she felt what he... No. He forced himself to take another step back. It didn't matter what she felt. It could not be. She was a romantic, gentle young lady. Even her recent ordeal, nasty and terrifying as it must have been, hadn't dimmed her sweetness or her seemingly natural optimism, while he... He might not have reached his thirtieth year yet, but compared to her, he was a hundred years old. He took a deep breath. If she could take a couple of kisses in her stride, so could he. A couple of kisses. It felt like so much more. Time to go back, he said. It came out gruff and abrupt, but he couldn't help that. She put up her hood pale fingers arranging dark fabric, and he remembered how cold those fingers had been against his skin. Put these on. He shoved his gloves at her. I don't need. Put the damned things on. Your hands are freezing. His gloves were leather and lined with fur. He couldn't believe he hadn't noticed she wore no gloves and had no pockets in which to warm her hands, and that she hadn't mentioned it. Did this girl not know how to complain and demand she be looked after? Every other woman he knew had it down to an art form. She gave an infinitesimal shrug, took his gloves, and slid her hands into them. They were, of course, much too big, but at least they would be warm. Now, 
He was about to offer his arm, but thought better of it. He didn't need the contact. After you. He gestured and she stepped before him onto the narrow path. They walked in silence, the sounds of their footsteps and the faint scuttles and far-off cries of wild creatures of the night all that accompanied them, and thoughts tumbling, nagging, roiling. Suddenly she stopped, turned to face him and said, Was it me? For a moment he didn't understand. What? Her face was pale and intent in the moonlight. Why you stopped? Did I do it wrong? He closed his eyes. Christ. He swallowed. No, you didn't do anything wrong. She waited for him to explain further, but he couldn't bring himself to say another word, and if she stood there much longer, looking up at him with those big, fathomless eyes, biting down on those soft lips, he wouldn't be responsible for his actions. It's late. Keep moving. It sounded harsh, but it was for the best. Her best. Some expression quivered in her face, too fleeting for him to grasp. Then she turned and resumed the walk. The path was wider now, a worn dirt track. Going downhill, she skidded a little in the mud, and he leapt forward and seized her arm, preventing her from falling. Hold on to me, he told her. It was an order. She gave him a look he couldn't read, then slipped her gloved hand into the crook of his arm. A knot deep within him eased. Chapter 7 Lady, you bereft me of all words. Only my blood speaks to you in my veins, and there is such confusion in my powers. William Shakespeare, The Merchant of Venice They walked in silence. Lily didn't feel the slightest bit cold, and it had nothing to do with his gloves or her hand tucked into the crook of his arm, her whole body was alive and zinging. She darted a sideways glance at the stern profile of the tall man striding along beside her. What was he thinking? Why had he stopped kissing her just when it was getting so delicious? Questions clattered in her brain like a tree full of starlings at dusk. Did he not want to kiss her? Had she thrown herself at him? She thought back over the events of the night. She might have. She hadn't meant to. An owl with expensive tastes. It wasn't even that funny, but she hadn't just laughed at Edward's little joke. She'd ended up clinging to him, laughing like a madwoman, and crying at the same time. So embarrassing. Who'd want to kiss a madwoman? But he had. And then, this is wrong, a mistake, in such a harsh voice. A mistake for whom? For him? Or for her? So frustrating when people, men, made announcements and then refused to explain them. That first brush of his mouth over hers, so light and tender, his lips were cold from the chilly night, had given her no warning of what was to come. Heat had blossomed wherever they'd touched, that streak like hot wire spiralling through her whole body. She hadn't known it could be like that, intoxicating, addictive. She'd wanted more, hungered for another taste of him, even now after he'd pushed her away. This is wrong. Lily's cheeks burned. It hadn't felt the slightest bit wrong to her. It was lovely. Her mouth was still tingling. She could have gone on kissing him for hours. Instead, he'd broken off the kiss and pushed her away, like offering a feast to a starving beggar, then snatching it away after one taste. Not that she was a beggar. She hadn't even known she was starving for his kiss until she'd tasted him, did I do it wrong? What had possessed her to blurt that out? Stupid, not to mention embarrassing, 
and of course he wouldn't tell her the truth. He was a gentleman, invariably polite. But she really wanted to know. Had she been clumsy? Lacking? It was her first kiss, after all. She'd thought she knew what to expect of kissing. The girls at school used to discuss it endlessly. To some it was all roses and clouds and soft music, utter bliss, but to others it was awkward, disconcerting and unsavoury, all wetness, teeth and tongues and bumping noses. Kissing Edward was nothing like that. It was like hot spiced wine and fire. Oh, there were no words, only feelings. She hugged them to herself. His kiss had called to something deep within her, something almost animal, a little bit frightening, and irresistibly exciting. She'd reacted instinctively, opening her mouth to him, pressing herself against him, seeking more. Had she been too forward? Ladies weren't supposed to encourage liberties from men. Was that it? Had her behaviour disgusted him? On the other hand, could his opinion of her get any lower? She'd met him in the most sordid manner, frantic, dizzy from drugs, wet and stinking. Then she'd thrown up in front of him, narrowly missing his boots. Then she'd stunk his carriage out so badly that he'd made her strip, and she had. Stripped right in front of him, down to her birthday suit with only a rug between them, and after he'd tossed her clothes out onto the road, she'd fallen asleep all over him, wearing nothing but his shirt and a rug, probably drooling on him as well. And now she'd thrown herself at him, all because of an owl. No, poor owl, she couldn't blame him. It was Lily, all Lily, because she liked Mr. Edward Galbraith a little too much. Smoke from hearth fires hung in the air. They were nearing the village, and Lily was no further enlightened. If she wanted an answer, and she did, there was only one way to find out. She'd already embarrassed herself with this man in every way possible. She had nothing else to lose. Explain to me, if you please, why was it a mistake? He started as if she'd poked him with a pin and dropped his arm. What? I told you. Yes, but you didn't explain. We kissed. Why is that so wrong? He cast a glance at the sky, took a deep breath and said as if it should be perfectly obvious, What's wrong is who we are, you and I, our circumstances. What circumstances? Vomiting, stinking, stripping naked, and drooling all over him jumped to mind. She braced herself. He gestured. You, me, alone, out here in the middle of the night. It's not that late, and nobody knows. That's not the point. I'm supposed to be protecting you. Ah, so he was being honourable as she'd suspected. You have protected me. You saved me from Mr. Nixon. You looked after me. And tonight you stopped me from slipping in the mud and you saved me from an owl. She paused a moment, then added softly, A kiss doesn't hurt anyone, does it? He scanned the skies again as if searching for the right words, then said in a hard voice, Look, it means nothing. It was a moment of passing lust, that's all, ephemeral, temporary. Men have a tendency to take advantage of whatever woman is available, and that's what I did. And given who we are, it was a mistake. I see. If his kiss had been prompted by lust, it meant she didn't disgust him. That cheered her up. So if we were different people? We're not. I'm not for you, and you're not for me. She nodded as if she understood and accepted his words, which she didn't. It was some kind of obscure masculine reasoning, and she could see she wasn't going to get any proper explanation out of him. At least she understood 
sort of, why he'd kissed her in the first place. It was why he'd stopped that bothered her now. You're sure I didn't make a mull of it, the kissing, I mean? I need to know, because it was my first ever kiss. She felt him tense, and something prompted her to add, and if someone kisses me in the future, I would like to get it right. She wasn't sure, but she thought she heard a muffled groan. You didn't make a mull of anything. You were... It was. He shook his head. It was just a moment of passing lust. I see. Like a passing owl. He blinked at the analogy, then shook his head in exasperation. No, not like a passing owl. This conversation is becoming ridiculous. Just, just put the whole thing behind you and forget all about it. Lily thought about that for a moment, then said, I don't think I can. He frowned. Did you not hear a word I said? She gave him a warm smile. I did. Every word you said. And a few he hadn't. But if you think I can forget my first ever kiss, you're sorely mistaken. She took his arm again and they resumed walking. After a moment, she added, and I'm sorry if you didn't enjoy it because I thought it was... Lovely. A kiss doesn't hurt anyone, does it? He checked that the coast was clear and hurried her up the stairs. Did I do it wrong? Lord, preserve him from luscious innocence with big wide eyes and questions that buzzed in his brain. It, she, was the last thing he needed, or wanted. If you think I can forget my first ever kiss, you're sorely mistaken. He whisked her into the tiny sitting room and closed the door firmly behind them. Now what? He found himself staring at her mouth, rosy and moist. Was it slightly swollen from... No. He dragged his gaze off her. Time for bed. Her cheeks flushed a delicate wild rose pink, and he added hastily, I mean, of course, to sleep. The flush was from the walk in the cold air, he told himself. She gave him a shy smile. Not yet, surely. It's still quite early and the walk has woken me up. He looked away. He did not need to see her smile, did not need to look into those wide grey eyes. I'm sorry if you didn't enjoy it, because I thought it was lovely. After all, I have spent most of the last two days and nights sleeping. He seized on the excuse. Yes, but it wasn't a natural sleep. Your body needs to recover from your ordeal, and after a bath and a good meal, and that walk, sleep is what you most need. You have a long journey ahead of you tomorrow. He added briskly, The landlord's daughter will be up in a short while. I've arranged for her to sleep on a trundle in your bedchamber. Betty? Why? For propriety? Yes, I dare say she'll be grateful for an early night, too. Thank you. You're very thoughtful. Her eyes were shining. She was making him out to be some kind of hero, damn it, and he wasn't. He'd arranged the girl to sleep in her room for his own protection as much as hers, so that nobody could be compromised. I'm sorry to be putting you to such trouble. Not at all, he said gruffly. None of it was your fault. Don't worry, I'll do everything in my power to ensure you aren't harmed by this. He glanced at the darkening bruise, and without thinking, he cupped her cheek gently. She gazed up at him, her eyes wide, her skin warm silk beneath his fingers. Her breath was soft on his wrist. He swallowed, unable to look away. The scent of her enticed him unbearably, the scent of her body overlaid with his own fragrance. It was a delicious taunt, a challenge, a possession that would never take place. That bruise against her pale skin was an obscenity. He heard himself say, No one shall ever hurt you again. It sounded like a vow. Her eyes shimmered with emotion, her lips parted, and in an impulse he refused to examine, he drew her closer and kissed her. 
Her mouth opened beneath his, eager, ardent, generous. The sweet, spicy taste of her spilled through him, addictive, feeding a hunger he didn't know he had. She gripped his shoulders, pulling him closer as she pressed herself against him. A voracious hunger burned in him, and he took what she offered. A knock sounded behind him. Are you in there, miss? It's me, Betty, and me mum. With an effort, Nud mustered the remaining shreds of his self-control. He dragged his mouth from hers, steadied her, then turned and opened the door. Betty and her mother entered, bearing bedding and night clothes. They bustled about, making up the trundle bed. Ned stood back, watching the women snapping and smoothing sheets, the view from the window, unrelieved darkness, there was nothing to see, anything but Lily. She'd seated herself in the chair by the hearth and remained there, gazing into the fire as if fascinated. He couldn't see her face, couldn't tell what she was thinking. He forced himself to breathe slow, deep breaths as he fought to regain a semblance of cool indifference. He told himself repeatedly that he was glad they'd been interrupted. His body knew it for a lie. What had possessed him kissing her again? He'd spent the last part of the walk distancing himself from that first imprudent and inappropriate kiss, making it clear to both of them that it meant nothing. And then to kiss her again. Madness. But her words had eaten at him. It was my first ever kiss. Did I do it wrong? He couldn't leave her thinking that, could he? An ungentlemanly thing to do. He snorted, so gentlemanly to kiss her half senseless. He glanced across at her. She hadn't moved, hadn't lifted her gaze from the dancing flames and glowing coals. The truth was she kissed like an angel. A very earthy, sensual angel, ardent but untutored, a combination of eagerness and innocence that simply unravelled him. Blame the first time on the moon, the night, even the blasted owl, a moment out of time, but to do it a second time, what had he been thinking? The truth was there'd been no thinking at all, only reacting. What was he a green boy to be unable to resist the innocent offerings of an unwitting siren. For siren she was, to him at least. But Lily Rutherford was not for him. He was standing in for her brother, that was all. The women finished their arrangements. Mrs. Baines left first, adjuring Betty not to keep the young lady awake half the night with her chatter. I'm so glad you wanted me in here with you, miss. Betty confided when her mother had gone. Pa went and rented out my bed to a gentleman downstairs. I think he must be a lord or summat. I never seen a man dressed so fine and fancy in me life. I thought I was going to have to put Jimmy out of his bed and him sleep on a mat on the floor until Ma told me your brother wanted me to sleep in here with you for your reputation. She threw Ned a sunny smile. Pa's in the doghouse, but Ma's right pleased with you, sir. The news didn't please Ned at all. He'd decided to sleep on a bench in the tap room, like Elphingstone, and keep an eye on the fellow. Lord knew where he would be lurking now. Ned didn't trust him an inch. He glanced at Lily, but there was nothing to be said now, not with Betty there, and that was a good thing, he told himself. He took his leave, saying, I'll bid you good night, then. Sleep well, ladies. Betty giggled at the idea of being a lady, and lock this door. He waited outside until he heard the lock click. As he turned, he glimpsed a long nose and a well-pomaded curl of reddish-brown hair slide into the shadows along the hallway, Elphingstone sniffing about. With a sigh, Ned seated himself ruefully on the stairs. It was going to be a long, uncomfortable night. The landlady was still on the landing. She eyed him curiously. Sir? Would you bring me a blanket, please? A blanket, sir? 
She took in what he meant, and her eyes widened. You're going to sleep here, on the stairs? He gave her a cool look, as if to say why not. It was not for her to question his actions. If he took a fancy to sleep on the stairs, that was his own business. But her brow cleared, and she gave him a warm, motherly smile. I did wonder before whether the lass really was your sister. Well, arriving with no luggage and the state of her, but I can see now you truly are her brother, sir, taking such good care to protect her from all possible harm. I'll bring you up a blanket and a pillow too, sir, and a nice hot toddy. She bustled off, leaving Ned muttering irritably under his breath. Of course, the inmates of the inn would speculate about the state of his sister arriving in an almost naked state and with no luggage. Bet his last penny Elphingstone would have wormed that out of them already. The landlady returned, and under her motherly eye, Ned wrapped himself in the blanket, smiling until she left him alone. How the devil had he landed himself in this fix? Lily Rutherford's future was no business of his. She still dreamed of marrying for love, still thought that escaping from her abductor was all that mattered, and that she was safe now. Safe? She was in almost as much danger of a forced marriage now as she'd been with that swine Nixon. He should have found her a safe place and left her there, with some respectable matron, or in a convent surrounded by nuns. Ned sipped the hot toddy gloomily. Where was a nunnery when you needed one? He could see exactly where this affair was leading and could see no way out of it. The last thing he wanted was responsibility for a helpless virgin, but what choice did he have? He couldn't have left her in the state in which he'd found her, half-frozen, filthy and still dazed from whatever drug she'd been given. Stripping her of her wet clothes had been the only possible thing to do. He hadn't known she would be delectable even in her filthy state, not that it mattered whether she was beautiful, her being female and unmarried was the problem, and him being an eligible bachelor. Even if he had taken her to the home of a respectable matron, there were one or two living in the district friends of his grandfather, then what? Respectable matrons gossiped with the best of them. The story would have inevitably spread, and the scandal would have ruined her anyway. It was a damnable mess, and his only hope of getting out of it without causing a major scandal was to get her back to London without anyone knowing. It could be done. He'd managed several covert assignments in his army days. He'd smuggled people across borders and spirited them out of palaces and prisons. Getting Lady Lily Rutherford back into her home without incident or repercussions should be, would be, quite straightforward. He pulled the blanket tighter and tried to sleep. You can blow the candle out now, thank you, Betty, Lily said. Betty snuffed the candle and the room settled into darkness, the only light coming from the fire in the little sitting room. They'd left the door open for the warmth, though it wasn't really cold. It was cosy, lying snug in bed, watching the glow of the coals. After a few minutes, Betty said quietly, He isn't really your brother, is he, miss? Lily hesitated a moment. No, but don't tell anyone. I won't. Ma don't think so either, but she likes that he got me to sleep in here with you. Shows he's a proper gent, she says. Lily smiled to herself. He is. They lay in the darkness, the only sound the occasional crackle and hiss of the fire, and below them the murmur of men drinking in the tap room. He kissed you, didn't he? Betty said, just before Ma and me came in. Yes. I thought so. What was it like, if you don't mind me asking? Lily didn't mind. Betty was no real substitute for her sister Rose, but Lily was bursting to tell someone. She tried to think of how to describe the glorious sensation of kissing Edward, but before she could say anything, Betty added, I've been kissed a couple of times, not that I wanted it. 
The first time it was Heck, the stable boy. He just grabbed me one day with no warning, and he's ugly, miss, and old, forty or more, and his teeth are all black and broken. Ugh, it was horrible. I had to knee him in the you-know-whats to get away. The you-know-whats? Betty explained the process with relish, and Lily recalled that Cal had once told her and Rose about a man's most vulnerable place and how they could defend themselves if necessary. It seemed an age ago. In all the panic of her abduction, she'd forgotten. The second time, Betty continued, it was a fellow who was just passing through on his way to... I forget where. I sort of let him, because I wanted to know what it felt like... And he was clean and youngish, with nice teeth and good clothes, and he was passing through so it wouldn't get all around the village and damage me good name. And how was it? Betty snorted. I reckon he'd had a bit too much of me pa's ale, cos it was all sloppy and mushy, like kissing, oh, I don't know, a big warm snail. Ugh! She laughed, and Lily laughed with her. There was a short silence, then a soft question came out of the darkness. So, what was it like for you tonight, miss, when Mr. Galbraith kissed you? Bliss! Lily sighed with happy remembrance, simply glorious. Did he put his tongue in your mouth? I heard they do that sometimes. Lily felt herself blush in the darkness. Yes. There was a short silence. Wasn't it horrible? Not at all. It was wonderful. Betty considered that. I wonder if I could get your Mr. Galbraith to kiss me, just so's I know what it's supposed to be like. Lily was shocked at the surge of jealousy that spiked through her. She said stiffly, I think it's only good with the right man. I don't suppose he'd want to anyway, would he? Not after he's kissed a lady like you. Betty sighed gustily. Trouble is, I've got a few fellas wanting to court me. The inn makes good money, and Pa's made it known that when I marry I'll come with a goodly sum. Me marriage portion, I mean. And I like two of them fine, but not in any special way. Have you thought of kissing each of them and comparing? Lily suggested. Yes. But it's risky, miss. I don't know what it's like for ladies from London, but around here, you let a fella kiss you, and next thing the vicar is calling the bands, or else your reputation is shot. I see. Lily pondered that. It wasn't all that different in London, not for unmarried girls of good family. But kissing Edward was her secret, her very special, precious secret. Nobody in London need ever know. A yawn surprised her. We'd better get some sleep. It's going to be a long journey tomorrow. Night, Betty. Night, miss. Lily snuggled deeper into bed, closed her eyes and relived every sensation of the kiss. Kisses. He wanted her. She could feel it. It wasn't just someone paying her an empty compliment. Edward desired her. She'd been attracted to him from the first. Like all the other girls who'd flocked around him at Cal's wedding reception, she'd been drawn to him like a moth to a flame. She'd hung back, knowing a man like Edward Galbraith was completely out of her league. But tonight he'd kissed her. On two separate, glorious occasions— Oh, he'd claimed it was merely a case of passing lust, and maybe it was, but inside she was still tingling, and she was dazed, dazzled, delighted. She didn't want to sleep, she wanted to dance and sing and twirl madly around and kiss him again. Edward Galbraith had kissed her, ordinary little Lily Rutherford, twice. But even as she thrilled to the memory, guilt pierced her. She had no business kissing a man under a fitful moon, while her family was at home, frantic with worry. Any news? 
Em came to a standstill as she and Cal asked the same question simultaneously and realised in the same instant what the answer must be. Cal had just arrived home. It was almost midnight, but Em, though tired, had been putting off going to bed, just in case. They didn't go to France, Cal said wearily, pulling off his soaked greatcoat and gloves and dropping them on a nearby chair. Not from Dover, at least. Storms in the Channel prevented anyone crossing for the previous two days. All the ships were still tied up. I checked every one of them and every hotel and inn, as well as inquiring at every post inn on the way. There was no sign of either of... He broke off as he took in his surroundings. Under the spatters of mud, his face paled. What the devil are all these flowers for? Em? Em hurried forward and hugged her husband tightly. Hush, it's not what you're thinking. We put it about that Lily has the influenza and the flowers are from her well-wishers. We've also been inundated with fruit. He kissed her, a kiss full of rough desperation, then wrapped his arms around her and held her close for a long moment, rocking slightly. His weariness, his despondency were palpable. Don't worry. I'll find her. He released her, smoothed a curl back off her face, and gave her a rueful smile. Sorry, I've made that pretty piece of nonsense you're wearing all wet and muddy. As if she cared about the state of her dressing gown. Her husband was worn to the bone. He'd ridden from London to Dover and back and from the wrung-out look of him he hadn't had a wink of sleep in days. It will be Gretna, then. He passed a hand over his stubbled jaw. I just need a change of clothes and something to eat and I'll be off. He was swaying with exhaustion. You'll do nothing of the sort, Em said firmly. You're going to have a hot bath, then a hot meal, then sleep. She tugged on the bell pull. I don't need. Burton, the butler, arrived, still in his day clothes and neat as a pin. He picked up the discarded clothing, saying, You rang, my lady? A hot bath and a hot meal for his lordship, please, Burton. The butler bowed. At once, my lady. I'll take the bath and the meal, but I can't wait around, Cal began when Burton had gone. How long is it since you slept? He shrugged. His beautiful grey eyes were bloodshot with dark rings beneath. She said softly, the night before the Mainwaring route, was it not? He said nothing, but his expression confirmed it. Through cracked lips, he said, Do you think I can sleep while some bastard has my little sister in his power? Do you think you can search for her effectively without sleeping? She countered, you told me once that a person who gets insufficient sleep does not think clearly. They make mistakes, remember? We were talking about the war. She gently rubbed his rough stubbled cheek with her palm. Be rational, my darling. Sleep tonight and make clearer decisions in the morning. He hesitated and she added, if Gretna is the villain's destination, the men you sent to search for her on the road will be there. They might even have found Lily by now. But they might not. And did you not tell them that if they failed to find her on the road, one of them was to remain at Gretna and watch for her until further notice while the other one returned with whatever news they had? Yes, but... There was only one way to deal with such heroic stubbornness. Very well. If you don't go to bed and get some sleep, then I won't either. He gave her a shocked look. But you must. His gaze dropped to her burgeoning middle. You need sleep for the baby's sake. She shrugged. I couldn't possibly sleep knowing you were riding off into the night worn to the bone and not having slept for the last three nights. Besides, you know I sleep better when you're in bed with me. There was a long silence. Stooping to blackmail, love. She smiled. You give me no choice. Besides, you know I'm right. You'll do better after a sleep. He pulled her into his arms. 
I'm going to muddy up this frivolous garment again. She held him tight and lifted her face to receive his kisses. I'll be taking it off soon anyway. Chapter 8 But far more numerous was the herd of such who think too little and who talk too much. John Dryden, Absalom, and Akitifel Ned passed a cold, uncomfortable night on the stairs, sleeping fitfully and waking often. When he did sleep, he was disturbed by dreams of owls and kisses and fur rugs that kept slipping off pale silken skin, which didn't help. Then, at some ungodly hour after he'd finally drifted off, Elphingstone tripped over him. What the hell? Sorry, 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 needed to visit the privy and can't find the pokey blasted cabby hole where they put me. The man babbled, backing away. Didn't see you there in the dark, Galbraith. A likely story. The fellow's curiosity was legend. Perhaps Ned should have let Elphingstone think he was travelling with his mistress instead of wetting the man's curiosity with a mystery. But if he had discovered Lily's identity then, she would have been ruined for certain. This way there was at least a chance. For the rest of the night, Ned dozed on and off, but he rose at dawn with a plan in mind. He went in search of hot water, shaved and made his ablutions, then went to find Mrs. Baines. Big, bluff and hearty though the landlord was, Ned had earlier decided that Mrs. Baines was the true general in that family. He explained his scheme to her. The good lady took a little convincing, but he offered her a handsome payment, and she finally agreed to his proposal. That achieved, he went upstairs and found Lily and Betty already awake and dressed. He explained his plan to them. Betty went in to strip the beds. In the morning light, the bruise on Lily's cheekbone was dark and livid against her creamy skin, and there were faint lilac shadows beneath her eyes. But her eyes were clear and bright and lovely, with no shadow of a drug in them, and for that he was thankful. How did you sleep? he asked her while Betty bustled about in the next room. Surprisingly well, thank you. No nightmares or other problems sleeping. It would be perfectly understandable if she did suffer a reaction to her ordeal. She shook her head. No, it's odd. I thought I might have bad dreams or wake up with night terrors of some sort, but I didn't. Perhaps the drug helped blot it from your mind. She considered the suggestion. You know, that might be it. Thinking back, it's almost as if that part of the journey, the part when I was shut in that horrid box... It's almost as if that were the dream, the nightmare. The bit that's clearest in my mind is when I was out of the coach in the cold air, hiding in the ditch, running away from Mr. Nixon and... and... And fighting him off very bravely, he finished for her, not to mention being hit across the face by the filthy brute. She blushed at his praise. You're the one that fought him. But if the drug has helped me forget it and allows me to sleep through the night without nightmares, well, that's something to be grateful for, isn't it? It is indeed. Again he was impressed by her quiet courage. Most ladies of his acquaintance would be milking the situation for all it was worth, not trying to shrug it off. Now, breakfast will be here in a few minutes. You're clear on what to do when you go downstairs? She nodded and Betty, coming back into the room, added, Yep, I'm going to enjoy this. As he went downstairs, he ran into Elphingstone. As he expected, he'd swear the fellow was usually the type to snore the morning away, but this morning he was up bright and early in order to sniff out the mystery. Morning, Elphingstone. Sleep well? Not in the least. I passed a very disturbed night he snapped. I'm sure there were fleas in my bed. Either his valet had not yet attended him, which seemed unlikely, or he was displeased with his master. 
Elphingstone's hair had lost a good deal of its puff and was distinctly lopsided. Join me for breakfast in the tap room. Elphingstone hesitated and glanced up to the landing outside Lily's room, but Ned left him no choice. I'll order for us both. Meet you in the tap room in five minutes. Ned ordered breakfast for two, and while he was at it, quietly informed Mrs. Baines that Elphingstone was a notorious London gossip, out to make trouble for himself and his sister. He told her he planned to smuggle Lily out of the inn as soon as possible after breakfast. A nasty gossip, is he? I thought as much, Mrs. Baines said in a voice that boded no good for Elphingstone. Driven us all mad, he has with his finicking ways and fussing about this and that. Nothing is ever good enough for Lord Fancy Pants. Well, who asked him to stop here, I ask you? Ned added fuel to her already smouldering fire. He told me there were fleas in his bed. Fleas? Mrs. Baines's already impressive bosom swelled mightily. How dare he? I'll give him fleas. Don't you worry, sir. I'll make sure he stays well away from your sister. Fleas indeed. She marched away. After a large and sustaining breakfast, Ned sent for his carriage to be brought around. Leaving, eh? Elphingstone said. Yes, you'll be able to rent the room tonight. Elphingstone snorted. Not if I can help it. Demmed wheelwright ought to have my carriage ready by now. Sent my man around to check. He remained loitering in the hotel entryway, feigning interest in a collection of horse brasses displayed on a wall and peeping curiously up the stairs from time to time. Waiting for Ned's young relative to appear, no doubt. A few moments later, a female figure enveloped in a faded blue cloak, appeared at the top of the stairs, peered out from beneath the capacious hood as if to check that the coast was clear, and then hurried downstairs. Elphingstone sprang forward. Let me help you, my dear. My name is Elfing. Oh, he exclaimed as Betty pulled back the hood. She grinned. Morning, sir. I hope I'll be getting my bed back tonight. Yes, yes, he muttered crossly. Get along with your girl. He returned to demonstrate further fascination with the horse brasses and ignored Betty as she collected a large knotted bundle from her mother and went outside. A moment later, another cloaked and hooded figure tiptoed cautiously downstairs. Again, Elphingstone sprang forward. May I assist you, my dear? He seized an arm. The hood fell back, and Betty's younger brother, Jimmy, glared up at Elphingstone. I ain't nobody's dear, and certainly not yourn. He wrenched his arm from Elphingstone's grasp and stepped away. That basket for me, ma, he said, and collected a large covered basket from his mother. Very considerate of you to be so helpful toward the inn's staff, Elphingstone, Ned commented casually, though I'm not sure the landlord will take to you roughing up his son, or his daughter for that matter. I wasn't. I... Oh, forget it, Elphingstone muttered, just as another young woman came down the stairs, half buried beneath a large bundle of laundry. Want me to strip your bed, sir? She asked Elphingstone as she passed. Her soft Yorkshire burr was muffled by the load she carried. No, no, get along with you, he snapped, stepping back ostentatiously to let her pass. I'll be off now, Ned told him after the young woman had disappeared. Good luck with getting your wheel fixed. Eh, what? Elphingstone glanced around. But where's your... He broke off realising he'd been tricked, and hurried to the entrance to try for a glimpse of Ned's elusive companion. Mrs. Baines stepped into the breach, blocking his exit. Now, my fine gentleman, what's this I hear about fleas? I'll have you know, there's never been a flea yet in my inn, and by all accounts you have a reputation for spreading nasty rumours. So... 
As Ned swung lithely into the carriage, he heard the sound of raised voices, a grim female one and a light male voice babbling in protest. He grinned. Your mother is a redoubtable woman, he told Betty. I don't know what that means, sir, but she ain't one to be crossed right enough. Serve him right for spreading nasty rumours. Me bed's as clean as a whistle, all the beds are, and I changed his sheets myself. She added with a grin. The wheelwright he's waiting on is me Uncle Billy, Ma's brother. So, Lord Flea Bit'll be lucky to get his wheel fixed any time this week. They all laughed. He glanced at Lily. That wasn't a bad Yorkshire accent you did before. I was almost fooled myself. She smiled. Betty coached me. He suddenly realised there was one passenger less in the carriage. Where's your brother, Betty? I promised your mother. Jimmy's up on top, mad about horses he is. Wants to drive a coach when he grows up. Mr Walton said it was all right by him as long as it was all right by you. She bounced excitedly on the seat, almost dislodging the large covered wickerwork basket beside her. London, eh? Jimmy and me are that excited. We never been farther than Leeds. I want to thank you, sir, for taking us up. Ma said you need me to chaperone Miss Lily, and Jimmy is coming to look after me. Yes, and I promised your mother I'd put you on the coach back home myself. But not before you've seen the sights of London, eh, Betty? A tiny smile hovered on Lily's mouth. He couldn't look away. Until this year, I'd never been to London either, so I've promised to show Betty and her brother all the famous places and sights she's heard about, only not... She glanced at Betty, her eyes dancing. Turns out the streets ain't paved with gold after all, Betty said in disgust. Ned smiled faintly at Betty's naivete. She'd never been twenty miles past her village, and travellers at the inn had filled her ears with some very tall tales about the nation's capital. He leaned back in the corner of the coach and let the female chatter wash over him. They had a gruelling journey ahead of them. Normally he wouldn't attempt to cover that distance in one day, but the longer Lily was away from home, the more likely it was that the story would get out. He pretended to be gazing out the window, but at a certain angle he could see the pale shadow of Lily's reflection in the glass. He couldn't take his eyes off her. He was glad he'd arranged for Betty to come in the carriage. Being alone in the carriage with Lily would have been... unbearable. She would fall asleep eventually. It was a hellishly long journey to make in a day, and if they'd been alone he would have been obliged to hold her again to prevent her from falling. He'd have to feel her softness against him, smell the fragrance of her hair and body. At least she was fully dressed this time. He wasn't sure whether he was grateful for that or not. He watched her face in the glass, fascinated by the changing of her expressions and the sweetness of her. Anyone would think she really was interested in a tavern maid's conversation. He'd hired Betty to ensure that everything would be drearily and safely proper and respectable, everything, meaning himself. What had he been thinking of kissing Lily last night, and why could he not put the memory of those kisses out of his head? He'd kissed scores of women, slept with dozens and moved on from them all without regret. Why was this one girl so impossible to dismiss? He was aware of every movement she made, every shift in position. His ear was attuned to the timbre of her voice, and whenever she moistened her lips, it was as if he could still taste her. Fifteen more hours to London. It occurred to him suddenly that the girls had fallen silent. He focused on Lily's reflection in the glass and found her staring back at him, or at least his reflection, or was she staring through his reflection and beyond to the passing scenery? He couldn't tell. She cocked her head and gave him, or the window, a little smile. Did she know he'd been watching her? He gazed thoughtfully out the window a moment longer, pretending fascination with a flock of sheep, then turned away from the window. Ah, 
the bucolic pastoral life. So, he glanced from one to the other, run out of things to talk about. It's going to be a very long journey. I have some things here to help while away the hours. He opened a small compartment set into the framework of the carriage. Lily leaned forward eagerly. My father's carriage, my brother's now, has a similar compartment with all sorts of entertainment, card games, puzzles, backgammon and drafts. Betty frowned. Don't the pieces slip off the board with all this bumping around? No, they're specially made for travelling, she explained. They come in a little wooden box that opens out flat with hinges to form the board. All the pieces have little pegs, and they slot into tiny holes in the board so they don't slip or fall off when the carriage hits a pothole or bump. Cal's set has chess pieces too from India, I think, carved in ivory and ebony. It's beautiful, but I don't play chess. I have something similar, Ned said, but since I was planning for a solo journey, I left the games at home. I think you'll enjoy these, though. He pulled out a small stack of books. To his surprise, Lily made no attempt to examine the titles. She sat there with a frozen half-smile, saying nothing. Her expression gave him a sudden, unwelcome thought. He glanced at her companion. Can you read, Betty? Of course I can, Betty said scornfully. Went to the school in the village for three years, didn't I? She examined the books eagerly. Got any scary stories? That was all right, then. For a moment he thought he'd embarrassed the girl, but of course an innkeeper's daughter would have some schooling. He selected a small grey volume and handed it to Betty. Try this. Mr. Lewis's The Monk. It'll curdle your blood. Betty seized it gleefully and curled up with it in the corner of the carriage. He selected a book bound in pretty blue leather and offered it to Lily. This one might appeal to you. It's called Persuasion, by the author of Pride and Prejudice, who I know all the ladies love. By all accounts, it is... No! The word almost burst out of her. He frowned. What the... Sorry, but no thank you. She avoided his gaze, her colour a little heightened. Already read it? Then what about... No! I... Uh, I cannot. She took a deep breath and seemed about to say something, but then she hesitated, slumped a little, and said in a defeated-sounding voice, I get sick if I try to read in a moving carriage. She sounded almost ashamed, but plenty of people suffered from travel sickness in a carriage. Never mind, I used to have an aunt with the same problem, he said easily, I'm sorry now I didn't bring any games or puzzles. There was a short silence. Then he added, Have you actually read Persuasion? No, she said stiffly. Then what if I read it aloud to you? She blinked. Aloud? You'd read it aloud for me? He nodded. It would be my pleasure. I never get carriage sick, and I'd quite like to read this. So, how about it? That would be lovely. Thank you. She gave him a brilliant smile. He opened the book and began to read. Sir Walter Elliot of Kellynch Hall in Somersetshire was a man who, for his own amusement, never took up any book but the baronetage. As he read, his voice deep and clear, even over the rattle and creak of the carriage and the sound of the horse's hooves, Lily's panic slowly subsided. Can you read, Betty? Of course, ask the innkeeper's daughter that. Don't bother asking the earl's daughter. No question that she could read. I get sick if I try to read in a moving carriage. It was perfectly true except that she felt sick whenever anyone asked her to read. When was she ever going to get over this? The fear of people discovering that at the age of eighteen, Lady Lily Rutherford still barely could read, and not at all if anyone was watching her. 
It was a disgrace, her greatest shame, and she had no excuse for it. There was nothing at all wrong with her eyesight. She could see perfectly well to embroider, to knit, to pluck a stray hair from her eyebrows. It was stupidity, that was all. There could be no other answer. She didn't feel stupid, but the evidence to the contrary was overwhelming. And to admit to Edward Galbraith that she was so stupid as to not even be able to read, she simply couldn't bring herself to do it. That look would come into his eyes, the look she dreaded but was so horridly familiar with, the look first of incredulity, then scorn, or worse, of barely disguised pity. And then they treated her as if she were really stupid and couldn't understand the simplest things. If Edward ever started to talk to her like that, she couldn't bear it. He read on, his voice deep and almost mesmeric, carrying effortlessly over the rattle of the carriage and the sounds of the horses. His two other children were of very inferior value. Mary had acquired a little artificial importance by becoming Mrs. Charles Musgrove, but Anne, with an elegance of mind and sweetness of character which must have placed her high with any people of real understanding, was nobody with either father or sister. Her word had no weight. Her convenience was always to give way. She was only Anne. Like Papa, who valued Rose for her beauty and spirit, and had seemed to love Lily equally, until he'd learned after Mamma had died that Lily, who was almost twelve at the time, still could not read. Papa had called her an imbecile, and so he'd sent them both, punishing Rose as well for Lily's inadequacies, away from everything they knew, from everything they loved, to an exclusive school in Bath, and promptly forgot about them. She had lost her father's love when she was almost twelve. An imbecile, an embarrassment to the family. Lily forced the lump in her throat away. There was no use dwelling on the painful recollections of the past. Old hurts might not heal, but they eventually faded. She had to believe that. She settled back against the deeply padded leather seat and listened to Edward's voice. She could listen to him all day. Only Rose and Mamma had ever taken the trouble to read books aloud to Lily. Besides, she wanted to hear what happened to this Anne Elliot, whose father so unkindly disdained her. I'll take it, Burton. Em took the tray containing her husband's breakfast and quietly closed the door. It was almost noon. Cal would be furious. He'd asked to be woken at dawn, but he'd been so exhausted that he'd fallen asleep the moment he hit the bed, and she couldn't bring herself to wake him. Until now. She drew back the curtains and light flooded their bedchamber. Cal stirred, pried open bleary eyes, stared at the weak spring sunshine and sat bolt upright. What time is it? Nearly noon. The coffee's hot, so don't spill it, she said calmly, and placed the tray on his lap effectively preventing him from leaping out of bed, at least not without spilling hot coffee everywhere. Wifely tactics. Noon? I left instructions to be woken at dawn. I know. I countermanded them. Eat your breakfast. You need to eat. Damn it, Em! I have to... A strange little note arrived a short while ago. Note? What note? Is it ransom? No. It seems to be from Mr. Galbraith. Galbraith? Ned Galbraith? What's it say? It was addressed to you, but I opened it anyway. He put out his hand for it, but she held it back. I'll read it to you while you eat. She waited until, with a long-suffering expression, he shoved a forkful of eggs into his mouth. Then she read the note aloud. Found your missing package in good condition. We'll return it to you at earliest convenience. 
Friday night or early Saturday morning. E. Galbraith. She looked at Cal. Well? He held out his hand and she gave the note to him. He glanced at the signature, then slumped back against the pillows. She's safe. Galbraith's got her. Thank God. M plopped down on the bed beside him. Coffee slopped over, dripping onto the tray, but they neither noticed nor cared. I thought that's what the note must mean, but I couldn't be sure. Rose and George burst in. Is it true? Lily's been found. She's safe. Clearly they'd been listening at the door. Cal nodded. Yes, she's safe. My friend Galbraith has her. He's bringing her home. There was an outburst of relief, laughter and tears and hugging. And when it was all settled and the coffee well and truly spilled, Rose plonked herself on the end of the bed. We thought that's what the note must mean, but why would he call Lily a package? Why send such a peculiar message? George nodded. Yes, why not just say Lily's safe and he's bringing her home? Her dog, Finn, had followed her in. He sidled up to Cal's side of the bed and sat down, looking mournful and underfed. It was something we learned to do during the war. Send messages that on the surface appeared innocuous, but that the person receiving them would understand. Cal passed a piece of toast to the dog. When did the note arrive? About half an hour ago, M told him. It was brought by a young man, dirty, unshaven and mud-spattered, so I wasn't sure what to think, especially as he claimed he was to be paid five pounds. She turned the note over and showed him the postscript. But then I realised he looked much the same as you did when you got home last night. He's in the kitchen now, being fed if you want to question him. We already have. George said, he doesn't know anything about Lily, just that this note was sent by a man who arrived at the inn he drinks at, with a girl he claimed was his sister. She and Rose exchanged glances. He said the girl arrived wearing nothing but a fur rug. Rose said, What? Cal stiffened. Coffee went everywhere and the plate with his half-eaten breakfast slipped to the floor. He took no notice. What do you mean, nothing but a fur rug? Rose shrugged. That's what he said. And before you go and try to shake more out of him, he said he hadn't seen her himself. But that's what he'd heard. Cal swore under his breath. M slipped her hand on his shoulder. People can get things muddled she said quietly. There's no point worrying about it now. We'll see Lily and Galbraith tonight, God willing, or tomorrow, and then we'll find out what really happened. She gave the girls a look. Thank you, girls. George, if your dog has finished with Cal's breakfast, you can take him outside. Relieved but subdued, the two girls left. Cal's gaze burned into M. Naked but for a fur rug, he groaned. Stop imagining the worst. Your friend Galbraith said she was safe. Just remember that. She slipped her arms around him and lay beside him, her head on his chest. All we can do now is wait. Chapter 9 you men have none of you any hearts. If we have not hearts, we have eyes, and they give us torment enough. Jane Austen, Northanger Abbey After a while, the journey took on a rhythm. Edward read chapter after chapter, seeming never to tire of it. Betty soon put her book aside and became engrossed in persuasion. Whenever they stopped to change horses, they hastened into the inn to relieve themselves or simply to stretch their legs. And though Lily tried to persuade Edward to take a break, for the sake of his voice, not because she wasn't enjoying the story, he did for a short while, and then picked up the book and resumed the story. She suspected he was enjoying it as much as she was. When he wasn't reading aloud, 
when they were all sitting watching the scenery pass by, every time she glanced at him, and for some reason her gaze kept being drawn to him, he was watching her. Oh, he seemed to be looking at the scenery, but she could see he was really looking at her in the reflection of his window. It should have made her uncomfortable, and it did make her feel a little warm and sort of tingly and self-conscious, but somehow she didn't mind. And once he started reading again and not watching her, she was free to watch him. He really was the most beautiful man. Every stop was as short as they could make it. They wanted to reach London as soon as possible. They didn't even stop for luncheon. The large basket Betty's mother had given them proved to contain a veritable feast. There was cold chicken, salad, an egg and bacon pie, bread and butter, a rich fruit cake that Betty insisted be eaten with slices of cheese that her mother had provided, and apples that should also be eaten with the cheese. The meal was washed down with something Betty called scrumpy, which was a kind of cider that her father made, though there was a bottle of ale for Edward. There was a large wrapped packet of food for Jimmy and Mr. Walton, but they only got a bottle of cold tea to wash their meal down, because, as Betty informed them, Ma always says men what drives coaches shouldn't go a-drinking. The scrumpy was delicious, but rather strong and after the meal Lily became quite sleepy. Seeing her yawns, Edward put the book aside and produced rugs, and she and Betty snuggled into them, and soon nodded off. She woke at one point and noticed that he too was dozing, his chin sunk onto his neckcloth, crushing its elegant folds. His long booted legs were crossed and stretched out before him, and his arms were folded. He looked younger in sleep, younger and somehow vulnerable. He must have been aware of her regard, for he opened his eyes and looked straight at her. She smiled, their gaze held a long moment, then he shifted and sat up. He stretched and said quietly, I don't know about that scrumpy, but the ale packed quite a punch. She nodded, the scrumpy did too. He glanced at the sky. Late afternoon. If our luck continues, we'll have you home again before midnight. He gave an endearing, crooked half-smile and added, Like Cinderella. She gestured to her borrowed clothing. Not quite like Cinderella, but yes, thank you. I'm very grateful for all you've d He cut her off with a gesture as if he didn't want her gratitude. Shall I continue reading the story? She glanced at the still-sleeping Betty and shook her head. Let's wait until she wakes. Despite her stated preference for a gory tale, I think she's enjoying this as much as I am. The light inside the carriage dimmed as they entered a forest. Lily gazed out the window, watching the play of light and shade through the leaves and the tracery of branches. Forests are magical places, don't you think? When I was little, Rose and I weren't allowed to play in the woods near our house, so naturally there was nothing we wanted to do more. Naturally. Our nurse tried to frighten us with tales like The Babes in the Wood, and she also told us the most terrifying stories of elves and pixies stealing us away. She laughed softly. Of course, that made us want to go and play there even more. She tilted her head and looked at him. I suppose, being a boy, you were allowed to go wherever you wanted. Guilty as charged, though, only after I went to live with my grandfather when I was six. Her smile died. Oh, what happened? Nothing terrible, don't worry. I was born in London and spent my earliest years there, and until I went to grandfather's, the only garden I knew was bound by black iron railings and a locked gate, and woe betide any child rash enough to pick a flower or climb a tree. She wrinkled her nose. That's mean. Children need to play. So what happened when you were six? I had weak lungs as a child and 
Each winter I fell ill, coughs and cold and terrible breathing problems. The winter I was six, I was coughing my lungs up as usual when Grandfather arrived on an unexpected visit. He took one look at me, declared that no child should be raised in a filthy city, and swept me away to Shields, the family seat in the country, insisting that fresh country air would make the boy well again. It did, too. I lived with Grandfather from then on, leaving only to go away to school. She gave him a troubled look. Your parents didn't come with you? No, they both preferred living in London. Mother was an acknowledged beauty and adored the social whirl, as did my father. I saw them each Christmas, of course. Of course, Lily murmured, wondering how any mother could just give her small son away like that. And at your grandfather's home, Shields, was it? Was there a forest nearby to explore? A reminiscent half-smile appeared on his face. There was indeed. Grandfather gave me free run of the place, the stables, the forest, the village, as long as I told someone where I was going and took my dog with me. Your dog? Nipper, a terrier, the cleverest little dog you've ever seen. We went everywhere together. He was silent for a while. So you were happy at your grandfather's? Oh, yes. It was heaven to a small boy whose greatest adventures to that point had been standing on a chair and gazing out the attic window, imagining himself climbing out and exploring the endless sea of rooftops and chimneys, mysterious lands half hidden in the swirling smog. He gave a self-deprecating grimace. I was a foolish, dreamy child. Not foolish at all, she said softly. What is life without dreams? There was a short silence, then she prompted him further. She was so enjoying this brief glimpse into his past. And so at your grandfather's you had the whole estate and your very own forest to explore? Not just explore, but to command. I was Robin Hood. She chuckled. And did you have a band of merry men to lead? And there, suddenly, was that bleak look. I did. Then, he said quietly, and turned his face away. He picked up a book, not the one he'd been reading to her, and began to leaf through it. A clear signal that the conversation was over. What had she said? They'd been talking about Robin Hood and his merry men and childhood games, where was the harm in that? But he obviously didn't want to talk about it. And before Lily could think of a way to get him talking again, a large pothole jolted Betty awake and ended their intimate conversation. But not Lily's thoughts about it. Everyone changed between the time they were small to the adults they became, but the contrast between the dreamy little boy who imagined rooftop lands and the happy child exploring the world with his dog and playing Robin Hood with his friends in the woods. How had he become this man with a reputation for keeping people at a distance? A cold-hearted rake? That wasn't the man who'd rescued her and protected her the man who'd kissed her under a moonless sky and the next day read to her for hours on end so she wouldn't be bored on a long trip. At the next stop to change horses when they all clambered stiffly out of the carriage to use the convenience, Lily's thoughts were still miles away as she wended her way through the busy inn. A loud, self-important voice broke through her reverie, Lady Ampleforth requires. Lily didn't wait to hear what Lady Ampleforth required. She dived through a nearby door, dragging Betty with her, and found herself in a private parlour where a plump, elderly lady sat by the fire. She was dressed in shades of puce and wore a purple and gold turban. At Lily's gasp, she peered toward the doorway, then groped for and began to raise a lorgnette. Oh, heavens! 
Lily whirled around and pushed Betty back out. What was that all about? Betty said as they hurried to the conveniences out the back. That old lady, she knows me. Worse, she knew Aunt Agatha. So? She mustn't see me. She did see you. No, she's very short-sighted, so she saw me, but I don't think she recognised me. She didn't have her lorgnette up in time. She pushed Betty in front of her. Have a look, will you? See if she's anywhere to be seen. Betty peered through the door. Hang on, she's talking to someone. Let's go around the other way. They crept around the outside of the inn, then made a mad dash to the carriage and practically fell inside, laughing in relief. Inside the inn, Ned was arranging for hot coffee laced with brandy for his coachman and sweetened tea for the ladies and the small boy, when he felt an imperious tap on his shoulder. He turned, and his heart sank. Young Galbraith, what is the meaning of this? A short, stout old lady stood regarding him with a grim expression. That, if I am not mistaken, was Lady Lily Rutherford I saw just now, and she's just climbed into a vehicle that my coachman tells me belongs to you. Ned swore silently. In as bored a voice as he could manage, he said, It's not what you think, Lady Ampleforth. She snorted. You have no idea what I think, young man, so explain. He gave a careless shrug and explained in his best sophisticated rake drawl. It's simple. I encountered Lady Lily and her maid a few miles back in some distress after a carriage accident. Naturally, I stopped to render assistance and realizing who she was. Her brother is a friend of mine, you know. I offered her a lift back to London. It's a dreary chore, of course, but there it is. Nothing else a gentleman could do. She raised a well-plucked eyebrow. Is that so? It is, he said firmly. I trust you're satisfied that there's nothing more to it than that. Gossip, especially when misplaced, is such a bore, don't you find? She drew herself up to her full five foot one and gave him a militant look. I quite agree. I abhor gossip, especially when misplaced. Convey my respects to your grandfather. I trust he's in good health. I shall, thank you, and he is. Good afternoon, Lady Ampleforth. He bowed to the old lady, collected the flasks of tea and coffee, and left, cursing silently. We had a narrow escape, Lily informed him as he climbed into the coach again. There was an old lady in the inn who knows my Aunt Agatha. Lady Ampleforth? Yes, I spoke to her. He knocked on the roof to signal Walton to resume the journey. The coach moved off with a jerk. Lily looked aghast. You know her? She knows my grandfather. All that generation seemed to know each other. She groaned. I know. She and Aunt Agatha made their come out the same year and have been at daggers drawn ever since. Really? He decided not to tell her that Lady Ampleforth had recognised her. It would only worry her, and if Lady Ampleforth was as discreet as she claimed, there would be no problem. The good news is she's travelling in the opposite direction, leaving London rather than going there, so you won't encounter her when you get home. Home, Lily echoed quietly. How long now till we reach London, do you think? He did a quick calculation. About seven hours. Shall I continue reading? She nodded, and he resumed the story. Edward finished reading Persuasion just as the light was starting to fade. Lily was glad of the happy ending. She liked Anne and thought she deserved to be happy with her captain. But there was a growing hollow feeling inside her, and it wasn't hunger. They hadn't stopped for dinner. There was enough food left over in Mrs. Baines's basket to keep them all satisfied, not that Lily ate much. 
the closer they got to London, the more nervous she became. Three hours to London. At the last change of horses, Walton, the coachman, had lit the carriage lamps. Not many people travelled at night. It was too dangerous. But Edward was determined to get Lily home as soon as possible, and she could only be grateful. She was desperate to see her family. Walton had also sent young Jimmy down, much against the boy's will, to travel the last few hours inside the coach. How could Walton stand it? Lily wondered. Sixteen hours driving a coach. She was exhausted just from travelling, and she'd taken a nap or two along the way. But when she raised it with Edward, he'd shrugged and said he'd offered to hire Walton as an assistant driver, and he'd refused. After Jimmy joined them, they played guessing games and memory games and told a few stories, but everyone was tired. And soon Betty and her brother curled up in a corner of the coach and slept. Lily wished she could sleep too. Edward had said he hoped they'd get to Mayfair before midnight. She was exhausted, but nervous energy kept her awake. The coach pulled up outside Ashenden House just before midnight. In the faint light of the gas lamps in the street outside, the occupants of the coach stretched and straightened themselves. Ned was a little surprised. He'd expected Lily to be out of the coach in a flash, up the stairs and into the arms of her family. Instead, she was tidying her hair and tugging her borrowed dress into place, as if she were nervous or something. Walton let down the steps and opened the carriage door. Lily took a deep breath. I don't know how to thank you for everything you've done. Then don't. It was my pleasure. Ned didn't want her gratitude. He climbed out to hand her down, and at the same moment the front door of Ashenden House opened, and Cal and his wife came rushing out. Lily practically fell out of the carriage into their arms. Hugging, kissing, laughing, weeping, they walked slowly back into the house. Ned gave Walton an enormous tip, gave him the next two days free, and sent him off with the horses and carriage for a well-earned rest. Coming in? Cal stood at the front door, waiting. It was less an invitation than an order. Inside the house, pandemonium reigned. As Ned entered, two young women dressed in bedgowns and loosely fastened dressing gowns came flying down the stairs in bare feet, shrieking. They embraced Lily repeatedly, hurling questions at her so fast they would have been impossible to answer, even if they hadn't all been laughing and weeping and hugging and exclaiming in dismay over Lily's bruised face. A little overwhelmed by the outburst of female emotions, Ned was relieved when Lady Ashenden finally said, Come along up to bed, girls. It's late. We're all tired and poor Lily looks completely worn out. Your questions will keep. Plenty of time in the morning to hear what happened. She made arrangements for one of the maids to provide beds for Betty and Jimmy and whatever else they needed, and ushered the three girls upstairs. The girls hurried ahead in a tight clump, still talking. Just before Lady Ashenden reached the first landing, she glanced back at Ned and said, "'I'm sorry, Mr. Galbraith, you must think us complete savages. We are all at sixes and sevens in the joy of Lily's homecoming, but... Let me say how truly grateful we are to you for returning our darling Lily to us. Ned bowed. He hated being thanked. Lady Ashenden added, You will call tomorrow, I hope? Again, it wasn't quite an invitation. He glanced up, saw Lily looking down at him, and heard himself say, Of course, Lady Ashenden. The ladies disappeared. Their voices died away and silence fell. Ned turned to take his leave. I'll be off then, Cal. I'm... Step into the sitting room a moment, Galbraith, if you please. Cal seemed a bit stiff. 
Ned wanted to find his own bed, but assuming Cal had questions he wanted to ask, without the ladies present, he entered the sitting room. A cosy fire was burning, and he crossed the room to warm himself in front of it. So, Cal, you have questions for me, I presume? The messenger who brought your note. Oh, you got it. Good. No problem about paying him the extra, I hope. He must have ridden through the night. For a man whose sister had just been returned safe and sound, Cal seemed very tense. Cal dismissed the matter of money with a curt gesture. He didn't offer Ned a seat. He just stood with his legs braced apart, eyeing him with a grim expression. The messenger told me when you carried my sister into that godforsaken village inn, she was naked, but for a fur rug. Not naked. Under the rug, she was wearing one of my shirts. Cal's fists clenched. Why was she virtually naked? Did that bastard... No, that was my doing. I made her strip your doing. Cal took two steps and grabbed Ned by the throat. You stripped my baby sister naked and... Ned broke his hold and pushed him away. Calm down, you fool. It's not what you think. She stripped herself. Some demon of provocation made him add, and if you haven't noticed, she's no longer a baby. You bastard! Cal threw a punch. Ned blocked it and shoved Cal backward. Oh, don't be such a fool. She was soaked to the skin and half frozen, so what would you have me do? Let her catch her death of pneumonia? Besides, she stank to high heaven. Cal said belligerently, My sister does not stink. She does when she's fallen in a ditch full of God knows what. She was covered in mud and stank like a pigsty. There was a short silence. Cal's fists remained bunched, the red light of battle in his eye fainter but still present. Ned, who'd kept a rein on his temper until now, felt it slipping. Much could be forgiven a man still on the edge because his sister had been abducted and he hadn't yet heard the full story, but Cal ought to know better. Damn it, Cal, what kind of a man do you think I am? Do you honestly believe I would debauch any vulnerable innocent, let alone my friend's younger sister? I might have a reputation as a rake, but I've never dallied with innocence of any kind, and you know it. He glared at his friend. You mule-headed fool! Why the hell would I bring Lily home, let alone hire a chaperone for her, if I'd debauched her? What chaperone? Betty, the innkeeper's daughter, short young female, freckles, blue dress. Your wife just arranged for one of your maids to find beds for her and her brother. Oh, her. Yes, her. Why do you think I brought a couple of young rustics with me? To show them the sights of London? He snorted. I also hired Betty to sleep on a trundle bed in Lily's bedchamber at the inn while I slept on the stairs outside the door and blasted uncomfortable it was too, you ungrateful sod. There was a short, fraught silence. Cal's fists slowly unclenched. Tension visibly drained from him. He waved Ned to a seat and said wearily, I'm sorry, Galbraith. I do know you're a man of honour. It's just that you've been beside yourself with anxiety. Ned said, I understand. She's a sweet girl, your sister. He dropped into a comfortable overstuffed armchair. I'll forgive you your stiff-necked, ill-conceived, downright insulting suspicions if you pour me a large, a very large brandy. The last few days have been hell. Believe me, I know it. Cal unstoppered the decanter on the sideboard, poured two large cognacs, and gave one to Neg. So, tell me, was it Nixon? It was. Tricked her into going outside at a party and shoved her into his coach. Drugged her, too. He told Cal as much as he knew about Lily's abduction and eventual escape, leaving out the more sordid detail. They were for her to share if she wanted. She rescued herself, you know. He finished, escaped, despite the drug, and hid in a filthy ditch until he'd gone. 
bastard was trying to run her down in his carriage when I came along. Matter of luck that I was there to stop him. Ned sipped his cognac and stared into the flames. Brave girl, your sister. You should be proud of her. I am. Cal frowned into his glass a moment. I'm stunned by what you've told me. It's hard to believe that my little Lily was so resourceful. I've always thought of her as a bit helpless. Ned thought of what Lily had told him, how she'd worked to keep the feeling in her feet alive so she could run, how she'd blocked the mouth of the bottle with her tongue to prevent being drugged further, how she'd caught the fabric of her cloak in the catch of the lock. And afterwards she'd never once fallen into hysterics or had a fit of the vapours, as she would have been quite entitled to do. Helpless. Cal might love his sister, but he didn't know her very well. Quite an ordeal that filthy swine put her through. She seems to have weathered it remarkably well, but, as you and I know, sometimes these things can hit you later when the danger and the drama have passed. Cal nodded. I know. I'll warn Em. She and the girls will take good care of Lily. They sipped the fine French cognac and listened to the fire crackle and hiss. You really slept across her door, like a faithful hound, Cal said after a few minutes. Wipe that smile off your face, or I might be tempted to give you that punch after all. Ned said lazily, it was for her protection, and... He took another sip of cognac, because Elfingstone was sniffing around. Cal sat up. Elfingstone, that little... It's all right. He knew something was up. I'd told the innkeeper she was my sister, but of course Elfingstone knows I don't have a sister, but he never saw Lily's face and we never used her name. I notice you don't use her title. Ned gave him a hard look. I dropped it for the sake of discretion. He held out his glass for Cal to refill. The only person who might cause us problems is Lady Ampleforth. She saw us when we stopped to change horses and put two and two together. Blast! That old Harridan is my aunt's greatest rival. Rival? Ned was momentarily distracted. For what? Cal gave him a wry look. Dominance of the tarn. Ned snorted. At any rate, she was heading away from London, going home to Herefordshire, I assume, so I doubt she'll cause any trouble. He sipped his cognac. You managed to stifle any gossip at this end, I presume. We've put it about that Lily is in bed with the influenza. Good move. So, we've handled it then, and her life can go on as before. He finished his cognac and rose. I'll be off, then. Cal rose and held out his hand. I can't thank you enough, Galbraith. Nonsense. Anyone would have done the same. Pleasure to be of service to Lady Lily. They shook hands. Cal opened the front door. I suppose you'll be heading back up to that house party now? Ned shook his head. No, gone off the idea. Think I'll stay in town for a bit, see what's to do. He paused on the front step. I take it you'll be hunting for that swine Nixon. I will. I'd like to help. Cal shook his head. I appreciate the offer, but you've done enough. It's for me, as head of Lily's family, to seek justice for my sister. Good night. He stepped inside and closed the door. It was a clear dismissal, and fair enough, Ned told himself. He wasn't family. He had no right to be involved in whatever justice or revenge Cal was planning. He'd done what he could, helped the girl and returned her to the bosom of her family, and that was that end of story. Ned walked to his lodgings. It wasn't far, and the night was fine. Lily was safe in her own bed, and all was right with her world again. He was free to go back to his own life.
So why did he feel so unaccountably flat? Chapter 10 I know that's a secret, for it's whispered everywhere. William Congreve, Love for Love Lily stayed inside for the next few days, waiting impatiently for her bruise to fade. It was lovely to be home with her family again, but for some reason she felt restless and unsettled and a bit bored. It hadn't helped that Edward, she had to address him as Mr. Galbraith now that they were back in society, hadn't called. She hadn't seen him since the night he'd brought her home. He'd sent her flowers, a small exquisite bunch of primroses and violets, with a note saying he hoped she was recovering from her indisposition. Indisposition? Em's view, when she read the note to Lily, was that he was being discreet, that he was maintaining the story they'd spread about Lily having the influenza. Still, it was quite impersonal, coming from a man in whose arms she'd slept, dressed only in his shirt and wrapped in a soft fur rug, a man who'd kissed her on a cold and cloudy night. Why hadn't he visited? She missed him. Her family didn't seem to think his absence in the least bit odd, even though M had specifically invited him to call the next day. They thought he had better things to do, that such neglect was to be expected of a man of his reputation. He was almost never seen in polite company. They were grateful to him, of course, but as Rose said, any gentleman would do the same if they came across a lady in distress. Lily didn't agree, but after several days she was forced to concede that his absence spoke for itself. Her only outing had been to show Betty and her brother Jimmy some of the sights of London. She'd talked Em into letting her go out, heavily veiled, accompanied by one of the maids and a footman plainly dressed. Rose and George had wanted to go too, arguing that fashionable people wouldn't be likely to be at the kind of places that Betty yearned to see, but M had pointed out that, unveiled, they'd be recognised, and that three heavily veiled women would draw more attention than otherwise. She also, with a shudder, firmly vetoed George's suggestion that she and Rose should go dressed as men. Those surreptitious exertions with Betty had been the highlight of Lily's week, and Betty's gleeful enjoyment of her visit had enlivened Lily's dampened spirits. But Betty and her brother had been put on the mail coach back to Yorkshire, laden with parcels. Rose and George had taken Betty shopping for new clothes to replace the ones she'd lent Lily, food for the journey and souvenirs of their visit to the capital. Now Lily was feeling a little bit low. Aunt Agatha insisted the others go out and about on their usual pursuits, where they were to casually mention, but only if asked about Lily's health, that it wasn't the influenza at all but a severe cold, that Lily was recuperating nicely and should emerge from the sick room quite soon. Callers came and were thanked for their concern, but told that... Lady Lily is still indisposed. Well-wishers sent her notes and flowers, fruit and small gifts, quite a few of which were books. Burton read her the notes and took back a verbal message from the invalid. 
With all this kind attention, it was completely unreasonable for her to feel lonely and a bit lost, Lily told herself. She'd survived a nasty experience and should be grateful to be safe and well in the bosom of her family. She was thankful, of course she was, but she was also fed up with waiting for the horrid bruise to disappear and allow her out. All she did was sit around, knit or sew, and those occupations were horridly conducive to thinking. All Lily seemed to be able to think about these days was Edward Galbraith and what he might be doing. And thinking. And it was pointless wondering. His actions, or lack of them, showed what he was thinking. Not about Lily. He hadn't called once or sent anything apart from those flowers. She'd pressed some of them between the pages of a book. The best use she had for a book. But there was no use brooding about him. To him she was just a parcel he'd had to deliver. Rose and George had told her about the note he'd sent Cal. As for the kisses that haunted her dreams, he was a rake after all. He probably had that effect on all the women he kissed. She needed to forget about Edward Galbraith. She needed activity, entertainment, distraction. So, when Sylvia Gorry came calling, Lily hurried to the looking-glass, decided a dusting of rice powder would sufficiently conceal the fading bruise, and asked Burton to show Sylvia up. Cal and M had assured her that Sylvia had known nothing about her cousin's plans, but Lily wanted to talk to Sylvia herself in private, just to be sure. Mrs. Arthur Gorry, Burton announced. And Sylvia hurried in, talking nineteen to the dozen. Oh, you're out of bed already. I've brought you some candied licorice root. It's supposed to be marvellous for colds. I had the impression... But no matter, you seem to be almost recovered. No red nose, I see. It's the worst part of a cold, I think. That scabby redness from all the disgusting blowing and sneezing. But you are looking pale. Lily waved her to a seat, and Sylvia sat, saying, I'm so very relieved to see you, dear Lily. I was so worried. It was just a cold, Lily began. I don't mean that. "'though I'm glad you're recovering. "'No, I meant... "'I suppose you heard about your brother "'bursting into my house in the wee small hours "'demanding I produce Cousin Victor. "'He planted such horrid suspicions in my mind "'about you and my cousin. "'He actually believed you two had eloped. "'Well, how ridiculous when you had barely "'exchanged more than half a dozen words, "'but such things weigh on one's mind, you know. "'And Victor had disappeared, and so had you. "'Yes, I... Oh, I know, you took ill and ended up in the wrong bed. Roses, was it not? And confused everyone. I was never more relieved when I ran into Miss Wes. Lady Ashenden in the park the next day, and she told me you were ill. Not that I was pleased you were ill, of course, but I was so relieved to find that you hadn't run off with my cousin. As a matter of fact, you must think it strange of me to feel such doubts about my cousin— Actually, but I don't really know him that well. He only came to England recently, and when we became reacquainted, well, there was I, with my stick in the mud husband, and here was this charming and personable new cousin. I cannot tell you how delightful it was to have a handsome young relative to squire me around the parties that Arthur, that's Mr. Gorry, my husband, refuses to attend. Yes, but. My husband is furious with me because Victor owed him money, but it seems he's disappeared off the face of the earth, and I can't say I'm sorry. Some embarrassing things have come to light since he left, and... Oh, I forgot. I brought you some ice cream from Gunther's. Nothing is as soothing for a sore throat as a delicious creamy ice, don't you think? Although your voice doesn't sound too bad. When I had the influenza, my throat was so hideously painful, I sounded like a rusty saw. She laughed. Your butler should be bringing it up shortly. Well, what perfect timing. Here he is now, she finished, as Burton entered with a tray containing two bowls of creamy ices. Hope you don't mind if I join you. 
I do adore ice cream, but my husband thinks it's a frivolous indulgence. Lily, who had been about to confront Sylvia and inform her that her cousin was every bit as big a villain as Cal had suspected, and more, subsided. She examined Sylvia's face as she handed Lily a bowl of ice cream and dug happily in herself. There was no shadow of guilt or even self-consciousness in her eyes. Surely, if she'd known or suspected anything about the abduction, it would show. In any case, why would Sylvia conspire with her cousin to commit such a dreadful act? There was no benefit to her in it that Lily could see. Lily didn't particularly like Sylvia, but she'd never been unkind to her. Quite the contrary. No, she decided as she ate her ice cream. Sylvia had been deceived by her cousin, just as Lily had. Several days later, Aunt Agatha stripped off her gloves and directed an accusing look at Lily, who had been summoned with the rest of the family, the female members. Cow was out. The rumours are proliferating. They should be abating by now. You sent out those thank you notes, did you, Gail? Yes, of course. Lily hadn't written them herself, of course. Rose had written them for her, a note for everyone who'd sent something to Lily. George had addressed them, and Lily had sealed them. And we've told quite a few people that it was only a severe cold, not the influenza as first feared, Rose said. I included Lily in my acceptance for us all at the Peplo Ball next week, M said. The bruising will have faded completely by then, and everyone will see that she hasn't eloped, and is her usual sweet self. Show me. Aunt Agatha raised her lorgnette with an imperious gesture, and Lily presented the offending cheek for her scrutiny. The old lady gave a grudging nod then glared around the room, a tigress deprived of prey. Then why are the rumours getting worse? M frowned. Why, what are people saying? A muddle of two stories. One that Lily ran off with a Mr. Nixon on the night of the Mainwaring route. To Gritna or Paris, the versions differ. The other and Far more serious, in my view, is that she eloped with Galbraith, who seduced her, then dumped her. But he didn't, Lily exclaimed indignantly. Be quiet, girl. You are ruined. Whether he seduced you or not is immaterial. How can the truth be immaterial? Lily began. The old lady snorted. And there you show your youth and ignorance, Gell. It's what society believes that counts. That stinks, George said. Aunt Agatha gave her a pained look. Must you use such a vulgar expression, Georgiana, and refrain from commenting on what you don't understand? A girl raised in a barnyard can have no idea of how polite society operates. George bristled and M intervened before an argument could start, saying, Why do you say the second rumour is more serious, Aunt Agatha? I would have thought both stories were equally damaging to Lily's reputation. It is the source of the rumour that matters, Emmeline. The elopement story is being circulated by an inferior class of people, people on the fringe of the ton, aspirants, mushrooms, hangers-on. She made a distasteful gesture, as if dusting cobwebs off her fingers. The Galbraith seduction and abandonment story, however, is on the lips of la creme de la creme. My own circle, in other words. The highest in the land. She eyed them accusingly, and that is far more damaging. Who is spreading it? Rose demanded. I have not yet tracked the rumour to its source. Nobody is willing to repeat it to my face. But it's not fair. Lily was almost in tears. Mr. Galbraith rescued me. He was a true gentleman in every way. Aunt Agatha raised her lorgnette. What does that have to do with anything? Well, his reputation will be ruined too, and it's not fair. Pfft, don't be so naive, Aunt Agatha said. His reputation may be a little tarnished, but it will do him no harm in the long run. 
A rakish reputation is expected of a young man and one who is handsome and also rich. Well, society will forgive a few peccadilloes soon enough. Peccadilloes? George began. That's outrageous. If he did seduce Lily and dump... But he didn't! Lily almost shouted. Aunt Agatha sighed. You really are simple, aren't you, girl? Have you understood nothing I've said so far? I understand, Lily began, but why can't we track down the source of the rumour and tell them to stop telling lies? Aunt Agatha rolled her eyes, as well as try to hold back the Thames with your hands. No, you foolish child, there is only one way out of this. We must announce your betrothal. Lily's jaw dropped. Betrothal? Who to? To whom, child? Have you no grammar? To Galbraith, of course. Who else? There was a short, shocked silence, then a cacophony of objections. That's ridiculous. Lily barely knows the man, M said. Lily is innocent. Why should she be punished by being forced into a loveless marriage? Rose began. Nor should her rescuer, George added. Simply because an evil man abducted her, Rose finished. A man forced into an unwanted marriage is bound to resent his wife, whether she does the forcing or not, George said. Her parents had been forced into marriage. It had been disastrous for all concerned. Aunt Agatha gave what, in a less dignified person, might have been called a shrug. Life isn't fair, but it's nonsense to suggest anyone is being punished. Galbraith is a good match. He'll inherit his grandfather's title in a few years, and the estate is extensive. She doesn't need to marry for money or a title, George argued. She already has a title, and when she turns one and twenty, she'll inherit a fortune. We all will. Which makes her an excellent match for Galbraith, the old lady said. But Lily has always, always wanted to marry for love, Rose declared. Aunt Agatha snorted. Love? Pah! Love and marriage have nothing to do with each other. It does in this family, M said. Aunt Agatha stabbed her lorgnette in M's direction. You made a marriage of convenience to my nephew. Don't try to deny it, Emmeline, and you must admit it has worked out very well. It has, Em agreed, because Cal and I fell in love, and I want the girls, all of them, to have that opportunity. I took a chance when I agreed to marry Cal. I never expected to love or be loved, only by any children I might be blessed with. She placed a hand on her swelling belly. I was long past my first youth, alone in the world, or thought I was, poor and unlikely to be courted ever again. I expected to remain a spinster for the rest of my life, until Cal made his proposition. And it turned out very well, Aunt Agatha said irritably. Yes, but it could have been otherwise. We were lucky. M caught Lily's hand and squeezed it fondly. Lily is young, just eighteen, with her whole life ahead of her. She has a loving family, financial security, and a growing circle of admirers. Just look at all the flowers she's been sent. I won't allow her to be forced into marriage just to satisfy the sensibilities of a bunch of old gossips spreading false rumours. Well said, Em, Rose declared. George clapped. Aunt Agatha unimpressed, curled her lip. Those admirers will soon fade away once it's known she's soiled goods. But I'm not, Lily said indignantly. Aunt Agatha sniffed. In the eyes of the world you are. Gossip is like acid. It eats away at the truth. Face it, child, if Galbraith doesn't marry you, you are ruined. If you say she is ruined one more time, I, I shall scream. M declared. Aunt Agatha directed a baleful glance at her. Vulgar displays of emotion will not help the situation, Emmeline. M glared at her. I'm not so sure about that. 
For a long moment, nobody said a word. Then George spoke up. You haven't said much, Lily. It's all very well for everyone to be telling you what to do, but what do you want? Lily's thoughts were in such turmoil she couldn't think of a single thing to say. Marry Edward Galbraith? Whether he wanted to or not? She looked at George and shook her head. Lily's wants have nothing to do with it, Aunt Agatha snapped. The Rutherford name has been besmirched, and marriage to Galbraith is the only solution. She won't be the first bride who's found a husband thus. It is the way of the world. And what if Mr. Galbraith doesn't want to marry me? Lily said. Aunt Agatha snorted. If we left it up to what men wanted, there would be precious few legitimate children born into the world. Rose gave a choked cough. Aunt Agatha gave her a withering look and added severely, We know what they want, but it rarely includes marriage. Mr. Galbraith will get what Mr. Galbraith deserves, a virtuous, well-bred wife of good family who, God willing, will give him the heir his family requires. It made Lily sound like a particularly large and indigestible pill. Whatever Mr. Galbraith deserves, this is about Lily, and I won't allow her to be forced into a marriage she does not want. M gave Lily a comforting smile. She has just escaped that fate. Aunt Agatha stamped her ebony cane. Bah! It's not your decision to be made, Emmeline. Your husband is the head of this family, or has the whole world been turned upside down and women wear the breeches? Don't say a word, Georgiana. Ashenden will understand there is no choice. He will speak to Galbraith. He might be a rake, but he is also a gentleman, and they will make the only honourable choice. You'd best start preparing for a wedding. We'll see about that, M murmured. Prepare for a wedding, indeed. What nonsense, Rose said later that evening, as the girls were dressing to go out. How dare she try to force you into a marriage with a man like that? A man like what? Lily asked quietly. Rose gave her a surprised look. Galbraith, he's just like those men you say you cannot bear. The ones Aunt Agatha keeps producing for us. Cold, clever, sophisticated and bored to death with everything. Horrid! Mr. Galbraith isn't like that, really, Lily said. He's much nicer than any of them. Nice? Rose was incredulous. Yes, he's kind and nice. And are we talking about the same man? Galbraith, tall, dark, and with the coldest eyes you've ever seen, like frost on green glass. He's not cold. He's just... Lily groped for the right word. I hope you're not going to tell me he's shy, Rose said, and she and George laughed. No, he's not shy, Lily said with dignity. He's reserved. I know he seems cold, but underneath he's different. How so? I can't explain, but he's more than he appears to be. Rose gave a snort worthy of her aunt. Everyone is more than they appear to be. George cocked her head curiously. Are you saying you might be willing to marry this man after all? Lily shrugged. I'm not sure. In any case, he hasn't asked. Yet. She was all a flutter about the possibility. She wanted him to ask her. Of course she did, but not if she was to be forced on him like a bitter pill. Though pills could be sweetened. But he's shown not the slightest bit of interest in you. If he did propose, it would only be out of duty. Lily bit her lip. Cal and M weren't in love when they got married. Rose eyed her narrowly. You're not in love with Galbraith, are you, Lily? No, of course not. She lied. She wasn't sure if she was in love or not. She was, to put it simply, in turmoil.
Rose gave her a long, thoughtful look. I hope it'll never happen, Lily, darling, but if you gave your heart to that piece of granite, I fear he'd break it. Ned Galbraith had heard the rumours himself. At first there were just the odd few sly suggestive hints, then one or two of his friends taxed him openly with it. He denied all knowledge of it and went in search of Elphingstone. As luck would have it, he encountered the fellow as he was leaving his lodgings. Ned pushed him back indoors. What the devil do you mean by spreading rumours about me and Lady Lily Rutherford? Elphingstone's eyes almost popped. So it was Lady Lily at the inn, after all. Fellows at the club said you'd run off with her, but changed your mind after sampling the goods. Ork! Ned grabbed him by his exquisitely arranged neckcloth and shook him like a rat. Speak of her with respect or not at all. If you want to live to see another day. He dropped Elphingstone back on his feet. Elphingstone, his composure as ruffled as a cat dipped in water, smoothed out his rumpled clothing and fiddled with his crushed cravat, muttering, It's ruined. Quite ruined. Seeing Ned's expression, he said pettishly, No need for violence. It wasn't I who linked your name with Lady Lily's. I never saw the face of the lady you were with at that wretched inn, so how could I? I'm just repeating the on dit around town. The tale was already out there. Entries made in the betting book at White's before I even arrived in London, which was yesterday. That demmed village wheelwright took a week, a week to mend a simple wheel. A week at that dreadful inn. He shuddered. Ned still itched to strangle the man, but his story added up. If Elphingstone had only just arrived in town the day before, the rumours couldn't have spread as far as they had. Bets in the betting book at White's. Damn, that was serious. Very well, but if I hear you've been adding to any of the gossip. Elphingstone gave him a shocked look. Gossip? Mwah! Perish the thought! Elphingstone was still spouting faux indignation when Ned left. Deep in thought, who the hell had spread the scandal? He walked along Piccadilly, heading for White's. He wanted to check that damned betting book when he almost bumped into a lady coming out of Hatchard's bookshop. Watch where you're walking, young Galbraith! Startled, he looked up and came to an abrupt halt. Lady Ampleforth, you're in London? She gave him a dry look, a singularly foolish observation. I thought you were on your way to Hereford. Changed my mind, didn't I? Now, if you've quite finished blocking my way... He stepped back. She handed her parcels to a waiting footman and prepared to enter her carriage and it hit him. He lunged forward and stopped her. There's a scurrilous story circulating among the ton linking my name with that of Lady Lily Rutherford. Is there really? Her look of mock innocence confirmed his theory. He frowned. You told me you abhorred gossip. Lady Ampleforth gave him a smug look. Oh, I do. She looked like the cat that ate the cream. But you're the source of that gossip. He was certain now. It could be no one else. Nonsense. It's not gossip when you speak the truth. I saw you and the Rutherford girl with my own eyes travelling together. He gritted his teeth. I explained that. She gave a scornful half. And she had a chaperone with her. Another huff delivered her opinion of Betty's value as a chaperone. If you're finished talking nonsense, I wish to enter my carriage. He didn't budge. Why? Why would you do this? Lady Lily is a sweet young girl who's never harmed a soul in her life. No doubt she is, she said carelessly. I doubt I've ever spoken to the girl. 
then why would you try to ruin her reputation? Try? There was a world of meaning in the way she said it. Ned narrowed his eyes. You mean you wanted to ruin her? She shrugged. It's nothing to do with the girl herself. She merely gave me the opportunity. I don't understand. She is Aggie Rutherford's, Lady Salter as she is now, niece. Aggie Rutherford. She holds herself so high, always has, ever since she was a girl looking down on the rest of us and thinking she's so perfect. She gave a self-satisfied smile, and now we have a scandal involving her precious family, and oh, how the mighty are fallen. I trust dear Aggie is squirming as much as I hoped she would. She pushed past him and climbed into her barouche. Shocked by the vitriol in her voice, Ned watched her fussily arrange herself. To ruin Lily for the sake of some ancient feud with Lily's aunt. You vicious old trout. If you were a man... She laughed. Words, words, words. Sticks and stones, they used to tell me. She smiled. But words can hurt after all, can't they, young Galbraith? Coachman, drive on. Fuming, Ned watched her drive off. He'd never taken much notice of the old lady before, but she'd always seemed pleasant enough. Did his grandfather know she was such a spiteful old cat? If not, he'd enlighten the old man when next he came to London. He continued on to White's, where he greeted a couple of friends and acquaintances with the appearance of cool insouciance. He chatted of this and that, and then, aware of the covert interest of several members, he wandered over to the betting book and scanned it in a casual manner. There were the entries Elphingstone had mentioned, linking his name and Lily's, Mr. E. G. and Lady L., with bets made on a variety of possible outcomes. He swore under his breath. He left White's and went straight to Jackson's boxing saloon where he burned off some of his rage and frustration in a couple of fast and furious bouts. All the time his fists were flying, his thoughts were turning over and over, looking for a way out, for both of them. He was all wrong for her. She was all wrong for him. He thought of the whispers, the sly looks, the cunning innuendos she would face. He recalled the smugness of that malicious, gossiping old bat and the entries in the betting book. The reputation of an innocent girl so easily and carelessly ruined. If it were anyone else but Lily. Why couldn't the woman he'd rescued and accidentally compromised be older, plainer, more experienced, more self-reliant, the kind of woman he'd taken as a mistress from time to time? the sort of woman who wanted nothing more from him than his body and occasionally his company, and usually his money. Lily would want so much more, the kinds of things he didn't have in him to give. He wasn't opposed to marriage. He'd gotten almost as far as the altar last year with a woman who was all the things he required in a wife. She didn't even like him much. But Lily... Lily dreamed of love. He could see the swirling echoes of those dreams in her eyes whenever she looked up at him. His fault for kissing her, for rescuing her. Lord knew what kind of man she imagined him to be. All he knew was that he wasn't that man, could never be that man. Oh, he presented well enough from the outside, and he had a name and position and wealth enough to keep a wife in comfort and style, but inside... Inside he was a husk of a man, unfit to marry any sweet and dreamy young woman. But they were trapped in a scandal not of their own making. And Ned had been born and raised a gentleman. He had no option but to offer marriage. He left Jackson's and returned to his lodgings, where he bathed, 
shaved and changed his clothes. Time to call on Cal Rutherford. <laughs>